I think we're recording, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Okay. So if we compare the theories, where, right, where is it? Here it is. Hey, peeps. Welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. No, that's it. that ain't it, Chief. Hey, peeps. Welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmidt, and today I'm answering your questions for my 10K AMA episode. Now, we need to cover some notes before we get started. First, my pronunciation of some of your names will be imperfect. Second, in cases where I've already answered questions, I'll basically just direct you guys back to the place where I've addressed them. Third, I'm answering the questions in the temporal order in which they were asked. Fourth, if at times, like maybe uh, right now, <laughs> if at times it looks like I'm reading off my computer rather than looking at the camera, that's because at those times, I am reading off my computer rather than looking at the camera. Basically, I created this huge monolithic document that's available to patrons. Sign up for $99.99. <laughs> fifth, this is the fifth note. I stopped taking questions at something like 9.30 a.m. Eastern time, Monday, July 18th. So anyway, I gave about six days to ask questions. So I think that's sufficient. You can find timestamps to the various questions in the description and maybe also a pinned comment. All right, but onto the first one, here we go, Colton Kalthen, right? Yeah, right, compare the theories. Congrats. <laughs> I need to stop. Congrats, man. Happy for you. I'm not a boomer, but appreciate the AMA deciphering. Question, what are your future plans with philosophy? Professor, other, less personal and more philosophy related, uh, would be curious to hear your thoughts on whether or not there is objective purpose or meaning to life. If so, what it might be and why. Uh, with respect to your first question, I'm applying to grad schools come November. And after getting my PhD, the hope is to become a philosophy professor. Now, I recognize that the job market for that is absolutely atrocious. So I have backup plans. For instance, lots of high schools love having PhDs on their faculty, and so I could be a high school teacher. I could tutor people for things like the SAT, ACT, GRE, and the like. Or if my YouTube channel keeps growing, I could potentially do this full time after grad school. Who knows? And so on down the list of backup options. And so on. Right. Now, even if I don't end up being a professor, I can still publish peer reviewed articles and books and still conduct research. So I'm pretty sure doing scholarly philosophy will be a lifelong thing for me, regardless of whether I become a tenured professor. So that's good. And what about objective purpose or meaning in life? Well, I think it depends on what you mean by objective purpose or meaning in life, really. I mean, if you mean some like intention concerning how we should live or what we should do such that this intention isn't any private or collective intention of humans, then I'm probably agnostic on whether there is purpose in that sense. And the reason, of course, is because I'm agnostic on God's existence. And since God's existence would plausibly entail or at least probabilify the existence of such an intention concerning how we should live and what we should do, I'm likewise agnostic on whether there's purpose in that sense. But if we just mean by objective purpose or meaning in life, things that are objectively good and valuable that we should be doing objectively, well, then I do think there's purpose in that sense, simply because I'm a moral realist. I mean, I think it's stance independently true, that is true independently of our collective desires and attitudes and beliefs and so on, that we shouldn't cultivate vice and that we shouldn't torture and that we should cultivate virtue and that we should treat people kindly, et cetera, et cetera, right. And of course, I'm not alone in holding this kind of realist view. I'm accompanied by the majority of philosophers as revealed by the recent Phil Paper survey. So it really all just depends on what we mean by objective meaning or purpose. Now, that addresses your questions concerning whether there is objective meaning or purpose in life. It depends on what you mean. That's kind of my answer. Uh, but as for its precise content, like what is that meaning or purpose? What's its content? That's a different question. I tend to think that its precise content would simply track or be in line with objective goods and values and obligations that there are. So for instance, if it's objectively true that we should try to cultivate intellectual and moral virtue, then this will be part of our objective meaning or purpose. Again, it all just depends on what those goods, values, and obligations are, firstly, and it depends on what we mean by objective meaning or purpose. Now, much more can be said, but I think that suffices for now. Johnny asks, congratulations, Joe. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, question, how would you define philosophy and when is your new book coming out? Uh, philosophy is difficult to define, of course, right? But it's something like the systematic, rigorous study of the fundamental nature and structure of reality, our epistemic access to reality, the values that reality instantiates, how we should act, the study of valid inferences, and so on. Now, at this juncture, I can highly recommend you guys to check out my playlist, Doing Philosophy. Of course, check out my playlists more generally. 
Por favor. <laughs> this one is doing philosophy. It only has five videos. Um, but I define philosophy in here. What is philosophy? And I talk about different dispositional aspects of philosophy as well, like cultivating intellectual virtues principally. And I talk about what some of those are. Um, but I kind of define philosophy in there. And also, this is an excellent lecture. This, the nature of philosophy and its place in the university. It's a lecture given by Graham Priest. He's a very good philosopher, very eminent philosopher. And he talks about what philosophy is, how it's utterly crucial to include in university curricula or whatever, and also how philosophy has has been absolutely essential in kind of blossoming out other disciplines that we now demarcate from philosophy. Once philosophers of the past got settled on various questions that can be asked in a certain domain and got settled on various techniques that can garner consensus in that area, that kind of budded off from philosophy and became its own discipline. But again, I highly recommend just checking this out because it is highly germane to your question. Oh, and also this lecture is a nice antidote to those hopelessly uninformed STEM lords who think, you know, you should just get rid of like liberal arts and things like that, and especially philosophy, that philosophy is useless, etc. And as for my new book, yes, it's entitled Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs. Uh, there's the first author, J. C. Schmidt, and then the second author, Daniel J. Linford, um, publisher with Springer series. It's, it's going to be in the Boston Studies in Philosophy, Religion, and Public Life, etc. We're putting finishing touches on the manuscript and it's due in early August. So we're submitting it to Springer in early August. And then, you know, they go through their whole production process. We don't know how long that production process is going to take. I'll probably actually put the preface in the description if you guys want to read the preface. Basically, it just details what the book is like. And we give an outline of the book. We talk about what we're covering. All right, we're back. All right. Garuxen, Garuxen asks, how did you get into football, a soccer? And can you make an off-the-cuff philosophical remark on what makes sports meaningful? Well, how did I get into it? Well, I mean, my parents kind of put me into it when I was like two or three. So like ever since I can remember, I went straight into it. And then I was basically addicted to it and did it nonstop, like all the time. Interestingly, I potentially could have been going on like the D1 route and potentially even beyond until in 2017. So that's like sophomore, junior year of high school. I got two very devastating concussions that took me out of contact sports, basically, for the most part. I mean, I still do them informally now, even though I'm kind of not supposed to. But they were very bad and they kind of took me out of soccer altogether. But, you know, I was on like this developmental academy team. It was like a sub branch of uh, the Chicago Fire and so on. But anyway, fun times. Uh, off the cuff remark about the meaningfulness of sports. Well, uh, at least for me, one reason why sports are meaningful is that they're arguably forms of art, right? I mean, especially when it comes to professional athletics um, and, you know, people who try to develop their skills and cultivate them very uh, quasi-professionally, you know, they try to get better and better and better. The professional athletes, right, their skills, their accomplishments and exhibitions, they're often breathtakingly magnificent and beautiful. It's truly artistic, in my view, when you see Messi, for instance, weaving in and out of defenders with the most deft and cunning skills. Uh, when you see perfectly placed chips or long shots or free kicks from James Ward Prowse. Um, when you see Neymar absolutely destroying a defender with an elastico and multiple step overs. Um, the skill, the athleticism, uh, the prowess and execution, these all kind of come together to make a, a beautiful finished piece. Uh, it's like an artwork of sorts. So that's kind of how I... Uh, see the meaningfulness of sports. They're almost like a kind of art, really. Belal Kanfar asks, I think you're atheist. You're wrong. Uh, if so, what evidence that could convince you of God existence? Uh, well, what would convince me? Well, um, on my evidential scales, right? So we've got scale on athe for atheism here, or perhaps naturalism, we could pick a specific atheistic hypothesis. And then the scales for kind of tr broadly traditional theism or perfect being theism. In terms of the evidential chips that fall on either side, well, we could either add more evidential chips for theism or increase the strength of my extant evidential chips for theism. Or we could remove evidential chips for atheism or naturalism or alternatively decrease the strength of my extant evidential chips for atheism or naturalism. It's as simple as that. So basically adding chips to the theist side or taking away chips from the naturalist or atheist side or strengthening the chips on the theist side that are already there or decreasing the strength of the chips on the naturalist or atheist side that are already there. That'll basically do it. Generic Koala asks, nicely done. My question for you is what's your current feelings on philosophy of mind and have you considered analytic idealism as a live option? So, philosophy of mind is exceedingly difficult, <laughs> with a proliferation of views and a panoply of quite complex arguments to consider. 
Uh, I mean, I guess I lean towards a very broadly non-physicalist style view, largely because of considerations pertaining to the hard problem of consciousness, that is accounting for the felt qualitative character of conscious experience, sometimes called phenomenal consciousness. Um, also because of some really interesting arguments that Josh Rasmussen has published on. Now, which specific non-physicalist view do I accept? Well, now we're starting to get into like really iffy territory. I honestly don't quite know. Um, I mean, I guess if you had like tortured me, like really tortured me, I don't suggest it. But if you tortured me and absolutely forced me to pick, I'd probably go with property dualism. I'd probably say that we're organisms. We are biological organisms with both physical and non-physical properties. And the non-physical properties are going to be those pertaining to the mind, uh, mental phenomena, mental states, etc. Now, I do consider at least theistic idealism a live option. I know you said analytic idealism, but I tend to think that non-theistic idealisms are unstable and plausibly require something like a unifying cosmic mind. That is something at least quasi-theistic in which resides the common reality with which we all collectively interact and can explore. This kind of unifying mind can provide the kind of third person stability, objectivity, uniformity, order, et cetera, that we can interact with. Then again, though, I mean, like, if the idealism is basically just a version of panpsychism, which sometimes it, it kind of is, um, then perhaps there can be fundamentally phenomenally conscious properties without those belonging to some kind of cosmic mind. Um, but then it's, is it really idealism in that case? Well, anyway, we could set that aside. Sometimes proponents of analytic idealism slip into being very, very close to panpsychism. But in any case, I don't rule out idealism altogether. Um, I would just plausibly want to be a theist first. I just think non-theistic idealisms are unstable, precisely because they find difficulty accounting for the unity and uniformity and persistence and uh, third person interactability of a kind of common world that we all inhabit. But I mean, even as a theist, right, you're still faced with the fact that God created us in such a way that we're almost systematically deceived about the nature of reality, right? I mean, we all almost kind of, at least prima facie, think, you know, oh, yes, God, idealism, that seems absurd, right? Obviously, there's like these material objects and they're not conscious and they're out there in the world and things like that. Like, no, not everything is mind or a content of a mind or a property of a mind or mental properties, or whatever. It's just obviously false. You know, lots of people have that kind of reaction. So you face the difficulty of a kind of God creating us in such a way that we're basically like super duper, like almost inherently resistant to what the, the fundamental nature of reality actually is. And so that's a kind of weird situation that you're in. That seems really surprising under theism that God would create us to be almost systematically deceived in that manner. But then again, maybe not. I mean, maybe you can use Chalmers' paper of the matrix as metaphysics to get around this. Um, so you can kind of preserve all those intuitions. And you're just saying, well, no, they're, they're, you know, there really are physical material objects out there. It's just that the nature of those physical objects might just be slightly different than we thought that it was. Dr. T says, sincere congratulations on reaching 10K subs, and thank you for the help you give those of us who like to think. Well, much love, my dude. Bilal Kanfar again asks, if you ought to redesign the education system, what changes would you make? This is a good question. Less memorization, more critical thinking, teach logic from a young age, teach argumentation and evaluating arguments, et cetera, from a young age, teach critical thinking, including cognitive biases, heuristics, you know, the Kahneman and Tversky style system one and system two thinking and so on. Um, less emphasis on obedience and rules and regimented schedules and more emphasis on flexibility, creativity, dialogue, cordial and respectful argumentation and the like. Um, spend more time on the process and methods of science in science classes, as opposed to rotely memorizing certain findings of science. I do think we should have, you know, citizens should have a basic grasp of some of the central findings of science, of course, but there needs to be more emphasis on the process and methods of science. You know, things like peer review, bias minimization, the importance of replication and large sample sizes to reduce the effects of random variation, you know, distinguishing between correlation and causation, as well as, you know, heightening awareness of confounding variables and so on down the list. Also, you know, starting school at later in the day, especially for high school students. I've read studies that um, it's actually not that good to have them get up that early in the morning and so on because their circadian rhythms change as they go through puberty, puberty and so on. School should be shifted basically later in the day. I think there should in general be less homework, especially if it's busy work. There also needs to be more emphasis on showing kids why things are true and not just that they are true. So for instance, when you're covering the Pythagorean theorem, 
go through how we know that this thing is true. Don't just say, okay, here, here's a here, here's a theorem and just mechanically plug in mindlessly these numbers that you get. If you give them that kind of underlying unifying knowledge of why this Pythagorean theorem is true and why the various things you're covering are true, right? Why the unit circle has the values that it does, why the sign of such and such is such and such, and why, you know, all these sorts of things, then I don't know, you're equipping them with, well, better understanding of reality, better understanding of mathematical truths, and allows them to solve a wider range of problems. You know, they're not just like, if, if it doesn't, if a new problem doesn't come prepackaged as fitting the exact schema that they were taught, you know, they're basically, it's just like error, overload. <laughs> but you can help mitigate that if you try to get to the underlying principles and underlying truths and explanations for why these things are true. Another thing that should be changed about education systems, well, uh, somehow... <laughs> I don't exactly know how to do this, but somehow they should instill a love for learning and not a hatred for it. And they need to inspire a kind of wonder and curiosity and awe for learning, not make learning dreaded and feared. You know, you have people saying like, oh, I hate math or, you know, I hate these sorts of things or I hate literature. <laughs> That's because they went through an education system that made them hate it, right? Also, this is important. Less emphasis on grades. Oh my goodness, this is terrible. Grades for the student. I mean, I've been I've been a student for the past I, I, who knows how long? 15 years or something more than that. <laughs> so yeah. Um 16 anyway, it's it's a long time. Grades are like all consuming. That's like all that goes on in, in students' minds, right? Students don't care at all about learning given our current system. They care about the grade. <laughs> and I mean, who can blame them, right? Who can blame us? Um, that's the product of the system, right? Everything you do is essentially reduced to a single grade, like a single number at the end of a term or a single letter. It's just absurd. And like, it's all focused on that. You know, people don't like... I've heard people like, I don't care if I get this content or not. I'm just caring about the grade. And of course, that fuels cheating. That fuels all these other sorts of things. It fuels not wanting to, you know, not loving learning for its own sake, but having a hatred for this sort of thing and so on. So anyway, I change a lot of stuff. Uh, Bilal Kanfar asks, if you can give advice to the young, in parentheses, you, what advice would it be? So this question can be interpreted in a few ways. It could be asking about my advice to young people in general. <laughs> Am I that old that I can give advice to young people? I'm 21 right now, man. <laughs> okay, in August I'll be 22, so I guess I'll be I guess I'll be uh, among the elders. Or it can be interpreted as giving advice to my younger self. So I'm actually going to interpret it as that second way. My first piece of advice to my younger self is get off social media or at least get off it sooner. Currently, I actually only use Facebook and YouTube right now. Okay, like once a week, maybe once every two weeks, I log on to Twitter for like three minutes, after which I promptly delete it. I have a friend that manages my Twitter account for me. But yeah, I try to minimize my social media usage as much as I can. And I'm not just being some grumpy old man yelling angrily at the trends that the youths are taking up these days. For starters, social media is in a literal sense addictive, right? The platforms are intentionally designed to stimulate our little monkey brains in a way that sucks us in, creates rewards and anticipations, and all around gets us addicted. Perhaps more importantly, social media, especially things like Twitter, gamifies communication. You, you have a kind of scoring of tweets through likes and retweets and follows. That scoring of tweets, for instance, that basically turns communication on Twitter into a kind of game, right? And that in turn creates incentives to play it in a certain way. The problem then is that the values and the goals of communication are abandoned on Twitter in favor of pursuing a small set of metrics that work against moral sensitivity, fairness, open-mindedness, and so on, right? So you're basically playing a game which is highlighting all these horrible features of us. Gamification of communication is something that uh, social media, what shall I say, inculcates in us, brings out of us, highlights in us, consumes us. It's very bad. So yeah, I tell myself to stop, st <laughs> don't, don't do social media and get off it sooner rather than later. But of course, stay on YouTube, right? Because that's where you have like, lecture videos and you can learn things like from my channel. So definitely subscribe and turn on that little bell for notifications so that you can be addicted to my content. The second thing that I'd say to my younger self is don't worry as much about your grades. Like I said, grades are kind of all consuming and they honestly don't matter all that much. The third thing that I would say is um, love more, right? So I think it's maybe a little over a year ago, if I went to my grandfather's funeral and the pastor or the priest who was giving the homily or whatever, they're basically saying like, and you know, this is a, it's a moral lesson. I'm going to, it's ca it's cashed out in theological terms, but it's a moral lesson. He was saying that when you go 
to God on judgment day, you're not going to be asked, did you have this nice car? Did you form such and such many friendships? Did you have a nice house? And so on. The question that you're going to be asked is, did you love? That's the question. That's the question that you're going to be asked. Did you love? And I, that, that really stuck with me. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> did, did I love? You know, so I tell myself to love more, just make an intentional efforts daily, weekly, monthly, over long spans of time, over short spans of time to love more, to love the people in my life more, to will their good and to spend time with them, to help them, etc. Bilal Kanfar also asks, do you identify yourself as a philosopher? If so, why? So I tend not to describe myself in any way, at least currently, other than what I do. So, so you'll always hear me say, for instance, at the beginning of my videos or on other channels, you will always hear me say this. I say, I do popular and scholarly level work in philosophy. That's what I say. I don't exactly know what it is for someone to be a philosopher. So I'll just let others use the term to describe me or not use the term to describe me. Now, many people have described me this way, and I don't object to it when they do so. And the main reason I don't object to it is because it doesn't seem inappropriate given that, of course, you know, I actively publish quite a lot in the field and so on. But again, whenever I introduce myself, I just say what I do. Bilal Kanfar continues, do you think democracy is a good system? If not, do you have a better system in mind? Well, I tend to agree with Winston Churchill when he said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. I actually think probably representative democracy with something like a constitution and bill of rights is the best form of government, or perhaps the least worst form of government. Pure democracy can lead rather quickly to the tyranny of the majority and consequently the stripping of rights from marginalized groups. This is why we need something like an indirect democracy together with rights enshrined or protected in something like a Bill of Rights. Ryan Santos asks, what are your main disagreements with Swinburne's cumulative argument for theism? This is probably a topic for a video itself, but I'll be very brief here. I don't think theism is as simple as Swinburne makes it out to be. I tend to agree with Draper regarding theism's simplicity. You can see, for instance, his Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on atheism and agnosticism and various other of his works. I also don't think Swinburne's inferences to the other divine attributes work from his core, pure, limitless, intentional power or whatever. You know, he tries to derive all these various other attributes, but you know, he has to add in various auxiliary hypotheses. Those are deeply questionable and et cetera. And, and those inferences play a big role in his case for simplicity and so on. So yeah, I also don't think theism is as predictably powerful as Swinburne makes it out to be, especially given the near infinitude of ways that God could actualize the relevant goods he's aiming towards in his creative act. I go over more of this in my 100 plus argument video where I respond to 100 plus arguments for God's existence. And then finally, I think Swinburne underestimates the extent and degree to which naturalism predicts various phenomena, such as evolutionary animal suffering, doxastic discord, and so on. And I don't think that theism predicts them as well as Swinburne makes it out to be. So anyway, lots of disagreements, but his general methodology seems to me to be close to spot on. And of course, Swinburne is still like one of the goats. So William Light says, congratulations, mate. Question, top 10 philosophy papers everyone interested in philosophy must read. Well... I'm not sure that everyone must read these or everyone in philosophy must read these. And it really depends on what you're interested in. It'll be different for different fields, but I guess I'll just make a hodgepodge of papers that I find really important. This is in no particular order, but here are my 10. What's it like to be a bat by Thomas Nagel? Facing up to the problem of consciousness by David Chalmers. On Sense and Reference by Frege. Justice as Fairness by Rawls. On What There Is by Quine. On What Grounds What? by Jonathan Schaffer, Moral Luck by Williams, Is Justified True Belief Knowledge by Gettier, Two Dogmas of Empiricism by Quine, and Alternative Possibilities and Moral Responsibility by Harry Frankfurt. Senku Ichigami. <laughs> Congratulations, Joe. I'm very happy for you. Well, thank you. I'm happy that you're here along for the ride. In the future, when you will become a professor and become a more busy person, then what will happen to this channel? I mean, I'm guessing the channel will still be up and alive and kicking, similar to how Professor Daniel Bonavac still produces wonderful content on his channel while being a tenured publishing professor in philosophy. So my guess is that it'll still be up, alive, kicking, alive and well. Jay Victor asks, instead of saying miracles don't happen, which is a denial, not an argument, miracle arguments should not be denied on the basis of Hume, but with a critique of the fact itself. Say the witnesses were deceived, they lied, and so on. What do you think? I mean...
By my lights, I think it's perfectly kosher to point out that miracles in general have an extremely low intrinsic probability. And so the evidential bar they need to reach in order to convince us that they really happened, as opposed to any of the other far more intrinsically probable alternatives, such as honest mistakes among alleged witnesses, self-deception, lying, hallucination, misperception, social contagion effects, etc. I think because of this, the evidential bar that they need to reach in order to convince us that they really happened is quite high. Now, this is a salient point afflicting pretty much any argument for miracles. Of course, it doesn't show that no such argument could work, and it doesn't show that any particular miracle could not have possibly happened. That do It doesn't show that, right? But it does show that such arguments for miracles and such appeals to individual miracles are quite significantly hampered from the outset. They're evidentially hampered from the outset because they have a super high eventual bar, considering that the intrinsic probability is so low, especially in comparison to rival hypotheses that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so Lena, I think that's I think that's the name. What experience, if any, have you had with psychedelics? No experience, I'm sorry, I kid you not. I have not experienced any psychedelics whatsoever. The closest I've had is, uh, well, I was gonna say, <laughs> I was gonna say philosophy because, you know, that's a kind of a, an experience of sorts, man. You know, philosophy, of course, that's a drug. Lena also asks, have you ever had a religious experience that was a distinctly altered state of consciousness? So no, I've never had a religious experience that was an altered state of consciousness. Back when I was a practicing Christian, I did think I felt God's calling at times and maybe in some vague sense, I felt God's presence at points. But again, it was all rather vague and nondescript. And furthermore, it was somewhat rare. But yeah, CJ Byerl asks, thoughts on the introspective argument, thoughts on Calvinism, thoughts on IP's argument from quantum physics. So I had, I had to look this up. I hadn't heard of the introspective argument. It has three premises and a conclusion. First premise is the mind exists. That seems plausible. The second premise is the properties of the mind are not that which matter can have. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm skeptical of that. I don't see sufficient justification for thinking that's true. I watched IP's video on this and I found the justifications to be rather sorely lacking, to be honest, and to overlook a lot of the prominent responses in the literature that both physicalists and non-idealists have made to this sort of claim. But anyway, I'm not convinced of that, that second premise. I mean, I think a physical object, for instance, can easily have non-physical properties. And those non-physical properties might very well involve things like qualitative consciousness. You know, when you have a sufficiently complex neural state, you know, that, that physical state might be associated with certain non-physical mental states, certain non-physical mental states or mental properties. Premise three, substance dualism is false. I'm not convinced about that. Again, I'm not a substance dualist. I'm a kind of nondescript, non-physicalist of sorts, but I'm open to substance dualism. And so I'm not convinced that premise three is true. And of course, Ivy's argument against it was the interaction problem. And I honestly don't find that all that convincing. Radically different kinds of things interact all the time. And moreover, we all have to be committed to some kind of primitive causal interaction that isn't mediated by way of a mechanism. Otherwise, if you deny that, you have infinitely many mechanisms obtaining in, in virtue of other more fundamental mechanisms ad infinitum. And that doesn't seem to be plausible. So anyway, I'm not convinced that premise three is true. And then from one through three, it is alleged to follow that all is mind, right? Everything is either a mind or a property or a content of a mind. But I, I'm not convinced of premises two and three. So what about Calvinism? It seems morally objectionable if it's combined with eternal conscious torment. So God is like, predetermining people to hell. It's like, okay, <laughs> let's step back a second. Let's put on our empathy hats and our reason hats and see that this isn't the most plausible view that we can take, is it? Also, Calvinism would either require compatibilism or would require us to be unfree, but I think that we are free. And I do have some reservations for compatibilism. Now, I'm agnostic on compatibilism, but I do have reservations. And so that means that I also have reservations for Calvinism. And the reservations largely derive from the manipulation argument. So it's difficult to see if, if all of our actions and choices are the inevitable consequences of conditions over which we have no control whatsoever. It's difficult to see how then our choices and our actions are relevantly different from someone who is being manipulated from an external agent, right? Who is, let's say, toying with their deliberative processes after all, that's also a case of me performing various actions and making certain decisions because of prior factors that made those inevitable over which I have no control. Now, again, the literature here is monumentally complex and vast, and I'm not fully convinced by the argument. After all, if I were, 
I would think compatibilism is false. But again, I'm agnostic on compatibilism. So again, these just kind of pull on my mind. They're worries, they're reservations that I have. But also another reservation that I have for compatibilism is that it does seem plausible that we can do otherwise. It seems plausible that we can do otherwise. Firstly, I mean, that just phenomenologically, you know, if I like wiggle my finger right here, it seems as though I could do that one fewer time or one more time, or I could do it at a faster tempo. It seems as though if I do it in this very instance, I could do otherwise than I'm in fact doing. So I could, instead of doing it at this pace, rewind the clock, I could have done it at a much faster pace and I could have controlled that essentially. Similarly, I mean, it seems plausible that if someone ought to do something, then it must then at least be possible for them to do it. Again, there are some potential counterexamples to that, but at least a lot of people find it plausible that odd implies can. If I'm like tied to this chair and I can't save someone drowning over there, then it's obviously false that I ought to save that person drowning over there because I'm literally, I'm tied to a chair. What are you talking about? I can't save them. Or like, if you say that I ought to fly, what are you talking about that I ought to fly? I can't fly. And that's why it's not the case that I ought to fly. But if ought implies can, and we take something like this obviously true principle that Hitler ought to have refrained from killing the Jews, that seems obviously true. Well, then it follows that Hitler could have refrained from killing the Jews. And that entails that he could have done otherwise. This is pushing on those kind of libertarian free will intuitions. It's pushing towards thinking that at least the kind of control and freedom that we have is incompatible with our actions and decisions being the inevitable consequences of earlier factors over which we have no control. Again, though, I'm not a libertarian. I'm agnostic about libertarianism and compatibilism. So I don't think that this is insuperable, right? The literature here is just so complicated. And, you know, there are responses to these sorts of arguments and they're not implausible. They're not ludicrous responses. So all this is just, you know, a big balancing game and it's very difficult. But anyways, to complete my thought here and to connect it back to Calvinism, I'd argue that if Calvinism is true, well, then it plausibly follows that we cannot do otherwise since each of our actions is the inevitable consequence of prior conditions over which we have no control, namely God's decree billions of years ago or whatever. If that's set in stone, right, given that God made that decree, it seems, I don't know, it seems really plausible that I can't do otherwise. That would require me to have the ability to do something such that were I to do it, somehow I could bring it about that in the past that God decreed differently than he in fact decreed. But I don't know, it seems implausible that I have that kind of power over the past. So anyway, those are my thoughts on Calvinism. The first one was about if it's combined with eternal conscious torment, I'd see it as well, I just see it as obviously false, to be honest. But the second thing I'd say is that Calvinism seems to require compatibilism. But I don't know, I have some reservations for compatibilism pertaining to manipulation arguments and pertaining to libertarian intuitions about the ability to do otherwise. And then finally, right, CJ asks about IP's arguments from quantum physics. So I haven't looked into the, these arguments that uh, you're talking about from quantum physics, so I'm not going to comment on them. Lipton T asks, what's your favorite argument against the Frege russell quine view of existence? I'm studying it right now. Bonus, are there any non-existent objects? Well, I'll answer your bonus right now. No, there are no non-existent objects. By my lights, to say that there are non-existent objects is to say that there exist non-existent objects, which is in turn to say that there are these things that both exist and don't exist, which seems to me to be absurd. Proponents of that thesis have some reservations about some of the inferences that I made in there, but they're wrong. Okay, so yeah, the Frege russell quine view uh, of existence. Well, they all had slightly different views here, but you know, to the extent that you can kind of collect them together and make a very broad generalizations about them, roughly their views about existence can be encapsulated as follows. So firstly, being is the same as existence. Being and existence, those terms, they're predicated univocally of everything. So they're predicated in the exact same sense of absolutely everything. Existence can be understood in terms of existential quantification. So right, Quine famously said that to be is to be the value of a bound variable. That is to be is to be <laughs> the X in either for all X or there exists an X. So to be is to be the value of one of those bound variables. I also take the Frege Russell Quine view to include ontological monism. So there's only one way or mode or kind or type of existence. Uh, there aren't multiple ways or modes of being, whatever that means. <laughs> According to this Frege Russell Quine view, everything exists in a generic univocal sense of exists. Existence is also intimately connected to number. So to say that there are unicorns is to say, at least in part, that the number of unicorns isn't zero. There's at least one of them. So existence and number are pretty closely tied together, as is identity. Existence, moreover, is a second order property for these guys. That is, it's a property of properties, or sometimes they'd say a property of concepts, rather than existence being a first order property of individuals. So existence would then be closely tied to instantiation. 
And finally, this Frege Russell Quine view, I take it, would include the claim that there are no non existent things. Everything exists. Now, some people get confused when I say that everything exists. That, that's not saying that, oh, unicorns exist. Oh, God exists. No, everything exists means that there are no non existent things, right? I mean, if everything is red, you're saying that there aren't any things which satisfy the following description they're non red. No, there are no non red things. So everything is red. That's, that's basically what you're saying. You're saying there are no non-existent things. So everything exists. You're not saying that, oh, there are unicorns. Well, the reason why you're not saying that is because unicorns aren't things, right? <laughs> so anyway, you ask about my favorite argument against this view. Well, maybe just an appeal to intuition. I mean, uh, at least with respect to that ontological monism aspect of it, you know, one of the central arguments for ontological pluralism, I honestly don't find it that plausible, but one of the central arguments is some things seem so radically different from one another that they aren't just different in nature. They're also different in being, right? So numbers and platypuses, yes, they're different in nature, but so the thought goes, that doesn't fully capture the, the real divide between these things. You also need to posit a difference in the way of being that they enjoy, the kind of, the kind of existence that they enjoy. So my response to that thing is like, what do you, what do you talk? Well, first, 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 I'm not entirely clear that I have a grip on what ways or modes of being are, but, but set that aside. All we need to account for these intuitions is that these things have radically different characters, right? They have radically different natures. They have radically different properties. You don't need to posit some different way of being that they enjoy. They can exist in the same sense while nevertheless having radically divergent properties. Some of them are spatial. Some of them are non-spatial. Some of them are temporal. Some of them are non-temporal. Some of them are causal. Some of them are acausal. That's all you need. Once you list out these differences, there's nothing more. <laughs> there's nothing more. I haven't left anything out. And, you know, there are other arguments, and I don't really find them all that plausible, but some people say that this view runs into difficulties with its close connection between existence and quantification. You know, some people say that, that it can't allow us to predicate existence or non-existence of individuals and that it can't capture our predicating existence and non-existence of individuals in, in ordinary language. I tend to think that it, that it can. Okay, Bilal Kanfar asks, can one use evidence to make a strong case in metaphorical investigation? So unfortunately, I don't know what metaphorical investigation is. Uh, maybe you mean metaphysical investigation? And if so, then I would say, of course, we can use evidence in such investigations, both empirical evidence, right? Drawing on the findings of relativity, for instance, to inform our metaphysical account of the nature of time, and also non-empirical evidence, for instance, showing that a view entails a contradiction. <laughs> that's, one of the, that's one of the simplest ways to do it. Or entails some other absurd consequence, such as we don't exist, or other sorts of things like that. Again, these are just toy examples. Bilal Kanfar asks, what is your take on the Second Amendment and gun control? Well, I haven't researched this in much depth. In principle, I guess I'm inclined to think that citizens should be able to bear arms, but that this should be accompanied by a suitable degree of regulation, such as comprehensive background checks and the like. But... I don't research this at all. So that's all I'm going to say. And that's a very tentative view that I have. I'm open to changing my mind. Sneaky snake, 23. <laughs> Sneaky snake. <laughs> Sneaky snake. Snake. I'm a snake. I'm a snake. I'm a snake. I'm a slithery little snake and snake. I'm so slithering and sneaky cause I'm a snake. Slithering in your garden, catching me a mouse. Snake. Congrats, Joe. Uh, two questions. What do you think is the most convincing argument to you that God exists? And what do you think is the most convincing argument that God does not exist? Well, let's set aside cumulative cases because that's kind of cheating, isn't it? I mean, but that's that's gonna kind of be my answer for both sides. It's a cumulative case style argument where you're piling up all these different evidential considerations. But that's kind of cheating, right? I think you're asking about what are like the individual pieces of evidence or individual arguments. So I guess for God, I'm gonna kind of pick two broad families. First, stage one of contingency arguments. I mean, of course, you need stage two for it to be an argument for God's existence, but still, stage one is related. So I'm gonna include that. I quite like a lot of stage one, or at least I'm sympathetic to stage one contingency arguments. Check out my contingency argument playlist for all you who are interested in that. And then also I, I like some arguments from consciousness, particularly Bayesian ones. Um, not ones that say consciousness can't arise under naturalism or anything like that, but that, that it's more expected under theism than it is on naturalism. That There are various probabilistic hurdles that you have to get over under a naturalistic worldview that make it much more surprising on naturalism than it is on theism. So that's a kind of generic consciousness argument, but you know, also more specific ones like recently, Dustin Crummett and Brian Cutter published an article on an, a new argument for God's existence from psychophysical harmony. 
it's super fascinating and honestly quite plausible. And I think it provides, you know, serious evidence for God's existence. What about against God's existence? The most convincing, again, there are several considerations here, but one of them is, I've covered this a lot, but evolutionary animal suffering, right? The history of life on earth is a bloodbath. And this is the very means or mechanism by which God brought about biological diversity in, in general and humans in particular, right? Just this predation, suffering, languishing, parasitism, death, all this sort of stuff. You know, it's nature red in tooth and claw. It's animals ripping each other to shreds. It just seems so monumentally surprising by my lights that this would be the providential working of an omnibenevolent, omnipotent, omniscient God in the very creative act of this being, the very bringing about of humans, the crown jewel of creation and, and the biological diversity more generally is just this horrific process. And that just seems so surprising. And, you know, hundreds of millions of years of this sort of thing. It's just, it's so surprising under theism, but it's nowhere near as surprising under a view on which the foundation of reality is indifferent to the flourishing and languishing of sentient creatures. Yusuf Ahmed asks, uh, what does your credence for each major world religion look like? Well, uh, I don't have super specific credences here, and they largely reflect my background and upbringing, but I do have a quite low credence in most of them, really. Uh, I guess the highest which isn't saying that it's above half or anything like that, obviously. But the highest among them is probably Christianity, principally because the arguments for Jesus' resurrection, while not rationally compelling, are nevertheless interesting and strike me as at least better than the arguments I've come across for other religious traditions. So Dominic S. asks, do you have an opinion about the causal theory of reference? Do you think it's at all plausible, especially for proper names and natural kinds? Well, I mean, I can say that I'm not a fan of descriptivism. I know you didn't ask that. <laughs> uh, descriptivism is something like, kind of going off memory here, but a name refers to whatever that has most or at least most important of the attributes in a description associated with a name, something like that. This has a lot of problems. We might have someone associate a radically mistaken conception and attributes with someone, yet their use of the name can still refer to them. We have the problem with the example of Feynman. When people think about Feynman, they oftentimes think of like, wasn't he like a physicist or something? You're like, you know, like, isn't it that dude that played bongos or whatever? <laughs> it's like, yeah, both of those are true, but you're not picking out anyone uniquely with that. You're not referring to anyone uniquely. And yet you're still, with your use of the name, you're still picking out that dude. And so it can't just be a matter of the description associated with the name, uh, of, of what the name refers to. It, it can't just be a matter of function of that. So, you know, to circumvent this, you could take something like a causal theory. Like even if someone is radically mistaken in their conception of someone, still their use of the name, traces back in a kind of causal history to the person and a kind of baptizing or naming ceremony where the person was dubbed their name. I, like, I hereby call this person James or whatever. Uh, you know, that name is passed along and this causal transactions or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, causation should probably play a central role in our theory of reference. But I mean, a bare causal theory of reference itself has lots of difficulties. Now you have reference shifting cases, right? There may be a causal chain from our use of the term Santa Claus to a certain historical saint saint nicholas but still children in america when they use the the term santa or the name santa claus they do not refer to that saint what they refer to is well it's a failure of reference because there's no such thing as santa claus but if it were to refer successfully it'd be referring to this jolly nordic elf of sorts with magical powers or whatever so in this case you have the reference of a name divorced from its causal history to someone with a baptizing or naming ceremony. Another problem is one raised by Gareth Evans. You could have two babies born and their mothers, their respective mothers, bestow names upon them. But the nurse, <laughs> when the babies are taken into another room, accidentally switches them uh, <laughs> and the error is never discovered. And so it will thereafter undeniably be the case that the person universally known as Jack is so called, right, is called Jack because a woman dubbed another baby with the name, right? So you wouldn't have this kind of proper dubbing ceremony, accurately causally linking up to the thing that the name is actually referring to. So that's another problem for a bare causal theory of reference. So what theory would I take? I mean, again, I, I'd probably, so Gareth Evans is one of the, one of the major players in this field. And I would probably accept something like a hybrid view, which is Gareth Evans. His view is a kind of hybrid view between descriptivism and causal theory. Anyway, deep GP, maybe it's deep geep. Are there more wheels or doors in the world? Congrats on the 10 K. Well, thank you. I, I, I truly appreciate that. Now, I'm not going to argue for this, but if I had to bet, well, I mean, I'm, I honestly don't know. I'm just going to say this up front. I don't know whether or not there are more doors or wheels in the world. If you want my gut reaction, I would bet that there are more doors than wheels. That's probably going to cause some controversy. Actually, in a patron exclusive Q&A video, I explained several reasons why I would bet on this. So check out that video. <laughs> Become a patron and check it out if you're interested. Logical Liberty asks, 
Okay, so it looks like there are three questions here. Biggest regrets. Okay, so I, I do have some biggest regrets. Firstly, selling my artworks I made in high school. Oh, I was a stupid man. So, you know, I'm this young kid. Um, I don't appreciate art at that young age. I appreciate some other things, but not art. But, you know, I've since become cultured <laughs> and I like, I, you know, I like art. I'd love to hang up art in my room and, and, and so on, especially if it's art that I made. My high school required us to take certain art classes. And yeah, basically we went through all these different kinds of art and we produced them and we learned like actual methods and tools to make really nice, beautiful artwork. So <clears throat> I made two pieces that were especially very good. So one of them, I think it's called embossing. I think that's what it's called. And it's like this really thin metal sheet and you almost like carve on it of sorts. You're not making cuts in it, but you are like putting dents in it. You're making other things like stand up and st stand back. And so, yeah, you can basically like almost stenciling on it of sorts, but you use this interesting tool and then you put like ink on it and the ink sinks in in certain ways and it makes it look super cool. Yeah, I did one of this really beautiful sunflower and the finished result was amazing. <laughs> also, we had another one. I don't know what this technique is called, but basically you draw. So it's a perspective kind of drawing and you draw out, you know, the various things. I chose Big Ben uh, because it has nice lines and so on up and down and back and forth and so on. So you draw it out and then you go to a bunch of different magazines and you find the shades of color in those magazines. And, you know, it's not perfect, but you find the shades of color that you want and you basically cut them into little strips. And then you, you paste those strips differently based on the colors and so on on your drawing. And the finished product looks so cool, so beautiful. I made this Big Ben thing and it was so cool. And, you know, this is it's like really big, you know, it's like pretty big. Uh, my mother's coming. That's what she said. <clears throat> so I made these and they were very good. And the teacher chose some of our artworks basically to be able to be put on sale for the school or whatever for you know parents who might come in as well as well other students but also you know teachers and so on uh and so you know <laughs> i wanted money <laughs> and so i just i sold them oh i'm so sad what a bad decision the second question that logical liberty asks is best decision or decisions that you've ever made well I've got a few of these definitely going to Purdue. Oh my goodness. So I kid you not, basically all my professors in both philosophy and biology. So I majored in philosophy, minor in biology. All of them have been amazing. Uh, they've been highly intelligent, highly supportive, highly caring, very concerned for all students' success and welfare. That's also important. They are concerned about students' welfare. Um, they were all available and willing to help. They were excellent communicators. I learned a lot from them and so on. Second thing about Purdue is um, financially speaking, it was the best decision. I'm an in-state student and uh, Purdue has frozen tuition since like 2010 or something. <laughs> of course, I mean, I'm still in some student debt. I take out some loans to help with it, which is what all my lovely patrons are helping me pay. So if you want to help help fuel this channel firstly, but also help me pay my student debt, I would deeply appreciate that. So financially, it was the best decision I could have made. Um, it's also very close to home. And that was especially good during COVID, right? Purdue managed COVID extremely well. And, and finally, the friends and opportunities that I had at Purdue, the rigorous classes in which I grew and learned and so on down the list. So yeah, Purdue, uh, definitely one of the best decisions of my life. Another best decision is uh, getting into philosophy. Wonderful decision. Uh, also publishing philosophy, also a good decision. Doing philosophy, a good decision. And also doing that in both popular and scholarly settings. Both of those have complemented each other really well, I found. And yeah, I really like that. Finally, I forgot one of my biggest regrets. It's minoring in biology. Listen, I love biology and I got into that because I love it, evolutionary biology. But unfortunately, too many of my classes, not all of them, but too many of them were predominated by rote memorization, which I do not like. I do not like rote memorization. It frustrates me. If I could redo it, I'd minor in math or something because I really like math and it would have been more useful. Anyway, Logical Liberty has a third question. I've seen you comment something to the effect of most internet atheist content is poor. Yes. Uh, this makes me wonder, what are some non-poor atheist content creators? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, so I'm going to intentionally restrict myself to small-ish channels since they deserve shout outs more than channels with tens or hundreds of thousands of subs. So with that in mind, I really like uh, Emerson Green's channel. So check that out. I also enjoy, in terms of atheist content creators, the Non-Alchemist channel. 
um, Friction Philosophy. My friend Troy runs that. I've also listened to some to Camille Greger and uh, James Fodor, and I found many of their points to be really insightful. But yeah, those are the content creators that I'll mention, the atheist content creators that I'll mention. Again, I'm intentionally restricting myself to small-ish content creators. And I'm not claiming that that's a fully representative sample. The Dude, The Dude says, what is your view on mathematical Platonism? What are the arguments for and against this view that you find the most compelling? So I tentatively lean towards realism with respect to mathematical objects like numbers, shapes, sets, and the like. And as for which realist view I find most attractive among the realist theories, it would probably be a broadly Platonic realist view in the contemporary analytic sense of Platonism, not Plato's own views. What is the best argument for this? Well, probably... The, the family of arguments known as indispensability arguments, mat quantification over mathematical objects, and just more generally, math and mathematical truths are just utterly integral and essential to the success of science, and that this gives us good reason to think that there are such things. And also, I mean, just the intuitive fact that there these really seem to be objective, mind-independent facts. You know, it does seem to be a mind-independent objective necessary truth that like one plus one equals two. And if we think that truth corresponds with reality, arguably this truth would have to correspond to some sort of reality, like the number one and the plus function, etc. What's the best argument against? Well, definitely simplicity considerations. Anti-realism and nominalism are definitely simpler ontologies than realist views. And that is, that is a mark in their favor. Moreover, the I guess one of the best art considerations that they have is like epistemic considerations. Realists are saddled with the task of explaining how we have epistemic access to this a-causal uh, realm of abstract objects. So yeah, I mean, again, I'm not saying that that's an insuperable problem, and I've actually covered that in many videos on my channel. But anyway, those are the best arguments for and against, respectively. Apologetic Squared says, congrats, Joe. Well, thank you very much, Apologetic Squared. If you guys are interested in Apologetic's channel, you can check out his. I like how he covers non-traditional style arguments on his channel. Say you use a time machine to meet your future self and learn that future Joe is a Christian. What would you ask him? First, I'd ask him to kill me. Would he be able to do it? Could he kill me? If I gave him a knife, would he be able to cut my throat? Would he? Think about it. Like, if he tried, what would happen? Would he slip on a banana peel? Would he like miss? And would I be able to like just make fun of him that he just somehow he can't, <laughs> he can't kill me? I mean, just think about it. If he killed me, then I wouldn't be alive in the future for there to even be a future Joe to kill me, right? So, so he can't kill me. So I'd, I'd ask him to kill me, like, just try. I mean, okay, maybe I shouldn't because he could significantly injure me. That, that, okay, I take that back. I'm not going to ask him to kill me. I'm not going to ask me to kill me. Would that be suicide? Would I be committing suicide if I asked future Joe to kill me? Okay, on, on to more serious questions. Firstly, of course, why are you a Christian? Uh, do tell. Secondly, what kind of Christian are you? Like, are you just like broadly Protestant? Are you Catholic? Are you Eastern Orthodox? What model of God do you have? I mean, I doubt that it would be like a high octane classical theism, um, but like what model of God do you have? What soteriological model do you have? I mean, again, I doubt that it would be eternal conscious torment, but you know, are you an annihilationist? Are you a universalist? Are you, are you agnostic on it? What model of providence do you have, right? So like, are, are you an open theist? Are you a simple foreknowledge proponent? Are you a theological determinist? Are you a Molinist? Um, yeah, pretty basic things like that. These sorts of things that I'd ask. Just asks, favorite quantum mechanics interpretation? Congrats, by the way. Well, thank you for your congratulations. I, I do appreciate it. Uh, well, I don't really have a favorite quantum mechanics interpretation. I mean, I certainly don't have a view on the matter. But which is the coolest? I guess I could answer that. Maybe it's the many worlds interpretation, like the Everettian interpretation. Richard Taylor. That's a nice name. That's a famous philosopher if you look that up, Richard Taylor. Why on earth are you an Arsenal fan? Um, they haven't been any good since the early 2000s. They basically fell apart when Fabregas left in 2011. You just have to rub it in, don't you? Well, listen, I fell in love with Arsenal, uh, let's say, in like the 2009-2010 season. And it's been no looking back since. Uh, what was the reason I fell in love? Well, literally, partly because of Fabregas. Like, he actually kind of got me into being interested in professional soccer and specifically Arsenal. So a lot of my interest in Arsenal can be directly traced to Cesc Fabregas. <laughs> but also, the way that they played, I found to be beautiful. They were basically like an English version of Barcelona, right? So, you know, they had the kind of tiki-taka style, um, build it up from the back, uh, they, these sorts of things. I, I just liked Arsene Wenger's style of play, really. And uh, it struck me as an elegant style of football. I will literally never forget the Tiki Taka goal that we scored against Norwich. Uh, I forget what season it was. Maybe it was 2013-14. It was so good. Oh my gosh.
you know, I'm, I'm going to include a clip of that, that video. Scores Norwich completely static and caught out by the through ball. So it was the way that they played, but it was also Cesc Fabregas. Ahmed Ragab asks, uh, congratulations, Joe. I want to thank you. You really helped me to understand and discover many things in philosophy of religion. Well, that's wonderful to hear. I really like when I hear that my content is serving people and is benefiting people in their pursuit of truth. So I really like that. I have three questions. One, what is the differences between Leibniz's contingency argument and Aquinas' second way? Well, Aquinas' second way is somewhat difficult to interpret. Some interpreters think it's basically the same as his Deante argument for God's existence, based on the composition in things between their essence and their existence. As an aside, you'd think that Aquinas would mention the distinction between essence and existence if he were intending that argument to be the same as the Deante argument. But anyway, set that aside, and set aside more broadly these interpretive difficulties. Its most basic and its fundamental structure is as follows. So again, this is just me kind of doing this from memory. I just typed this out. <clears throat> we see around us things that are causally dependent on others. In many cases, this causal dependence forms a per se, or essentially ordered causal series, wherein each posterior member of the series has causal power only insofar as they wholly derive and transmit the causal power that they're bestowed from without. Uh, but the reasoning continues, there cannot be an infinitely descending essentially ordered causal chain of dependence, and moreover, nothing can directly or indirectly causally depend on itself. And from all this, it follows that there's at least one uncaused cause with a kind of built-in causal power that it doesn't derive from without. Aquinas then proceeds to identify this cause with God. Now, as for Leibniz's contingency argument, there are similar interpretive difficulties when it comes to this argument. Setting aside these interpretive difficulties, its most basic and fundamental structure is as follows. Every fact has an explanation, it's a fact that there are contingent things. So the fact that there are contingent things has an explanation. But the only explanation for the fact that there are contingent things involves a necessarily existent concrete thing that is a necessary being. So there's a necessary being. Now, some people get a little bit caught up on the word being here. We're not using being in, I guess, the way that we might colloquially use it in English language. Like, oh, there's a being around here. You know, like something that's almost like sentient or maybe agential or something like that we're not we're not talking about that we're by, by a being we just mean like a concrete object so like this water bottle would be a being as would uh my phone as would me as would this lamp so anyway those are the the respective arguments to give you guys a little bit of context so at least as i see it there are four major differences between these arguments firstly there's a difference in the relation at play here right aquinas is focused on causation whereas leibniz is focused on explanation an explanation is broader than causation. There are non-causal forms of explanation. So something might be explained in terms of its metaphysical necessity, in terms of the impossibility of its failing to obtain, or something might be explained in terms of a ground rather than a cause. A ground is like a metaphysical explanation. For instance, the macroscopic properties of water, like its liquidity, are grounded in more fundamental physical and chemical facts about water. So anyway, that's one difference between the arguments. Another difference is the data, right? The data that they're looking at. Aquinas is looking at caused things uh, or things that don't exist of themselves, whereas Leibniz is looking at contingent things, things that genuinely could have failed to exist. These are separable. You might think there could be something that necessarily exists in the sense that it cannot fail to exist, and yet it doesn't exist of itself. Like it only exists insofar as it's causally brought about by another necessary being, and it's necessarily brought about by that necessary being. So anyway, th these two things can come apart. And similarly, you might think that there could be contingent things which are not caused things. You might think a contingent thing could exist of itself without having to derive its existence from another. So th these two things can come apart, at least conceptually speaking. Another difference, so this is the third major difference, is the way that we arrive at the conclusion, right? So Aquinas basically rules out infinite ontological dependence like an infinitely descending chain of ontological dependence. Whereas for Leibniz, he's not so much ruling out an infinite chain of dependence. Leibniz says, let the chain of dependence in reality be infinite. The chain of dependence among mere contingent things, let that be infinite. There's still this fundamental question of why there are any contingent things at all, right? So you'd still, even if that chain is infinite, you'd still need an outside explanation for why there is that chain at all, why there are these contingent things at all. Leibniz, again, he the way that he arrives at the ugh, the way that he arrives at the conclusion is basically by saying that the only explanatory candidate for the data is in terms of something like a necessary being, and he doesn't rule out infinite dependence chains. And then the fourth and final major difference is the conclusion. Aquinas only gets us to an uncaused cause with built-in causal power. Leibniz only gets us to a necessary being that explains why there are the contingent things that there are. If you want to look into this stuff further, check out my video, 
my recent video, 20 Cosmological Arguments and Analysis. And also check out my Contingency Argument playlist and also my Argument from Change playlist because a lot of what I say therein also applies to Aquinas' second way. And also check out my video on 100 plus arguments for God's existence because I think the second way is in there. So I talk about it in there. The second question that this person asks is, why would someone prefer believing in the weak PSR, uh, that is the necessary being doesn't have an explanation, over believing that the existence of the contingent beings is a brute fact. So I take it that you're asking why would someone prefer taking the unexplained foundation of reality to be necessary as opposed to contingent? Now, there are lots of reasons for this, or at least potential reasons for this. Firstly, contingent things, you could argue, seem to call out for an explanation in a way that necessary things don't, right? Contingent things, precisely because they're contingent, they easily could have fallen on that non-existent side of the dichotomy, right? As it were, if we're you know putting things a little bit metaphorically, you can imagine this dichotomy between existence and non-existence. And contingent things by themselves are kind of indifferent between these, right? There's nothing about the nature of a contingent thing that demands that it exists. And so in that case, it would seem as though you need something apart from the contingent thing to explain why it does in fact exist, right? Nothing about the contingent thing in and of itself is sufficient for its existence. So it would seem as though that you need some other condition in order for it to exist. You need some other kind of explanation for why it does in fact exist. And moreover, it easily could have fallen on the non-existent side of the dichotomy, which inspires a kind of puzzlement. Why does it exist? on that existence side of the dichotomy. Intuitively, it seems that there needs to be an explanation as to why it in fact falls on this side when it could have easily fallen on that side. Another reason is that we have a lot of experience with contingent things and they uniformly have explanations. So we can kind of base this basic kind of principle of explanation that contingent things have explanations on our experience. And this is really profoundly inductively supported. Abduction supports this, right? So perhaps the best explanation for why we have this uniform experience of wherever we look, we find that contingent things have an explanation. This is precisely what we would expect on the hypothesis that, hey, contingent things require explanations. Whereas if there could genuinely be contingent things that don't have an explanation, this is not as expected on that hypothesis. I know moreover that these reasons only apply to a principle that says contingent things have an explanation, right? We don't experience in our everyday experience necessary things. And so the appeals to our everyday experience and so on are only going to be supporting a principle to the effect of contingent things require an outside explanation. And if that's the case, right? If these reasons hold water, then that gives us a kind of symmetry breaker between a view on which the foundation of reality is necessary and a view on which the foundation of reality is contingent. If you're curious for more on this, you can check out Proust's book, The Principle of Sufficient Reason, A Reassessment. Um, that's published in 2006 by Cambridge University Press. It's an excellent book, a little bit technical at times, but it's rewarding. As well as, this is important, as well as my video, The Leibnizian Cosmological Argument, as well as my contingency argument playlist. But in my, my video, The Leibnizian Cosmological Argument, I go through a bunch of different motivations that people like Proust and Rasmussen have offered on behalf of the principle of sufficient reason as applied to contingent things. So check that out if you're interested. The third question that this person asks, could you explain the difference between S4 and S5 in modal logic? I can. Right, so, um, right, so if we compare the theories. Anyway, um, I'm going to use my handy dandy document to help me because I have some visualizations here. I did want to say that actually one video in my to make list of videos that I want to make or I need to make is a user's guide to modal logic where I, where I basically explain all this stuff in very clear and systematic terms. And here's my, my description of the difference between them. So S5 and S4 are systems of modal logic. What is logic? Logic is the study of valid inferences. What is modality? Right, because we're talking about modal logic. I'm breaking this down. Modality, well, that's concerned with possibility, necessity, and impossibility. So it's basically the study of valid inferences concerning possibility, necessity, and impossibility. That's what modal logic is. What is a system? Think of it like a compound, which has various components or elements. Those components or elements are axioms. So things you basically just postulate you take for granted. Oftentimes they're self-evident. Second, you have inference rules, which allow you to go from certain statements of a particular form or forms, and then infer other ones from that. So rules of inference. And then thirdly, a formal language. So basically, what are the various well-formed formulas that you have within this system? What operators do you have? How do those operators work? How are they interdefined, et cetera? So for more on this, you can see my a user's guide to the modal ontological argument. But anyway, that's I'm, break, I'm just breaking this down step by step, okay? <laughs> so before we get into explaining the difference between these two systems, we need to know a little bit about modal logic. So to say that it is necessary that P, so like it is necessary that one plus one equals two, you have a modal operator. It's a box. If you let P be the claim that one plus one equals two, 
The claim that it is necessary that one plus one equals two would be box P, okay? It would be box P, that box next to the P. It means it is necessarily the case that P or necessarily P. Similarly, it is possible that, or possibly, that's another modal operator, which is a diamond, okay? So boxes and diamonds. Now, these are interdefinable. So the diamond is defined basically as the negation of box negation. So think about it, right? If something's possible, well, then it's not necessarily false, right? It's not impossible. That's basically what you're saying. So it, if it's possible, then it's not necessarily false. And also if it's not necessarily false, well, then it could be true, right? It's possible. So that's that definition. And then think about this definition, right? Box is defined as not diamond not or negation. And this is basically saying if it's not possibly false, then it's necessary, right? If something couldn't be false, then obviously it's necessary. It must be true, right? So yeah, you can kind of see these are pretty intuitive if you think about it. Now, S5 includes the following axioms. So this is where we get into an important distinction between S5 and S4. S5 has these axioms, axiom M, which is box P entails P, right? Axiom K, right? So if it's necessarily the case that P implies Q, well, then necessarily P implies necessarily Q. Axiom four, right? So this is the characteristic axiom of system S4. System S5 includes that, but then it builds on it. So axiom four is box P entails or implies box box P. So if something's necessary, then it's necessarily necessary, right? So basically you can't, something can't be necessarily true in one world. And then in another world, it could fail to be necessarily true. So if something is necessarily true, then it's necessarily necessarily true. It must be necessarily true. Necessities don't vary across modal space. That's basically what you're saying. And then axiom five is saying that if something is possible, then it's necessarily possible. So basically if something's possible, then it couldn't be impossible. So if something's possible, you can't go to another possible world in which that thing is somehow impossible. No, possibilities are basically invariant across modal space. If something's possible, then it must be possible. It's not as though something could be possible in one world, but in another world, it's somehow impossible. So this is the crucial thing that distinguishes S5 from S4. S4 includes these, right? But S4 does not include axiom five. By contrast, S5 includes all of these, right? So S5 includes everything that S4 does, but it adds onto it. It adds this crucial axiom that possibly P entails necessarily possibly P. So this axiom is actually equivalent to, you can show that it's equivalent to the following. Possibly necessarily P implies necessarily P. So if something could be necessary, then it is necessary. If you're curious for a derivation, we're not going to go through this now, but this basically shows that if something's possibly necessary, then it's necessary given this axiom here. So again, S4 includes all those axioms except axiom five. So S4 includes all these, but axiom five isn't included. And so what this means is that an inference from possibly P to it is necessarily possible that P is invalid in S4, right? It just doesn't follow in S4, but it is valid in S5. It does follow in S5. And moreover, an inference from possibly necessarily P to necessarily P, that's invalid in S4, but it's valid in S5. And this is the crucial difference between them, especially for the modal ontological argument. Here's another way to see the difference between S4 and S5. Basically, S4 allows you to condense arbitrarily long strings of diamonds into one diamond, right? So if something is possibly, 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 possibly possible, then it's just possible. And moreover, if it's necessarily, 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 necessary, then it's just necessary. You can collapse those down. But S5, it's a bit stronger. You can collapse any string that ends in a given operator you can just collapse that string into that operator. So you could have diamonds over here, you could have boxes, you could have any string of diamonds or boxes. So long as it ends in a box, you can just collapse that down to a box. And the same thing is true of a diamond. Anyway, here's an equivalent but more technical way to put things. Oh, that's not okay. There might have just been a spider on my foot, but that's, uh, that's not cool. Anyway, here's an equivalent but more technical way to put things. Uh, it's in terms of the accessibility relation. Now, very roughly, to say that a world W1 is accessible from a world W2 is to say that from the perspective of world W2, world W1 is possible. So world W1 is possible relative to W2. This basically shows you the accessibility relation that corresponds with those various distinctive axioms that I mentioned earlier. So S4, <clears throat> its accessibility relation is reflexive and transitive, whereas S5's accessibility relation is reflexive 
symmetric and transitive. So you're adding the symmetry of the accessibility relation. You have to have a set or a domain and a reflexive relation on that set or domain is one which is such that every element of that domain or that set stands in that relation to itself. Transitive means that if A stands in that relation to B and B stands in that relation to C, well, then A stands in that relation to C. And then symmetric means that if A stands in that relation to B, well, then B also stands in that relation to A. So what you're saying basically is that if from the perspective of one world, another world is possible, well, then from the perspective of that world, the first world is possible. That's why you're adding an S5. You're adding that onto S4. S4 has reflexivity and transitivity of the accessibility relation. S5 adds the symmetry of the accessibility relation. So another way to put the key difference between S4 and S5 is that S5 adds another formal feature of the accessibility relation, namely symmetry. And relation R is symmetric. What that means is that for any X and any Y, if X stands in that relation to Y, then Y stands in that relation to X. Oh, and I think I already said this, but this document is available for patrons and there are lots of other very special goodies for patrons. All right, Fura21 asks, congrats for your 10K, thank you. Since you are an agnostic, can you do a video answering the most common atheist arguments against the existence of God? Well, potentially, uh, though first, I think several such arguments succeed, of course, right? I mean, they don't succeed in the sense of conclusively disproving God's existence, but by my lights, at least several of them succeed in the sense of offering evidence against God's existence. Well, then you might ask, why then am I not an atheist? Well, then the reason, of course, is because there's lots of evidence for theism. And also note that I've somewhat already done this, you know, covering lots of arguments for atheism. You can see my video with Trent Horn. It's called The Agnostic Case Against Atheism. That's in my playlist, My YouTube Appearances. It's also on Trent Horn's channel. You can just go up and search the agnostic case against atheism, Joe Schmidt, or something like that, and it'll pop up. Noah Killeen asks, what are your thoughts on Immanuel Kant's transcendental idealism and general insistence that things as experienced very likely don't map onto things in themselves? Kant himself goes as so far as to say that space and time are just constructs of our mind, not necessarily part of the world in itself. It also seems like this line of reasoning, which quickly leads to a fair bit of skepticism about what human reason can reveal about the real, about the real world, is a big part of the split between continental and analytic philosophy. Right. So one of the biggest criticisms of Kant here is that even if he doesn't recognize it, he is indeed committing himself to a very radical form of skepticism here. If that's right, then I myself would appeal to some of the common arguments against, or at least dialectical moves made in response to radical skepticism. So, you know, the it sounds like cheating, but the Morian shift is really just an invitation to compare plausibility, right? An invitation to compare the plausibility of, for instance, the claim that I have hands and that hands are external objects, to compare that kind of claim that I have hands in the ordinary sense of hands to the various highfalutin skeptical premises that Kant might bring forth with respect to his uh, transcendental idealism or, or whatever. And if we're comparing the plausibility between those, it seems much more plausible that I have hands than that the whole conjunction of this very highfalutin, high, highly theoretical, highly abstract, dubious, controversial philosophical premises are true. So that's the kind of Morian shift response. You've also got responses based on phenomenal conservatism. And you can see my humorous work for reasons in favor of phenomenal conservatism and a defense against objections to phenomenal conservatism. But, you know, if, if you have this kind of phenomenal conservatism approach, just pick something that seems obviously true. And you'll have defeasible justification for thinking that it's true because it seems obviously true. All you need to do is pick something that seems obviously true that's incompatible with Kant's transcendental idealism, and that's not going to be difficult to find. You could also go an externalist approach, right? You could just say that, well, even if we don't have a kind of internalist justification for thinking that there's a mind-independent external world, or that we aren't in these sorts of radical skeptical scenarios that might be entailed by Kant's transcendental idealism, you can say that we're still appropriately explanatorily connected to the facts known so that we really do know that this view is false, even if we can't produce some sort of knockdown philosophical argument against it, say. You can also go explanationist approaches, right? So there are various explanationist arguments for the existence of an external world, saying that that provides perhaps the best, perhaps the only explanation of our sensory experiences as of that world, etc. So if, as this criticism of Kant says, if Kant's view here entails the kind of radical skepticism, then I would bring to bear in this dialectical context, I bring to bear these various moves against skepticism that lots of philosophers have brought to bear. I don't quite know which one of those is the best or which one I'd prefer, but I find them all interesting, at least. Another, another criticism is that Kant has to presuppose that he has epistemic access to the way that things are in themselves, 
in order to argue that we don't have epistemic access to the way that things are in themselves, so that his argument is ultimately self-defeating. That's another criticism of Kant here. Ultimately, I don't really study Kant all that much, so I won't really offer further reflections beyond what I've just said. You do, however, make an interesting point about how Kant-inspired skepticism about human reason might undergird aspects of the split between continental and analytic philosophy. I found that interesting. Nabil Ikshan asks, um, congrats on 10K. Well, thank you. Uh, first question, have you ever felt bored or tired when discussing philosophy of religion? Well, honestly, not really. There's basically an infinite wealth of topics in philosophy of religion, ranging from arguments for and against God's existence to debates concerning models of God and divine providence and the problem of foreknowledge and human freedom, religious epistemology, disagreement, and so on, practically ad infinitum. So I really don't find myself getting bored, at least not yet. But that might, of course, be because I also do lots of studying and or research in other areas of philosophy, such as philosophical methodology, philosophy of time, metaphysics, metaethics, and a little bit in the philosophy of mind. So that might be one reason why, at least not yet, I haven't gotten bored. The second person, the second question that this person asks is, what would the future of philosophy of religion be like? By which I mean, will there be significant progress in philosophy of religion compared to previous generations? So I think one aspect of the future of philosophy of religion that we can look forward to will include more globalized concerns, looking at different models of God and models of ultimate reality in different Eastern religions or indigenous religions or African religion, you know, these other sorts of things, instead of a highly narrow focus on basically Christian apologetics. That's not to say that that's the only thing going on in the field currently, but it is like a major strand in the field, which is unfortunate. Do I think there will be progress? Probably yes. I mean, we've already made considerable progress, for example, clarifying and laying out the epistemic landscape of arguments for and against various positions concerning God's existence, divine providence and foreknowledge. We, we've seen progress in developing new arguments as of late, like psychophysical harmony, Bayesian arguments, a la Paul Draper, and so on. We've seen new formal and conceptual tools from other areas of philosophy brought to bear on philosophy of religion issues. For instance, the progress that we've made in our understanding of modal logic being applied to philosophy of religion, different formal tools in epistemology being brought to bear in philosophy of religion. There's been progress made in debates about modal collapse, for instance, that I've witnessed directly and contributed to myself, and so on. This person continues saying, what are your hopes and expectations for future philosophy, especially philosophy of religion? Maybe new arguments and lots of new interesting thoughts. Or do you think that most of the things in the future, including the fundamental and hard questions about philosophy of religion, have already been answered and discovered? So with respect to your first question, like I said, I think philosophy of religion will get more globalized, have more globalized concerns and be less. Second, I do think that there will be new and interesting arguments. I think it'll get less Christianized, less apologetic, and less weaponization of the arguments. And then as for your second question, I do think there's plenty of room for new and interesting arguments concerning the fundamental questions of philosophy of religion. For example, God's existence. Jahan Shah asks, thoughts on idealism? You can see my response to generic koala for that. Crab King says, congrats, Joe. You help a lot of people get educated on serious topics. Well, thank you. That is the purpose of it all. Question, what is your preferred view of personal identity? And if something like a psychological continuity theory isn't your preferred view, do you at least think that what we should have egoistic concern about is psychological continuity? So personal identity is a bit of a mess. I've studied it some, but I really don't have any settled view here. I guess if you absolutely tortured me, and forced me to choose a position, and I mean forced, uh, I'd probably take something like an animalist position. For example, one defended by philosophers like Van Inwagen, Olson, Andrew Bailey, etc. Basically, I'm a living human organism, like a human animal really, and I exist so long as this living human organism is around and kicking, so to speak. Again, I don't call myself an animalist, because I don't really have a position here. Again, I haven't really studied this all that much. And this is only a position that I would take if you forced me to take a position, if you tortured me. <laughs> Andrew Bailey also, incidentally, has a recent paper where he addresses some popular objections to animalism, dealing with like things like brain swaps, transplants into cyborg bodies, conjoined twins, and the like. Basically, Bailey argues that a version of animalism, generic animalism, can avoid such objections. And then as to your question about egoistic concern over psychological continuity, I guess I'm not sure, to be honest. I suppose whether such concern is rational ultimately depends on whether it is me who's the future person with whom I'm psychologically continuous or discontinuous, right? So it'll probably depend on a case-by-case -case basis here, my answer to your question. And in particular, it would depend on whether I judge the future person in question to be me. And we also have to disentangle the questions of 
whether I would have the relevant form of concern and whether I should have it, right? So anyway, I guess I'm finding it difficult to answer your question divorced from particular cases. Senku Shigami asks, what is objective morality and why it's true? Well, what is objective morality? Basically, I take it to just be facts about the following, what moral agents should and shouldn't do, what goods there are, for example, virtue, knowledge, pleasure, what bads there are, for example, vice, ignorance, suffering, what actions are right, wrong, permissible, impermissible, supererogatory, subirogatory, and so on. So objective morality is facts about those sorts of things. And this is an important addition. And these facts, in order to count as objective morality or objectively moral facts, must obtain or be true independently of anyone's stances, for example, their desires or their attitudes or their preferences and the like. Now, your second question is, why is it true? Well, that could be interpreted along epistemic or metaphysical lines, right? Along epistemic lines, the question is, why think such a view is true? And along metaphysical lines, the question is, what explains or accounts for the truth of said view? So my answer is going to depend on which question you're asking. Now, I think you're asking the epistemic question, so I'll just discuss that. There are several kinds of arguments for moral realism or objective morality. I'm not saying I endorse each of the following. I'm basically just trying to put these on your radar. So one of them is a kind of companions and guilt style argument. These kind of have a general structure of the following. Premise one, if there are no stance independent moral truths, then there are also no stance independent epistemic truths. Premise two, but there are stance independent epistemic truths. And so conclusion, there are stance independent moral truths. So that first premise is basically it's a companion to guilt. It's saying that these two things stand or fall together, stance independent moral and epistemic properties. And the idea behind this premise is that the various objectionable features that opponents of moral realism tend to say afflict moral properties, stance independent moral properties and stance independent moral truths and facts and so on. Those are also going to be applying and afflicting, as it were, stance independent epistemic facts and epistemic truths. If we're talking about epistemic norms and moral norms, if they're both stance independent, well, then you have a kind of objective, mind independent, stance independent, categorical prescriptivity, right? It's, in the, it's a categorical prescriptivity in that it prescribes something that you ought to do or that you should do. And it's categorical in that it's not hypothetical. It's not dependent on your desires. Like if you want truth, then you should believe the conclusion of an argument that you take to be valid and sound and so on. No, they're categorical in the sense of they're not conditioned on your having a particular set of desires or preferences or whatever. So that kind of categorical prescriptivity or what some philosophers call external normative reasons giving, though that is present in both stance independent moral facts and truths and so on and stance independent epistemic facts and truths and so on. So they kind of, they seem to stand or fall together. Or at least that's the idea behind that premise. And then the second premise, but there are stance independent epistemic truths. This one is somewhat difficult to justify if you don't share the relevant intuitions. But basically, you go on a fishing expedition. You go on a fishing expedition in the sense of you're fishing for certain intuitions that your interlocutor might share, or at least that you share when you're considering this argument. So you might say, for instance, that doesn't it seem obvious that if someone takes an argument to be both a valid and have all true premises, then they should accept the conclusion, even if they don't want to, right? Even if they don't want to, even if society doesn't want them to, who cares about anyone's preferences? They still should accept the conclusion if they take the argument to be both valid and have all two premises, right? They're being irrational if they don't accept that, that conclusion. Even if they don't want to accept the conclusion, they should, irrespective of their desires, irrespective of the society's desires, irrespective of all these sorts of things. Lots of people think that that seems really intuitive. And, you know, we could go on down the list of various other intuitive or potentially obvious or self-evident claims concerning stance-independent epistemic facts and properties and so on. So again, I'm not here defending these sorts of arguments. I'm just putting them on your radar of sorts. And in fact, I mean, a lot of anti-realists just reject categorical prescriptivity across the board. And I don't think there's anything strictly speaking contradictory or incoherent about that. I would just say that it's biting bullets, at least for me, at least for people who share the relevant intuitions. There's also arguments from deliberative indispensability. So David Enoch, for instance, he gives an argument from deliberative in indispensability for stance independent, irreducibly normative truths. So the argument is basically premise one, if X is instrumentally indispensable to an intrinsically indispensable project, then we're justified in believing X to exist. Premise two is that deliberation, that is our deliberative project, is intrinsically indispensable. Premise three is that stance independent, irreducibly normative truths are instrumentally indispensable to deliberation. And from all those, it follows that we're justified in believing that there are stance independent, irreducibly normative truths. And you can check out David Enoch's book for a further exploration of this. And of course, you know, anti-realists have certain responses and so on.
So in addition to companions and guilt arguments and deliberative indispensability arguments, you also have explanationist arguments. So these arguments basically say that stance-independent moral properties figure ineliminably in good explanations of observed phenomena. And they go on to state that if some property P figures ineliminably in good explanations of observed phenomena, then we have reason to think that P is instantiated. So basically those two together get you that we have reason to think that stance-independent moral properties are instantiated, which if true would entail moral realism. And there are boatloads of different versions of explanationist arguments that look at different observed phenomena. And of course, there are different anti-realist responses to these sorts of arguments and counter-responses and counter-counter-responses, etc. Right. There are also Morian and intuition-based arguments. So if you have phenomenal conservatism and if you share the relevant intuitions, so if you share, for instance, the intuition that regardless of anyone's desires and stances and preferences and so on, torturing a child just for fun is like not okay, <laughs> is morally impermissible. If you share that kind of intuition, then given phenomenal conservatism, you would have corresponding to the strength of that intuition or the strength of that seeming, you would have correspondingly strong reason to accept moral realism. Of course, it's a defeasible reason, but you would need some kind of comparably strong defeater, either an undercutting or rebutting defeater. And then a corollary of that is a kind of Morian argument. The Morian argument basically says, we'll take any highfalutin, abstract, highly theoretical argument that you might give me for error theory or some other anti-realist view, the conjunction of the premises there is very often going to be less plausible than the claim, for instance, that torturing a child just for fun is objectively wrong. Once more, I'm just giving you a lay of the land of some of these arguments. I'm not here to defend these arguments. You also have theory comparison arguments for moral realism. So Terence Cuneo, Jonathan Bankson, I'm forgetting his first name. I'm sorry. It's Cuneo, Bankson, and Schaefer Landau, Russ Schaefer Landau. They have like three recent books or so where they go through. The first one is on philosophical methodology, data, and theory comparison. And then they go on to apply this to a kind of non naturalistic, robust moral realism. And they argue that for theory comparison reasons, for accounting for the a huge range of data, the best view on offer is this kind of non naturalistic moral realist view. So that's another style of argument. You basically lay out all the data pertaining to morality and you compare, compare the theories, right? Compare the theories. And so the argument goes. The one that best manages the one that best manages the relevant trade-offs among the various theoretical virtues and vices, again, so the argument goes, is going to be a kind of moral realism. A still further argument for moral realism, and I've actually got a paper under review on this. It's super interesting. I'm not like entirely sold on it, but I basically just explore it and say that this is really worthy of further research. It's a, a kind of modal ontological argument for moral realism. Basically, it just has two premises. It, it somewhat mirrors the modal ontological argument for theism. And then of course you get into the symmetry breaker dialectic and I explore that dialectic in my paper. I look at different symmetry breakers. The argument is something like premise one, possibly there are stance independent moral truths. Premise two says, well, hey, stance independent moral truths would be necessarily true if true at all, if true in any world, right? It's not as though it could like, it's somehow there's some possible world in which it could be true that, you know, torturing a child just for fun would be uh, morally obligatory. Like, what? no, um, that's just not what morality is like. So these sorts of moral truths, stands in a minute, moral truths would be necessarily true if true at all. And together with the at least the possibility of there being some stance independent moral truths via the characteristic axiom of system S5 of modal logic, you can conclude that it is necessary that there are stance independent moral truths. And of course, from its necessity follows its actuality per axiom M of modal logic. So again, there's a reverse style argument, right? Possibly there are no stance-independent moral truths. And together with that second premise, that entails that it's impossible that there are stance-independent moral truths. And so then in my article, I go through a bunch of different potential symmetry breakers and I evaluate them. I say that some are hopeless, others are actually super duper interesting and deserve further research. So, so anyway, that's just a brief lay of the land of some arguments for moral realism. Um, Muhammad Shahed Khan Shawan asks, uh, congratulations, dude. Question on the contingency argument. Why do you think that it, there is a gnat around me? I'm sorry. I'm frustrated because there's a gnat just flying around here. <sighs> Question on the contingency argument. Why do you think that it's weak to go from a necessary being to God? Well, mainly because the extant stage two arguments are by my lights quite unconvincing. And because there are boatloads of respectable naturalistic and indeed non-naturalistic, but non-theistic accounts of a necessarily existent concrete foundation of reality. You can see, for instance, my video, 20 Cosmological Arguments and Analysis. Matthew Lavagna asks, do you pray to God regularly as a hopeful agnostic? So I'm not entirely sure what counts as regularly, but I do make conditional prayers of the form, something like, God, if you exist, such and such. For instance, God, if you exist, please help me to cultivate intellectual and moral virtue, or God, if you exist, 
please guide me to truths, things like that. I think this is eminently rational. Indeed, failing to do so as an agnostic might actually be irrational. There are various there are various different ways that you can argue for that, but here's one. It's just a kind of a, a, an argument from analogy, right? So imagine that you're lost in the wilderness and you have good reasons for thinking that's roughly just as likely as not that there's a helicopter crew flying above the wilderness looking to save people like you who are lost. And suppose further that you have a flare gun that you can shoot into the sky that you know would alert the helicopter crew to your existence and make it more likely that you'll get help. Finally, suppose you can do so at basically no cost to yourself or to others. Obviously then, you should shoot the flare gun into the sky, right? And this scenario is entirely analogous to agnostic prayer. I'll let you guys fill in the details of how the analogy goes since I think it's pretty obvious. Wayne Rossi asks, when I took metaphysics in college, we spent a lot of time on free will and the problem of universals. Could you outline your thoughts on those questions and what philosophers you are closest to? Good question. So on free will, first, we need to know what we're talking about when we say free will. As philosophers in the free will debate use it, free will, free will just basically means the control condition needed for moral responsibility. In simpler terms, that basically just means that free will is the control that we exert in actions that at least partially undergirds or underwrites our responsibility for those actions. So it's the control in action needed for moral responsibility needed for our being accountable, needed for our being blamed and praised simply because we performed the relevant action or made the relevant decision. Do we have free will? Well, yes, I tend to think that we have free will of that kind. Honestly, I kind of just take this to be a datum of experience, but, but you know, as with everything in philosophy, that's controversial. What's the nature of this free will? Is it compatibilist or is it libertarian? I'm actually kind of agnostic on whether it's a compatibilist or libertarian style freedom. I mean, regarding compatibilism, I do have worries about the manipulation argument or manipulation arguments. It's really a family of arguments, as well as arguments about us being the appropriate sources of our actions under determinism, under a deterministic view of reality where all of our actions and decisions are the inevitable consequences of prior causal conditions and factors and so on. I mean, if that's the case, you start to wonder, well, am I really the appropriate source of my actions? Everything that I do is in some sense traceable to things beyond me over which I have no control. So how then am I the appropriate source of my actions so as to undergird uh, my having the relevant control needed for me to be responsible? So anyway, I do have worries about compatibilism. And then regarding libertarianism, I worry about luck objections. So under libertarianism, you could fix literally all the facts up to the moment of choice, including all the reasons and deliberation states that I had and all, all my reasons, desires, everything about me, everything about me as an agent. And yet somehow I could just like choose A or B and there's no difference across those worlds in which I chose A or B. There's literally no difference between them that can explain why I chose one rather than the other. Of course, you might have different reasons in both worlds, such that in one world, reason A goes into explaining why you chose what you did. And then in the other world, reason B goes into explaining why you chose what you did, even though in both worlds, reasons A and B were present and influenced you the exact same way. But still, there's literally no difference between these worlds that can account for why that reason was the one that was effective. Why that reason was the one that you took to be the reason in performing your action. So anyway, I do worry about luck. I mean, it almost seems to be just like a matter of luck that you happen to find yourself in a world in which you chose A rather than B, given that literally everything up to the moment of choice was exactly the same. And you can't pinpoint something that obtains in one world that doesn't obtain in another world that could account for why there is this difference between these worlds with respect to what you chose. So I worry about luck objections, and I also worry about potential conflicts with science. Arguably, libertarian views need there to be a kind of genuine indeterminism in the causal stream pertaining to our neural states and how they relate to our decisions and so on. Even if we are immaterial souls, right, we still make decisions and carry out actions by working through and with a body, right? So if you're kind of locked, if you're trapped in a deterministic automaton, you're not going to be able to exert your libertarian freedom with respect to that body. So even if we're an immaterial soul, you still need there to be indeterministic causation in the physical world, and not only present at, let's say, the quantum level, and by the way, that's a highly contentious interpretation of quantum mechanics, but you also need that indeterminism to kind of percolate or bubble up to the level of neural networks and so on, so as to allow for indeterminism in deciding and acting. And it's just not at all clear that this is scientifically tenable. So anyway, I have worries for each of these views. And, you know, there are various sub views within these. It's a very complicated field, but I'm agnostic. Now, which scholar am I closest to? Uh, well, probably philosopher Al Mealy. He is also, uh, he calls it agnostic autonomism. He, that's what he calls thinking that there's free will of the sort that I defined earlier, but also being agnostic between whether it's a compatibilist style free will or libertarian style free will. And then what about universals? I tentatively lean towards realism about universals. 
As for which theory I find most plausible about universals, I guess I lean towards thinking Platonism is the most plausible view here. Both of these commitments of mine, I guess we should even say leanings of mine, both of them are quite tentative leanings. I'm open, I'm very open to nominalism, especially fictionalist nominalism. Kenny Boyce, I had him on my channel, but he's been a really robust defender of it. And his defenses like need to be reckoned with. If you think that there are universals and you think you have a good argument for that, you really need to check out what Kenny Boyce says in response because he will challenge you. But anyway, again, I tentatively lean towards realism. If you want further stuff on this, you can check out my playlist, God and Abstract Objects. Who do I resemble most here? Um, well, actually, probably Josh Rasmussen, at least for a long while. Joshua Pym says, congrats on the milestone. Well, thank you. Question one, my question would be about mathematical logic slash maths in general. To what extent have you studied it slash find it necessary for engaging arguments on God's existence? Apologists often invoke math. So have you ever studied it independently or just learned the concepts from it as you need them, like Cantor's Theorem, Hilbert's Hotel, etc.? Question two, taste in music slash favorite artists. Well, to what extent have I studied math and mathematical logic and so on? I guess I'll just say to a reasonable extent. I've taken advanced calculus classes. I've taken a class on mathematical logic and metalogic. In that mathematical logic or metalogic class, we used Jeffrey Hunter's book, Metalogic here. I guess I can just show you the table of contents. So basically part one has an introduction on what's a formal language, model theory, proof theory, meta theory, um, lots of stuff, including stuff about sets and one-to-one -one correspondence and cardinality and so on. And then part two was truth functional propositional logic, talked about what functions are, et cetera. And then we got into, and then we got into one of Hunter's systems we talked about syntactic and semantic consequence, the interpolation theorem, proof of the consistency of PS, talked about the deduction theory, talked about mathematical inductions, model theoretic meta theorems of PS, which is the like the propositional system that he uses, talked about semantic completeness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, talked about semantic and syntactic completeness, all these sorts of fun stuff that can get you all the ladies. In various of my classes, as well as on my own, I've also studied you know the basics of set theory and infinity and probability. But I also don't pretend to be an expert in all of them, of course. Now, how important are these for engaging in arguments about God's existence? That is a good question. I'd say it depends. So I'd say knowing the basics of probability theory, credences, Bayes theorem, updating, power probability, intrinsic probability, and so on. I'd say, yeah, knowing a lot of those, the basics of them is pretty important for evaluating at least many arguments for and against God's existence. Also knowing about infinity and set theory, that's pretty important for evaluating the old Kalam. Um, knowing the basics of propositional logic, predicate logic, quantifiers, as well as the basics of modal logic, that's also gonna be pretty important if you want to seriously engage at least many arguments for and against God's existence. Uh, but I mean, for a lot of arguments for and against God's existence, you also don't need to know any of this sort of stuff. It all just depends. It depends on the argument. Thankfully, I've got books to recommend on how you can get a solid footing in these sorts of things. So check out my full bookshelf tour video, as well as my video with Parker Sedicase over at his channel. It was something like the books that helped us learn philosophy or something. It's in my doing philosophy playlist. So just check that out. What about my taste in music? Well, it's somewhat eclectic. And I also recognize that it's largely basic, okay? I mean, honestly, my music taste is basically the general genre of FIFA songs. And by that, I mean the songs that are included in FIFA games. I know, I know, it's basic, right? I recognize that, but hey, I enjoy them. And I listen to what I enjoy. In terms of artists or bands or whatever they're called, I mean, I like some songs from each of the following. Again, this isn't exhaustive, this isn't representative, but this is just some that I picked. Jungle, Half Alive, Portugal the Man, Saint Motel, Bastille, Tudor Cinema, Glass Animals, etc. Again, I recognize that this is probably immensely basic. I just listen to what I like. And what I like largely corresponds to the music featured in FIFA or music similar to what's featured in FIFA. Although, although I do have a scintilla of culture in me because there is some classical music that I quite enjoy, especially Vivaldi. Jack Peterson says, congrats on 10K. Looking forward to seeing this channel grow even further. Here's my question. Context, as a result of some unexpected events last year, I may end up being the president of my university's philosophy club. Problem is I'm a physics student and I'm concerned I'm a little philosophically under-equipped to lead a club on it. Interesting. Okay, question. What books, lecture series, or media would you recommend to someone look at to get a solid grasp on philosophy in a span of two to three months? Okay, well, I have five books for you. That's all, five books. I think you can do that in two to three months. The first one is Knowledge, Reality. I actually have this right next to me. Knowledge, Reality, and Value by Michael Humer. It is an excellent introduction to philosophy. So you need to get this and you need to read it. So that's that's number one. 
Number two is books called Philosophy One and Philosophy Two. Philosophy One, A Guide Through the Subject, and Philosophy Two, Further Through the Subject. They're both edited by AC Grayling. They're both excellent. They give you a lay of the land of most prominent fields in philosophy. Check out both of them. The, the fourth one is the Philosopher's Toolkit, which I also have right next to me, a compendium of philosophical concepts and methods by Peter Fosel and Julian Bagini. Definitely get this one. So that's four. And then this fifth one is optional if you don't have the time in two to three months. But you still should get it. It's The Majesty of Reason. Shameless plug, right? So yeah, The Majesty of Reason by... It's a me, a Mario. By uh, yours truly, Joe Schmidt, right? As for media, I mean, there are some good intro philosophy courses on YouTube. You can search them up. Um, I mean, other than recommending my channel, <laughs> try to make sure that it's with like a professor at a university. That'll be the best. I know that they're out there. Fabian Ryden says, what are your thoughts on the future of philosophy of religion? What epistemic positions regarding the nature of reality do you think will grow or decrease in popularity, if any at all? Well, I certainly think that's a bright future. There are lots of new avenues for research. For example, the axiology of theism, um, bringing to bear the methods and tools of other disciplines like cognitive science of religion and so on. There are also lots of new and innovative arguments that have been made within the last five to 10 years, and it will continue to be made within the upcoming years, and so on. As for what positions will grow or decrease in popularity, I honestly don't quite know. And, you know, making these sorts of predictions is kind of risky, but I'll nevertheless make two such predictions. My first prediction is that Molinism will significantly fall out of favor, and there will be a corresponding grow in non-Molinist positions like theological determinism, open theism, and simple foreknowledge. There just have been a lot of quite forceful criticisms of Molinism as of late from Nevin Kleimenhagen and Daniel Rubio. They have a they have a paper forthcoming in the journal Mind called Molinism Explaining Our Freedom Away. Philip Swenson has done excellent work in criticizing Molinism as of late. And plus, there are like long standing problems pertaining to grounding and explanation and so on. So, one of my predictions is that Molinism might significantly fall out of favor. I don't know if these are going to come out true. It's just kind of predictions. I'm uh, just doing it for fun. Another prediction, this one's interesting. I think kind of middle views between the extremes of theism and naturalism will grow in popularity, or at the very least, will receive significantly more attention. So Philip Goff, for instance, is developing a view on which there is like a quasi-theistic being at the foundation of reality, but it's not like an absolutely perfect being. I think he says that it might not be all powerful. It's all knowledgeable, I think, and it's all good, but it's not all powerful. So like various different middling views. Paul Draper has been toying with these sorts of things like panpsychotheism. Josh Rasmussen has been toying with the highly non-traditional models of God, including almost like a cosmopsychotheism but also with a kind of theistic idealist panentheism. So lots of these kind of highly non-traditional quasi-theistic views that are somewhat in between naturalism and theism, I think those are going to be receiving a lot more attention. Snowfall says, which book do you consider the best atheistic book, arguing about gods or logic and theism or something else? That's a good question. I mean, I honestly, logic and theism is my favorite. You can see the end of my Why Am I an Agnostic video for more book recommendations on the atheist side. But also, stay tuned because Paul Draper has a forthcoming book entitled Atheism and the Problem of Evil. He basically argues that the problem of evil gives us very, very, very good reason to think that the god of perfect being theism doesn't exist. Snowfall also asks, do you think uh, the zombie argument and inverse qualia arguments beg the question? Well, I don't think that all versions of these arguments beg the question. I mean, some versions do, but those are the comparatively worse versions of the arguments. So for instance, the following zombie argument by my lights rather overtly begs the question. Premise one, P zombies or philosophical zombies are metaphysically possible. Premise two, if P zombies are metaphysically possible, then physicalism is false. Conclusion, conclusion so physicalism is false. Now, the clear problem with this is that only those who antecedently reject physicalism are in a position to accept that first premise, right? I mean, if physicalism is true such that mental states just are physical states. And of course, P zombies are not possible. That is beings that completely share, that duplicate our physical states and yet don't have our mental states. That makes no sense under physicalism. So only those who antecedently reject physicalism are even in a position to accept that first premise. And so in essence, to assert that first premise is basically just to assert the denial of physicalism. But the best versions of these arguments do not suffer from these sorts of problems. For instance, they try to offer principled independent reasons for thinking that, say, P zombies are metaphysically possible. So for instance, they might say that conceivability is a defeasible guide to possibility and that P zombies are conceivable. Now, even if those claims are false, and indeed they are questionable, neither of them simply assume the falsity of physicalism. Joseph Need or Joseph Need asks, uh, congrats, you deserve it. I have two questions. You can pick whichever is more interesting. Well, I'll address them both because I'm feeling munificent. That's a GRE word. 
Question one. I noticed that often when discussing philosophical, theological, moral topics, such as the problem of evil, libertarian free will seems assumed. However, libertarian free will seems to assert that a person can make choices that are simultaneously A, not determined, where determined means the necessary result of prior conditions or causes, and they're also B, not random, where random means not the necessary result of prior conditions or causes. A and B seem like a true dichotomy, with no room for libertarian free will in between. If one's choice isn't ultimately the result of prior influencing factors, then the choice is spontaneous and random. So my question is, can you conceive of some way libertarian free will is logically possible? Well, Joseph, you're being sneaky on us here, aren't you? Not intentionally, but still. So basically, we need to be very, very careful when we use very loaded words like random. Proponents of libertarian freedom will object quite vehemently to your usage of random here. Because by random, as you said, you just mean not the deterministic consequence of prior factors. But this rules out libertarianism from the get-go, definitionally, since libertarians hold that our free choices aren't the deterministic consequences of prior factors, and yet they're nevertheless under our control, right? They aren't random. So I think the libertarian would rightly accuse you of begging the very question at issue, assuming from the get-go that there couldn't be something like libertarian freedom. That is, something that isn't random and yet isn't the deterministic or necessary or inevitable consequence of prior conditions. More generally, here's a diagnosis of where the libertarian will think you've gone wrong. Specifically, your dilemma is either a false dilemma or else it's a true dilemma, but it poses no problems to libertarian freedom. In particular, your dilemma can be understood in two different ways. The first way is a dilemma between A, not determined, and B, not random. Now, in this case, A and B are, for the libertarian, not exhaustive, and so it's a false dichotomy. In particular, it's leaving out another option, C, not determined, but nevertheless under agential control, and so not random. On the other hand, your dilemma could be understood as one between A, not the necessary result of prior conditions or causes, and B, the necessary result of prior conditions or causes. Now, in this case, A and B are indeed exhaustive and exclusive, and so it is a true dilemma. But this poses no challenge for the libertarian, since they're just going to say that our choices fall under A, right? They're not the necessary result of prior conditions or causes. So ultimately, I don't think the libertarian should be worried about the argument you've presented. Of course, there is the lingering worry about how exactly a decision or action could be both one, not the necessary consequence of prior conditions, and yet two, not random, that is, under a gentle control. And this is indeed a challenge, but it's one that libertarians have spilt boatloads of ink on, right? One thing they like to appeal to at this juncture is that choices, even while not deterministically explained by prior conditions, are nevertheless not random since they are explained by the agent's reasons and desires. These reasons and desires make the choice or action intelligible. They provide some explanation for the choice or action without rendering that choice or action inevitable. In which case, argue libertarians, we avoid both determinism and randomness. Anyway, if you're curious, you can check out my video on the luck objection to libertarianism for more. Okay, question two. When people are presented with good and bad options and free wills capable of choosing either, assuming they're truly free and fully responsible for their choice, what's the difference between the person who chooses good and the person who chooses bad? If the difference has to do with their experiences or physiology or psychology or intelligence or whatever, then it seems that those external factors determined the result, thereby undermining free will. But if those are excluded, the only difference that could explain their choices would be that one person was just inherently good while the other was inherently bad. This, again, undermines free will. Do you see this question as a legitimate challenge to Christianity and moral systems that rely on libertarian free will? Well, one thing we should note at the outset is that by itself, Christianity is, doesn't rely on libertarian free will. There are uh, Calvinist Christians, for instance. There are Christians who adopt theological determinism, and so they would adopt compatibilism. So that's one thing to know. But getting to the heart of your worry, you're asking, like, what's the difference between these, these agents, right? One that chooses good and one that chooses bad. Well, one difference will be in terms of their different choices or their different decisions or their different exertions of agent causal power, right? They exercise their control in different ways. And this undergirds, so the libertarian would say, this undergirds differential assignments of moral responsibility. Furthermore, perhaps another difference will be in terms of their experiences, their psychology, and so on. But, right, but this doesn't mean that the experiences and psychology and so on determined the result. They can instead simply differentially influence the result without deterministically causing it to happen.
This is where indeterministic causation is crucial for the libertarian. Mohammed asks, would you consider going on the Thought Adventure podcast? Absolutely. Zaini's Nerf Gun asks, do philosophy courses always include theology? If I want to do philosophy and mathematics at uni, will I have to do theology? So definitely not. Um, philosophy courses do not always include theology. Really, only philosophy of religion will have anything to do with theology. And maybe if you're talking about free will and metaphysics, you might talk about aspects of theology somewhat. But for most areas of philosophy, you're not going to be talking about theological topics. And as for philosophy and mathematics at your university, that'll probably depend on the curriculum, right? So you'll probably have a unit or two, or maybe a class or two dedicated to the philosophy of religion, in which case you will talk about theological concepts. But yeah, but otherwise, no. All right, y'all. So one of my family members is currently using the space that I use to record. They're basically using it for a work project. So that's why the audio has changed. And that's why the format has changed. Anyway, Let's just move on. I'm going to be back down there at some point, my little place where I record once they're done with their project or whatever. So Nicholas Hessler asks, are there any non-classical logics that you find interesting? Well, yes, I find FDE or first degree entailment pretty interesting. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm still a classical guy, but J.C. Beale has at least opened me up to the epistemic possibility that a subclassical logic might be true. Depicolator, I love that name. Depicolator asks, why isn't deism or non-religious theism more popular? Well, honestly, I don't quite know. I mean, my guess is really the kind of fundamental religious impulse that we humans have. You know, it's not without its proponents, a kind of non-religious theism, for instance. Yuji Nagasawa, for instance, is a non-religious theist. And I think non-religious theism is a super interesting and philosophically respectable position. But again, my hypothesis here is that it's similar to atheism in terms of its social consequences, right? These kinds of deistic or non-religious theistic views, right? You don't really have a church community per se. You don't really have rituals or anything like that. Second question, can the youth of road dilemma be applied to other arguments than the moral argument, such as arguments for meaning or beauty, and how so? Well, yes, absolutely. I actually talk about this in my 100 plus argument video, so I'm not going to go through it here for time constraints. The third question that Deep later asks is, how does one navigate arguments for and against theism when changing minds and even worldviews can be so emotionally and socially stressful? Well, that is a difficult and amazing question. I mean, one thing that I highly recommend watching in this regard is my video with Josh Rasmussen entitled, How to Discuss the Fundamental Nature of Reality. We touch on topics that are at least intimately related to your question. Really, I guess the best thing to do here is to try to cultivate the moral and intellectual virtues, things like intellectual curiosity, open-mindedness, a love of truth, right? Trying to make truth and love center stage, intellectual perseverance, being understanding and being willing to listen to your dialectical partners, not trying to go into a discussion solely with the task of convincing them, but perhaps with the task of trying to learn and trying to collectively get truth and to recognize that we're on the same team here. I go through a lot of this sort of stuff in my book as well, The Majesty of Reason, A Short Guide to Critical Thinking and Philosophy. I go through lots of these dispositional and conversational aspects of worldview discussions and so on. So I also recommend checking out my book there. Which shoe brand or style best fits your personality? <laughs> Which one would you be? So I basically just said soccer cleats. Those uh, fit my personality. I exercise quite a lot. I'm very athletic. I play soccer a lot. I run a lot. I bike a lot. I cycle a lot. So what kind of soccer cleats? Well, the ones that I have in the videos, the bonus soccer that I have at the end, they're Nike Mercurials. They're quick, they're slim, they're flashy, they're cunning, they're agile, and they're deft. So that's kind of the reason. Josh Goldstein or Josh, Josh Goldstein or Goldstein asks, what are your thoughts on philosophy of veganism? So it's certainly a respectable ethical view. Uh, I'm not a vegan, at least not yet, largely because I haven't been convinced by their arguments. And I also briefly discuss veganism in my 3K AMA video. So I recommend checking out that video for what I say therein with respect to veganism. Emilio Estrada says, congrats, Joe, you're awesome. I say, thank you very much. What do you think is the best argument for Platonism? Well, probably the indispensability argument, basically math and by extension, mathematical structures and patterns and functions and numbers and the like are integral to the success of science. And this, so the argument goes, gives us good reason to think that such mathematical objects exist. Basically, if they didn't exist, it would be a miracle that our scientific theories making use of them and quantifying over them were so profoundly successful. Adrian G. Fuentes says, what do you, what do you find most interesting or plausible in Aristotelian theories and in Platonism? Well, something that's admirable or plausible in Aristotelian theories is that they might offer straightforward solutions to the epistemic problem, right? The problem of how we come to have knowledge of things that we would typically take to be abstract objects. 
right? If Aristotelianism is true, then various of these abstract objects kind of inhere in the concrete world. So it might provide a more plausible epistemic story as to how we come to know that there are such things than Platonism. I say might there, because of course that's monumentally controversial. Now, something that's admirable or plausible in Platonic theories is that they preserve the necessity and infinitude of abstracta, right? One plus one seems to necessarily be two. And the number one, it doesn't seem as though you could like cause that to be destroyed or somehow the number one could exist in some worlds and not in others or exist on Tuesdays, but not on Wednesdays, right? So numbers seem necessary as do lots of other things like propositions. But plausibly, Aristotelian views on which abstracta depend for their existence on concreta, well, in that case, you start to lose the necessity of abstracta, right? Lots of concreta, the, the alleged things that abstracta would depend upon, lots of concreta, which instantiate the mathematical structures and functions and so on, are utterly contingent. And there's also the problem of the infinitude of abstracta. Plausibly, abstracta are infinite number, right? There are infinitely many numbers, for instance. And so it's not at all clear that you could have abstracta depending on concreta in the relevant way under Aristotelianism, so as to account for there being infinitely many abstracta, because you only have finite, finitely many concreta to appeal to in order to explain the abstracta. Again, much more can be said here, but you know, that suffices. Uh, Daniel Stenning says, congrats, I say thanks. Knees Nerf Gun says, again, have you watched Death Note? So unfortunately, I don't know what that is. Lo siento. Impulse says, what do you think are some responses to the transcendental argument for God? Ar what do you think are some responses to the transcendental argument for God? Well, basically, I put some YouTube videos and recommendations here because I'm not in the mood to go over this argument to spell out what it is and my various criticisms and so on. So this first one is from Non-Alchemist. I'm basically just going to play the video here. This is on one point. 1.5 times. Have you ever had a strong desire to bang your head against a wall? Do you love talking to people who love to try and dominate others in conversation? Well, have I got some news for you. These desires can be met, and more. All you have to do is try to engage a presuppositionalist on the internet. To be fair, not all precepts are as obnoxious as some of the knuckle-dragging examples online might lead you to believe. It's possible to find a few cordial ones, and those who actually participate in academia are often much more nuanced and generally seem to be likable people. James and Anderson of RTS is one example. But this, unfortunately, is not true of many others. Philosopher Alex Malpass explains, the best representatives of the presuppositional apologetic are trying to elicit a Copernican shift in the way that the worldview is argued for. The worst representatives are not trying to do this. What they are up to is trying to confuse the non-Christian instead of addressing the actual arguments against Christianity. Any confusion on the part of the interlocutor is then pounced on as evidence that the argument has been won by the Christian. There is conceit behind such tactics. Consider this example by well-known presuppositionalist blockhead, Cy Ten Brugenkate. Before we go any further, let's be clear about definitions. When we use terms like reason or reasoning, what are we talking about? In philosophy, reason refers to a faculty or ability in virtue of which one makes appropriate doxastic judgments that have a high likelihood of approximating the truth. It's important to keep this definition in mind as we return to the topic at hand. There are only two options for someone when asked a size question. Either fall into the trap by trying to use their reason to demonstrate that their use of reason is valid, circular, or admit that they can't do it. Once this happens, the precept generally begins to act like they have a way out of this problem. And they will start describing the attributes of their God and how rational he is, how logic is part of his divine nature, and he created a rational world and that we're made in this, his image with a, in a capacity for logic and we're designed with reliable cognitive capacities. But here's the rub. When they give you this just-so story, notice that. They invoke their god as the guarantor of the reliability of their cognitive capacities and inferential procedures or magically zapped knowledge. When they do that, just point out politely and without rudely interrupting. But they have, in the very act of explaining all of this to you, used and relied upon their own cognitive capacities and inferential procedures in the very act of demonstrating their conclusion. And thus they've argued in a circle. The moment they set out using any reasoning, rely upon their memory, present premises, posit or presuppose anything. They're engaged in reasoning. They will be, in that moment, assuming the very reliability you're supposed to demonstrate in their conclusion, and so will fail to satisfy their own challenge, which they put before you. Don't fall for the naive intuition that we all have, that there must exist some way of defending reason that doesn't itself assume the reliability of reason. There is no such argument that isn't itself circular. The presuppositionalists can't do it either. No one can do it. We're all in the same epistemological world. Put another way. They've fallen into the very trap they've laid for others, using their reason to give you reasons that their use of reason is valid. How, you might be wondering, could some people make such a crucial oversight? Well, it turns out that when people are more interested in using rhetorical tricks to beat others into submission, they tend to make bumbling errors. Who knew? Oh, and by the way, here's an entire playlist of me responding. So I thought that that was a rhetorically effective and rhetorically quippy way to respond to at least some of the moves that lots of presuppositionalists make when they're leveraging something like the transcendental argument for God's existence. The next video in here is a panel discussion between Dr. Daniel Linford. Well, he wasn't doctor at the time when he was having this discussion, but uh, now he is. So uh, Daniel Linford, Alex Malpass, uh, the Ozymandias Ramses, the second or whatever. 
who you just heard as a little clip in the video that I just played, they have a dis panel discussion on the transcendental argument for God and presuppositionalism and so on. And I thought that it was an illuminating panel discussion. So check that out if you're interested in substantive criticisms of the argument and of presuppositionalism. And finally, check out Alex Malpass's blog, useofreason.wordpress.com. He has a blog post called The Problem with Tags. So check that out as well. Andrew Cooper says, how about some drama? Most overrated a philosopher, in your humble opinion. Well, I mean, are you asking about contemporary or historical philosophers? I guess I'll choose historical because I can. Now, I'm tempted, right? I'm tempted to say Aquinas. Don't get me wrong, I rate Aquinas immensely highly, and his intellect is far greater than mine will ever be. But some people, especially some Catholics and especially some Thomists, seem to treat Aquinas as if he were basically God incarnate, he who shall not be questioned. An attack on Aquinas or his arguments is taken basically to be an attack on everything good and true and holy and divine. Aquinas deserves to be rated highly, don't get me wrong, but somehow people manage to still overrate him and elevate him practically to the level of the left hand of God, with Jesus, of course, at the right hand of God. I mean, I guess in my view, Hegel is kind of overrated, especially by some leftists, but anyway, let's move on. Me asks, Hey, Joe, what is your opinion on religious arguments to God from prophecy? It's been quite difficult for me to find a good attempt at moving from a prediction coming true to God being the cause. Well, honestly, I haven't studied these much, so I'm afraid I won't be able to offer many developed thoughts. I mean, some things that we need to be wary about here are, firstly, many incompatible traditions claim successful prophecies supporting their traditions, and so we have a potential undercutting defeater here arising from disagreement across traditions and so on. Secondly, sometimes things and events are intentionally or perhaps even unintentionally constructed or molded or shaped in order that they fit pre-given known predictions made in the past or known predictions that have been written down and are kind of collectively understood to be part of a collective scripture base. Thirdly, we need to be wary that lots of supposed correct predictions are often quite vague and indeterminate. They're open to interpretation and a lot of post hoc fitting, kind of post hoc rationalize how it fits into a, a vague kind of prediction. And then fourth and finally, we need to keep in mind base rates, like how many failed predictions there were, right? I mean, if you're making lots and lots of predictions, of course, you're going to get some of those right. And so we can't simply focus on the ones that you got right. We have to look at the base rate, right? How many, how many misses were there? Can't just focus on the hits. You also have to look at how many cases you also have to look at how many cases of reinterpreted predictions there were. This very often happens in lots of different religions. A prediction of some event is made. And when the event doesn't come to pass, right, you basically go and reinterpret the prediction. Oh, you know, looking at the textual features, uh, it's we can see that it, it wasn't actually a prediction to begin with, right? It's supposed to be uh, maybe metaphorical or allegorical. Maybe it's talking about what's happening in the afterlife or you kind of reinterpret the predictions. You just need to be wary of all this kind of wishy-washy flexibility that often accompanies these sorts of appeals to successful predictions. Mateo Mendez asks, you said that you're a moral realist. Why? Do you find any anti-realist position convincing? And what are your normative ethics? Why am I a moral realist? Well, there are several reasons. I went over a series of arguments for moral realism earlier on in this video, so check that out. I don't subscribe to all of them, but I do find at least somewhat plausible that um, normative companions and guilt argument where you know you look at certain facts that seem to be external normative reasons giving with respect to epistemology and then you say that any purportedly objectionable features of stance independent moral truths would also be had by these stance independent external normative reasons giving epistemic truths and since there are such <laughs> epistemic truths it follows that the objections against the stance independent moral properties are unsuccessful and also if we have good reason to think that there are such stance independent, external normative reasons giving epistemic truths, well then given their kind of parity or symmetry with the stance independent moral truths, external normative reasons giving moral truths, then we have reason to think that those exist as well. Again, this is not meant to convince someone else who doesn't already accept stance independent epistemic normativity. I fully recognize that some people, for instance, don't share the relevant intuition that there are stance independent epistemic facts, that is facts about what you should believe, or facts about you should be aiming to truth rather than aiming towards falsity in your belief forming practices and so on. I perfectly well recognize that if someone already antecedently rejects the existence of these sorts of stance independent external normative reasons giving epistemic facts, then this argument is dialectically toothless for them. This argument doesn't give them any reason to think that moral realism is true. But what this argument does illustrate or does show is that for those who do find such stance independent epistemic facts plausible, they have a reason to correspondingly accept moral realism.
And since I am among that camp, this gives me a weight of a reason to think that moral realism is true. You can also appeal to certain stance independent moral claims being intuitively obvious, at least to me, whenever we're talking about what seems intuitively obvious or what seems true, it's always what seems true to me or seems true to the subject who's making the claim. So for me, I would take a kind of phenomenal conservative based approach to this. And I would say that given that it very strongly seems to me that, for instance, it is objectively wrong to torture a child just for fun, I have correspondingly strong reason to think that that is true. And Again, it's defeasible. So in order for that justification to be defeated, I would need some sufficiently strong countervailing considerations, maybe some undercutting or rebutting defeater in order to overturn or refute that intuition or the deliverance of that intuition. That's not to say that there couldn't be such defeaters, but at least by my lights, I haven't come across a successful such defeater. There are also some really interesting modal arguments for moral realism. Again, I talked about this earlier on in the video, but I've got a paper under review on this, so I won't really talk about this further. And then finally, theory comparison reasons uh, that Banks and Cuneo and Schaefer Landau have published on. They've got a nice paper. For instance, Trusting Moral Intuitions. I think that was published in Noose. Maybe it was 2020, something like that, 2021 or something. Anyway, they have a series of papers and a series of books now where they argue that a kind of robust non-natural moral realism best manages the trade-off among the various theoretical virtues and vices with respect to the data of the moral domain. This is not to say that I agree with absolutely everything in Cuneo, Banks, and, and Schaefer Landau, but I do find at least somewhat probative their kind of theory comparison approaches that they've published on. As for anti-realist positions, yes, I think that there are respectable anti-realist views. If I were to be an anti-realist, I'd probably most closely fall in line with Don Loeb. I haven't studied normative ethics all that much. I've found utilitarianism to succumb to so many difficulties and alleged counterexamples, at least by my lights. And I've also found a combination or mixture of virtue ethics and deontology to be, I guess, potentially the most plausible. But again, I haven't studied normative ethics in much detail, so I'd like to emphasize my epistemic limitations here. The unnoticeable. Okay. I guess I have three questions. Uh, what are your thoughts on non-realist form of Christianity? So it's definitely interesting. I mean, I presume you're talking about like religious fictionalism, especially in connection with Christianity. I mean, on the one hand, I see the value of acting in accordance with what your evidence base dictates. And so if your evidence base tells against Christianity, there is a potentially disvaluable kind of disharmony if you were to then engage in Christian practices. But then again, right, on the other hand, presumably you can construe or interpret those practices in a way that's entirely in accord with your evidence base. For example, you might construe or interpret prayer or worship as expressly social exercises or perhaps as conditional exercises, like conditional on God's existence. In any case, I do see value in community, ritual, and social elements of religions like Christianity, especially if one finds that Christian practice contributes to one's flourishing, and especially if one has a hope that Christianity is true. So perhaps there is indeed room for fictionalist Christianity in that respect. Overall, though, I want to emphasize that I'd really need to sit down and research it further to have a kind of settled view here. Do you think your views and philosophy of mind impact your views on philosophy of religion? If so, how? Well, probably yes. And the reason is because many arguments in philosophy of religion rely on specific views in philosophy of mind, right? Arguments from consciousness, some of them require a non-physicalist view about consciousness. Moreover, if dualism is true, it arguably provides evidence for theism. It's more surprising on naturalism than on theism. You can see, for instance, Tomas Bogardus' presentation on the analytic Christian here for a nice explication and defense of this claim. What are your views on death, given your non-physicalist views, and do you find the idea of non-existence scary? Right. So while I lean towards some form of non-physicalism, I tend to think that mental states and properties are intimately dependent on brain states, and that this is very strong evidence for the thesis that without a functioning brain, we won't have functioning mental states or properties. And this, in turn, means that if the brain is destroyed, as it is at or shortly after death, our mental states and properties likewise cease to exist altogether. Furthermore, if we are organisms, then we cease to exist when our biological lives cease. So I guess that's sort of how I would view death. I mean, given my current commitments, I would say I find um, life after death implausible, given the kind of reasoning that I've laid out here. Do I find non-existence scary? Well, I mean, I guess a little bit, yeah. I mean, I'm kind of torn on it, to be honest. On the one hand, you know... <laughs> I see the poll of the people who say, well, it's just like sleep or like the 13.8 billion years that transpired, at least 13.8 billion years that transpired prior to my birth. But on the other hand, I'm going to miss out on so much, right? Most drastically, I'm missing out on profoundly valuable experiences like gaining more knowledge, growing more in virtue, forming and growing relationships and so on. So again, I guess I'm torn on the question. And in any case, I do find it sad.
Yajun Yuan says, what are your thoughts on SDAs believing God is inside time? So I think SDA means Seventh-day Adventist. But as for God's being in time, with my theist hat on, here's the deal. Whether we should think God is temporal, that is whether there is succession in God's life, depends on whether we think a tensed or tenseless theory of time is true. If a tensed theory of time is true, then we should think that God is temporal. Here's a quick argument. It's an argument from changing knowledge. I cover this in more detail in my forthcoming book, Premise 1, There is Change. That, I think, is manifest and evident to the senses. Premise 2, if there is change, well, then some proposition or sentence P goes from being true to being false or vice versa, right? If there's change, for example, water is going from a liquid state to a solid state, then the proposition or sentence, the water is liquid, goes from being true to being false. And the proposition or sentence, the water is solid, goes from being false to being true. Premise three, if some P goes from being true to being false, then God goes from knowing P to not knowing P, right? That just follows from God's existence, God's omniscience, and the factivity of knowledge. Knowledge is factive. In other words, one can only know that P is true if P is, in fact, true. One cannot know P when P is false. For example, 1 plus 1 equals 2 is true, and because 1 plus 1 equals 2 is true, someone cannot, someone cannot sensibly be said to know that 1 plus 1 is not 2. This entails that if P genuinely goes from being true to being false, then once P is false, one cannot know P. For if one still knew P, then since knowing P presupposes P's truth, P would have remained true. But, ex hypothesi, P changed in truth value, and hence did not remain true. Thus, if some P goes from being true to being false, then God goes from knowing P to not knowing P. And in particular, when P goes from being true to being false, in virtue of God's omniscience, God must go from knowing P to knowing the negation of P. Now on to the next premise. Premise four, if God goes from knowing P to not knowing P, then there is succession in God's life, and moreover, God has potential to acquire knowledge, right? This is surely just what succession means, right? To go from one thing to another. And it's also just what potential means, right? God has the potential here to acquire knowledge that God did not already possess. Premise five, if there is succession in God's life, and moreover, if God has potential to acquire knowledge, then God is temporal, right? This is part and parcel of divine temporality. Anything whose life involves succession enjoys a before and an after, and hence, it is temporal. So anyway, this is just my argument for um, God's being temporal. If, of course, a tensed view of time is true, right? This rests on a tensed view of change, as we explain in a footnote here. But by contrast, if a tenseless theory of time is true, then I think we are deprived of this sort of justification for thinking that God is in time. And moreover, we have motivation for thinking that God would be timeless. If God were t temporal under, under a tenseless theory of time, well, then God would have like different temporal parts at different times, which is really weird. Like God would just be broken up into this infinite series of distinct God stages. And, you know, each of them individually wouldn't be numerically identical to the rest, right? So you get difficulties with respect to God's own persistence, and you get difficulties with his own identity over time. It would seem to entail polytheism because there are these different numerically distinct things, each of which is properly said to be God. And you get the claim that there are multiple omnipotent things. Indeed, there are arguably infinitely many such things if time is continuous. And then, you know, quadrillions upon quadrillions upon quadrillions of omnipotent things if uh, time is discrete. So anyway, you get into a whole concoction of difficulties if a tenseless theory of time is true, and yet you want to say that God is in time. So if a tenseless theory of time is true, I'd say that we should think that God is timeless. But by contrast, if a tensed theory of time is true, on which there is objective temporal becoming, for instance, on presentism, or on growing block theory, or on moving spotlight theory, then we should indeed think that God is temporal. So anyway, those are my thoughts on uh, my thoughts on SDAs believing that God is inside time. So I, if we compare the theories... Joseph Patterson says, congratulations, have you read Philosophy in the Flesh, The Embodied Mind and Its Challenge to Western Thought by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson? If so, what are your thoughts? I apologize, but I have not read that. Malang Default says, congrats, dude. Well, thank you very much. I've been watching your stuff for more than two years now. Wow. Thank you. That is awesome. I want to ask, do you lean towards any normative theory of ethics like utilitarianism, virtue theory, or at least have any views on that subject? So again, thank you for your congratulations. I, I do appreciate that. Now I answered this in response to Mateo Mendez's question. So I kindly direct you to that. Nahoa Life, what a name. I love that first name, Nahoa. Oh, it's so wonderful. Anyway, congratulations on 10K, says Nahoa. Here's a question. What are some things theists, agnostics, and atheists tend to overlook respectively? Arguments, objections, distinctions, details, etc. What do each often fail to acknowledge? So I actually put together a whole document that I was going to go through potentially with someone else, but I think that this person is too busy. So I'm probably just going to do this by myself. But yeah, it's a whole document about what triggers me 
in popular discussions among theists, atheists, agnostics, and so on. So just various things, various sayings, various arguments, various objections that people need to stop saying, people need to stop doing that are just that are just so utterly confused or implausible. So I was basically going to make a video on this. It's like ignoring the distinction between logical and metaphysical impossibility, ignoring the distinction between epistemic and metaphysical impossibility, category errors involving valid, sound, true, et cetera, like a true argument or a valid premise. That's like nails on a chalkboard to me. You know, excessive confidence, general lack of humility. But, you know, we get into different things that people say with respect to all these different things, like terrible objections that people need to stop saying, different views that people hold, different objections that people raise that they need to stop raising and so on. So yeah. Okay. So we're, I'm going to go through this at some point. I'm going to make a video dedicated to it. I think I have like 75 of them here. So I'm not going to show you them to, so as not to spoil that video. So you're just going to have to wait until I make that video. Oh, and also asks Nahoa, how do you ground morality and meaning on a non-theistic worldview? So definitely check out my moral argument playlist because for instance, in one of my responses to Trent Horn, I explain how you can have a perfectly dandy non-theistic grounding of morality. Also in my video, Assessing 100 Plus Arguments for God's Existence, I talk therein about boatloads of different ways that you can ground morality on a non-theistic worldview. Um, but it really isn't that hard. It's the intrinsic character of suffering and vice and ignorance, for instance, that grounds their badness. And it's also the intrinsic character of pleasure and virtue, like what it is to be pleasure. You could just see that on inspection, I say. It's the intrinsic nature and character of pleasure itself, not some extrinsic relation to some deity or something that makes it wrong. No, it's what it is to be pleasure that makes pleasure good and what it is to be suffering that makes it bad. It's its intrinsic nature of character and, you know, the intrinsic character of pleasure and virtue and knowledge that grounds their goodness. Now, importantly, I've already addressed the meaning or purpose thing earlier in this video. It was one of the earliest questions that I addressed. So check that out. But also I address it in my video on the theist tier list. I was going to play that, but Honestly, this video is very long already. And of course, there are many more avenues besides for grounding morality, for instance, on a non-theistic worldview, especially when it comes to actions, right? Perhaps you can ground the various moral properties that actions instantiate under a non-theistic view in terms of rights violations, uh, or perhaps it's facts about utility, like suffering and pleasure or desire satisfaction and dissatisfaction. Or perhaps it's facts about the Aristotelian flourishing and languishing conditions set by the natures or essences of things, and so on ad nauseum. I mean, it honestly astounds me how out of touch with metaethics that popular apologetics is, <laughs> just because they overlook so many things in the metaethics literature that provide boatloads of different non-theistic ways to ground the instantiation of various moral properties and more generally to ground moral truths. In fact, I often find myself wondering, how do people ground morality on a theistic worldview? I mean, maybe in God's commands? Let's focus on God's commanding us not to rape. Now, when God commands this, either he has some reason to command this or he doesn't. If it's the former, right, if God does have some reason for commanding us not to rape, for instance, because rape violates the rights of the victim, or because rape treats someone as a mere means rather than as an end in themselves, or because of the suffering that the rape produces in the victim, or whatever, Right? If God indeed has some reason for commanding us not to rape, it's plausibly that reason, not God's commands, that ultimately explains the wrongness of rape. By contrast, if it's the latter, that is, if God doesn't have a reason for commanding us not to rape, then it's, then it's just pure arbitrariness, right? By definition, to be arbitrary is to not have a reason for something. There's literally no reason whatsoever for God to command us not to rape, as opposed to, for instance, commanding us to rape. And so in that case, morality would be intolerably arbitrary. And the exact same dilemma faces proposals not in terms of divine commands, but instead in terms of God's nature or God's character, right? We can equally ask of God's nature or his character. Is there some more fundamental underlying reason why God's nature is so as to forbid rape? Or is there some underlying reason why God's nature is so as to ground the badness of rape? Again, there's either some underlying reason or there is no underlying reason. If there is no underlying reason, then we just have a completely arbitrary moral standard here. If there is some reason, then it's possibly that more fundamental reason which explains the wrongness or the badness that explains the wrongness of rape. It's that more fundamental reason, not the fact that this truth is somehow built into God's nature or whatever. Also, I found that theists very often don't give us a story, don't give us an illuminating explanation or account as to how God's nature is so as to ground the morality of various things. Oftentimes they just label slap. They just slap on a label to, to morality and say, God grounds this, right? That's not an explanation. You need to give me some illuminating account as to what exactly it is about God, what exactly it is about God's nature that can account for the wrongness, the rightness, the goodness, the badness of various actions and states of affairs and so on. Typically, at least in my experience, theists just slap a label on these various things and say, grounded by God. In and of itself, that's not a very 
in and of itself, that's not a very illuminating explanation. Another question from Nahoa, will you have Dr. Josh Rasmussen on the channel to talk about ontological arguments? Maybe, but he's super busy as of late. I mean, he just had another child, I guess maybe his wife did, but you know, you, you can predicate that of him, right? It's pred predicate borrowing. In June, I actually scheduled something with him and Eric Wrighton, maybe it's Wrighton on universalism. And the earliest he could do was October. You can't blame him, right? I mean, he's, he's super busy. At least currently the answer to this is no. Finally, sorry for the four and one. What motivates you to have this philosophy channel? Any advice on running a YouTube channel about exploring religion and the fundamental nature of reality? What motivates me? Well, many, many things do. For starters, right, I care about good reasoning. I want people to be able to think critically about these important topics. Second, I find it both fun and interesting, right? I mean, I learn stuff while I'm doing this channel and while making videos, and I help others learn stuff as well. And I enjoy teaching. It also gives me an avenue to explore and test ideas, as well as to publicize my research. And finally, it also helps me influence both minds and hearts. And finally, I mean, also practical considerations, right? I had to take out loans for paying for college and this channel allows me to serve people with that education, but also some of those people that I serve in turn become patrons because they see value in the work that I do and that that money from the patrons can help me pay for that student debt. So it's a nice little circle. There are boatloads, like I said, boatloads of things that motivate me. As for advice, well, first, make your content unique in some way, right? Find something that no one else is offering and carve out a unique niche or niche for yourself, right? No one needs or wants a new channel that just trots out the same old boring moral argument, for instance, or the same old standard Kalam or other things like that. There are already enough YouTube channels that do that. So try to make yourself stand out. Try to find something that you offer the market that no one else does. My second thing that I would say is just start making content, right? Starting is the best way to put yourself out there to grow and to improve. My third piece of advice is to pay more attention than I do to aesthetics, <laughs> a good mic, good camera, good lighting, good setup and the like. I put the highest premium on quality content. I research my videos in tremendous depth before putting them out. Lots of them are based on my literal peer reviewed scholarly research that has been published, right? So that's what I tend to put the premium on. But I also, if I could change things, if I had more money, if I, if I had a a stable full-time job, for instance, I'd also be putting in much more effort into a good mic, camera, light, lighting setup, and, and the like. Now I am improving. So yeah, we're on the upwards trajectory. Yeah, I would just say pay attention to those sorts of things. They make a difference. Finally, emphasize quality over quantity. As I was just mentioning, I like to research in a lot of depth before making a video so that quality is prioritized. Instead of making one video every day or making a video really as often as I can, I emphasize quality over quantity. My videos come out whenever they come out, right? If it takes a long time, that's fine. What matters is the quality of the video and in particular, the quality of the argumentation and the content, at least in terms of how I operate my channel. So that's what I would say. I'd say emphasize quality over quantity. Chewy says, uh, will you ever study the apparently apparent proofs that all the religions bring forth and where they fail in providing an objective, true meaning to life? So <laughs> I like that the proofs are not just apparent proofs, but apparently apparent proofs. <laughs> I like that. Okay, well, I'm making my way through many such arguments one by one, of course. Will I ever get through all of them or even the ones from all religions? Probably not. Mitesh Patel says, uh, what's the purpose of discussing an undefined God with theists when their specific God is described in their scriptures? Well, for starters, I don't think the theistic God is undefined, right? God is a being who is omnipotent, omniscient, essentially morally perfect, omnibenevolent or all loving, necessarily existent, independent, the ultimate source or explanation or foundation of reality, supreme in value, worship worthy, non-physical and immaterial, personal, perfectly free, perfectly rational, the creator and sustainer of the universe and its contents and so on and so on, right? So the capitalist, I hate life. Let's, let's start with a dirty joke, right? So these sorts of jokes. So yeah, that's my first point. I don't think the theistic God is undefined. Second, not all theists accept scriptures, right? And even those that do may not think that their scriptures provide a fully fleshed out model or conception of God. Third and finally, the purpose, you're asking what's the purpose of discussing these sorts of things. The purpose is to get at the truth of the matter and to help both ourselves and others find the truth of the matter. 
Borders asks, any thoughts on Alistair McIntyre, particularly after Virtue? Any thoughts on Ian Hacking? Do you have a preferred view on the philosophy of mathematics? So unfortunately, I haven't read After Virtue, so I can't comment much on that. We did read some McIntyre, particularly significant portions of his ethics in the conflicts of modernity in one of my grad seminars at Purdue. Unfortunately, I don't remember too much, partly because I found it boring and also partly because we read it during a very stressful point in the semester in my life. So <laughs> regarding in hacking, from what I have read of him, he seems to be such a wonderful writer, first thing. I mean, that's the first thing that I want to say. But secondly, he's most well known for his entity realism. Now, I'm not an entity realist. I'm broadly speaking, a realist simpliciter, a scientific realist, that is, though perhaps with the caveat that in the highly theoretical elements of physics, that kind of highly theoretical domain, I might lean towards a kind of epistemic structural realism. As for philosophy of math, I have specified my views on that earlier in this video, so I kindly advise you to check that out. Uh, SNL Draco, the most important question of all, oh yeah, breast products. So I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> El pinguino. El pinguino. Do you still keep up with the philosophical arguments surrounding the topic of abortion? And do you have any pro-life or pro-choice philosophers you particularly enjoy the work of on the topic of abortion? Trying to keep it short for your wife and 12 children. Well, thank you very much. So occasionally I will read recently published stuff on abortion, such as the stuff on the impairment argument for the immorality of abortion the, and the exchanges happening there between my friends Perry Hendricks and Dustin Crummett. But for the most part, what I keep up with is the literature on stuff that I actively research and publish on. So that's like philosophy of religion, metaphysics, philosophy of time, etc. Uh, and applied ethics is, of course, outside of that domain. Nevertheless, I do enjoy the work, uh, you know, occasionally when I get to look at these sorts of things. I do enjoy the work of pro-life philosopher David Hershenov. And I found some of his arguments to be, you know, at least reasonably plausible. And as for the pro-choice side, I think the most formidable proponent of the pro-choice view is probably David Boonin. Bigfoot asks, what is your political philosophy? Well, I responded to this in my 3K AMA video. It was one of the earliest questions asked therein, so I recommend checking that out. Also, whenever I recommend my 3K AMA video, click on see more in the description, right? Because in the description, I put all the timestamps. What are your top five favorite movies? So sorry, I don't really watch movies all that much. I don't quite have the time, but I do have a favorite movie, namely The Arrival. I really like that movie. Ty Meloff says, congrats. This seems to only be the beginning. Well, let's hope so, Ty. How does one financially survive pursuing a PhD in philosophy? Well, fun fact, most philosophy PhD programs are fully funded, so that's pretty good. Nevertheless, while you aren't losing money then, uh, well, <laughs> there's a sense in which you're losing money because you could instead be doing a, like a, a job or whatever. But anyway, you're not actively losing money, but there's still the question of how you're supposed to stay afloat, like financially afloat. Now, there are several ways you can do this. So for starters, you'll probably get a stipend from your PhD program that will at least help with living costs, groceries and the like. Plus, you might get at least a little money from teaching classes. But other avenues you could take include one, taking out a loan, two, running a YouTube channel where generous patrons are willing to help you through your PhD program, right? Much loved all my patrons. Three, saving up money beforehand, for instance, taking a gap year and getting a part or full-time job during that gap year to help you pay expenses when in grad school, and so on. Greg Montana asks, forgive me if you've answered this elsewhere. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, given your personal description of your agnostic position, it seems possible to continue weighing evidence for and against the existence of God for your whole life without being convinced one way or the other. Would you find this to be an acceptable outcome for yourself? So it is what it is, really. I mean, philosophy and truth-seeking more generally is hard. It's really hard. Ultimately, I'll simply follow truth and justification where they lead. For me, that's the most intellectually respectable option available. I mean, listen, I hope God exists, of course, right? I hope this broken creation is redeemed. I hope humans can be morally transformed and flourish in everlasting life. So I can at least still engage with and rest in these quite settled, quite firm, quite positive hopes of mine. And the hopes can, in turn, influence how I act in certain ways. For example, conditional prayer, hoping, you know, remember hoping that the helicopter crew in my earlier analogy will help me or save me or etc., taking steps to actualize that, etc. Greg also asks, do you think that there is anything out there that would be able to permanently tip the scale for you one way or the other? Well, I mean, potentially, yes. I mean, new arguments, right? New considerations concerning old arguments and so on certainly have the potential to tip my scales and engender a change of mind. Maybe religious experience, although I'm not quite sure. I do think that there are some potential defeaters afflicting the evidential efficacy of religious experiences, but who knows? I mean, we just have to see, right? See where reality takes me in this grand epistemic landscape. I know it is a quite personal question, but A is for anything. Well, absolutely. Anyway, congratulations on hitting the milestone. I really appreciate your ability to articulate your thoughts. So I believe in your interview with Dr. Tyron Goldschmidt. He repeatedly said I couldn't have stated it better myself. You have a great mind and I've learned a lot by watching your videos.
Well, thank you very much, my dude. That, that really means a lot to me. So thank you for watching my videos. And I really hope that they can continue to serve you uh, in your pursuit of truth. And of course, that's perfectly fine if you discovered my channel a couple of weeks ago. Check out my backlog of videos, right? I can guarantee you that they're all the greatest videos that have ever been produced. So the Koopa King says, what are some areas in philosophy you're still undecided about that you think would have major implications for a worldview? Well, here are a few. I mean, God's existence, right? Free will. I mean, again, I have leanings here. Same with personal identity. I have leanings. But if I came to a settled view there, I mean, that would influence a lot of aspects of my worldview, what I take to be compatible with what, what arguments I would start to find more plausible and less plausible, etc. Also, the precise nature of consciousness. Again, I have leanings here. I broadly lean towards a non-physicalist view. But like, what's the precise nature of it? If I came to a precise view here, like property dualism or like substance dualism or like other non-physicalist views, again, that would definitely influence my broader view is about the nature and structure of reality. So yeah, these these sorts of things. Levi, I think, I think that's how you pronounce it. And then shiach, Levi, shiach. Uh, if the answer to this question is no, then it is an imperative. Have you read any Kierkegaard? Well, I could say this as Kierkegaard, right? If I wanted to be pretentious, or I could just read it as a normal person and say Kierkegaard. Have you read any Kierkegaard? If so, what are your thoughts? If not the imperative, read some Kierkegaard. Start with the sickness unto death. I'd rather start with the thickness unto death, but okay. So unfortunately, I haven't read any Kierkegaard. I've read Korsgaard, right? That's a contemporary analytic philosopher. But uh, Kierkegaard, no, I haven't. You say, congrats, dude. Drop us some more soccer training footage, would you? Oh, absolutely. So yeah, those are... Uh... I'm not sure if I would describe them as training, to be honest. I mean, I kind of just go out there for <laughs> a short period of time because it's it's close to my house, the place where I kick. And I just, you know, just kick around for kicks and giggles, honestly. But yeah, I'll do that. I'll put it at the end of this 10K AMA. And also, if you're interested, check out my bonus soccer playlist and also all my other playlists, by the way, people. Anonymous Cat says, congratulations, Joe, for my question. I wonder, what is your assessment of Wilfred Sellers' characterization of the aim of philosophy as the effort to understand how things, in the broadest possible sense of the term, hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term? Moreover, do you believe that philosophy can provide substantial knowledge by itself, or does it just clarify the relationships between various philosophical commitments? So I actually do quite like Sellers' characterization of the aim of philosophy. It's pithy, to say the least. I mean, I'm not sure how informative it is, right? Like, what is the broadest possible sense of those terms, right? It, it leaves us still in a state of puzzlement. It's like, okay, yeah, you're telling me how things hang together in the broadest possible senses of those two terms, but like, what are those senses? And I'm also not sure that it demarcates philosophy and its aims from other things, for example, science and physics and literature and so on. I mean, literature could itself be a quest to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term, right? I mean, you're exploring the human condition. You can still explore the nature of reality and all these other sorts of things through literature. Of course, you're not doing it through the distinctive methods and tools of philosophy, but it's still an effort to understand how things hang together in the broadest possible senses of those terms. Same thing potentially with science. And then for your second question, yes, I do think philosophy can provide substantial knowledge by itself, right? That's what my, that's what a lot of my channel is dedicated to. And then Julian Wollers says, is cereal soup? So if you want my gut reaction, I'd say obviously not. Uh, do things that do not exist have attributes? So no, I don't think so. There are no non-existent things. And so a fortiori, there are no non-existent things that have attributes, right? If there are no unicorns, then clearly it follows that there are no red unicorns. Or if there are no unicorns, then it clearly follows that there are no unicorns that have attributes. And so similarly, if there are no non-existent things, which I take to be true, then there are no non-existent things that have attributes, or there are no non-existent things that are F for any property F. And also just think about it. I mean, to have an attribute, you'd already have to be there. You'd have to exist in order to have the attribute, right? The attribute is characterizing a thing, right? But non-existent things aren't things because they don't exist. They're not even in reality. So as to have the attribute in the first place, to have the property in the first place. Take the example of square circle. It's easy to say that it does not have attributes since it cannot and therefore does not exist. But if it doesn't have the attributes of having four corners and being a circle, which make the contradiction, which make the contradiction, and therefore the reason it cannot exist, then it can exist because the contradiction is gone. This seems absurd to me. So no, the contradiction isn't gone, right? The contradiction lies in the sentence or the proposition. The contradiction doesn't lie in some entity with contradictory properties, right? The contradiction is in the sentence, there is a square circle because that strictly entails that there is some object which both has and does not have four sides. So the contradiction lies in that sentence or lies in the proposition. It doesn't lie in some entity which actually has contradictory properties. 
Redon Delu says, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? Please give current options and your personal belief. So check out my 3K AMA, specifically the section on explaining existence at minute mark or maybe hour mark 143.42. Also check out my video, 20 cosmological arguments and analysis. Photon says, congratulations on all these subscribers. Well, thank you. My questions, what do you think is the most interesting approach to stage two of cosmological arguments? I'd say definitely Josh's argument from limits. If you want to hear my critical appraisal of that argument, or at least some of my critical appraisals of that argument, check out my video on over a hundred arguments for God answered. What are your thoughts on multiverse theodicies? So I'd probably have to take them on a case by case basis, right? Because there are different versions of them, but they still don't detract, at least by my lights, from the fact that the character of our universe is not at all what we would expect from a perfect being. We wouldn't expect there to be this bloodbath of an evolutionary history, which is the very means or mechanism by which God brought about biological diversity, for instance. So at least for some of the more powerful arguments from evil, at least by my lights, multiverse theodicies aren't really of much help because the data is still super duper surprising on theism. We're just relocating the surprise, right? We're surprised that this universe is among the multiverses that God created. The third question this person asks is, how do you think the field of philosophy of religion will develop in the future? Well, I've already discussed this question earlier, so I kindly advise you to check out my earlier responses. Philosophical J says, congratulations, I have to ask, there has been a growth of polytheism and paganism in the West, though it is still quite small. Do you think the field of philosophy of religion will be impacted by this growth in the near future? If so, what changes in the dialogue do you foresee? Well, given the steps being taken to globalize philosophy of religion, I wouldn't be surprised if it receives more attention or if they receive more attention. These steps, what I'm referring to, you know, for instance, Yuji Nagasawa has this huge project. I think Templeton Foundation gave him a big monetary reward to try to globalize philosophy of religion and bring in various other perspectives that have been neglected. So anyway, I wouldn't be surprised if, if these receive more attention in the future of philosophy of religion. Now, what changes in the dialogue do I envisage? Well, new arguments against traditional theism and atheism by means of arguments for polytheism. But also, I mean, here's something that might change about the dialogue, and this would be a welcome change. Hopefully, dialogues concerning philosophy of religion become a lot less apologetics and Christianity focused. Senku Ishigami says, will you ever collaborate with Friction, James Fodor, Lance Bush, Cosmic Skeptic, Matt Dillahunty, hee hee, in your channel? <laughs> okay, so Friction, yes, eventually. So we are actually co-authoring a paper on Benedetti paradoxes and Patrick principles and causal finitism and yeah, the, yeah, the Grim Reaper paradox, etc. Once that paper gets accepted, hopefully once it gets accepted within you know, however long it takes. We're eventually going to do some collaboration. James Fodor, yes, actually a collaboration of sorts is already underway for that. I'm not going to give more details about that. Lance Bush. So yeah, I want to get him on my channel at some point in the future. Yes. And what about Cosmic Skeptic? Well, if he wants to collaborate, sure, I'm always down for that. And then Matt Dillahunty, no. Anthony Rowden, thoughts on antinatalism? Well, at least the versions that I've come across and the defenses of it that I've come across and so on, it seems to rely on utilitarianism, but I'm not a utilitarian and I think that there are some serious difficulties facing utilitarianism. I'm also not convinced that most of us have on average bad lives. That tends to ignore goods like knowledge and virtue and so on. We're not just assessing the raw pleasure and suffering that people will experience, which oftentimes they've seen these sorts of calculations being based on. We also need to take into account the values of virtue and knowledge and relationships and so on. And at least by my lights, that isn't at all reducible to pleasure. And it's even quite difficult to compare these sorts of goods. Maybe these sorts of goods are just incommensurably good with one another. So anyway, there are lots of difficulties for the kind of calculations that these people run to justify antinatalism. And again, this is just for typical defenses that I've come across. Meron Pareto says, congrats on the milestone. Just a speculative question here. How do you see philosophy of religion being impacted if we made contact with extraterrestrials? Do you see God being undermined by this? Maybe even certain religious view of God, that is Christian doctrine of the incarnation or Imago Dei, or would this impact theology more instead? Right. So I don't think it would affect God's existence at all, to be honest. I really don't think so. It may affect theology. So for instance, a lot of theologians think that in terms of Jesus's incarnation, whatever is not assumed is not saved, right? So Christ, the second person of the Trinity, assumed a human nature. And it's precisely in virtue of this that humans can be saved. But there is this slogan going around in lots of at least traditional Christology, that what is not assumed is not saved. So if, if Christ didn't assume, for instance, an alien nature for these extraterrestrials, well, then they might not be saved. So what this means is that you're arguably going to have to posit like another, maybe you're going to have to posit another incarnation where 
the second person of the Trinity, or maybe a different person of the Trinity became incarnate for this alien species, or maybe they didn't even have a fall. So like you, you get into these interesting questions. I'm not sure if it would like be a challenge for Christianity or disprove it. It's just, you're going to have to come up with new hypotheses, it seems. Now, I actually do recommend, there is a nice paper on this by Tyler McNabb and Chad McIntosh called Houston, We Have a Problem. It has a subtitle, but I forget that. McNabb and McIntosh actually went on Capturing Christianity to discuss their paper here, Houston, We Have a Problem. It's basically talking about how the discovery of extraterrestrials would impact God's existence, but also I think they focus principally on Christian theology as well. So check out that video and check out their paper also. Joe D says, uh, if you were to be a theist, what theological positions do you think you would be most likely to hold? Or which, you know, alternatively, which would be most reasonable or the most beautiful or the most good or most healthy positions or the positions that I most respect or most disrespect, etc. And these are excellent questions. God's knowledge. So I'd probably go a simple foreknowledge view. I'm not the biggest fan of Molinism because of reasons that people like Nevin Kleimenhaga, Daniel Rubio, Philip Swenson, and lots of others have published on. I would lean against open theism just because all else being equal, we would want to ascribe to God more knowledge. <laughs> so that gives us a defeasible presumption against open theism. And moreover, I tend to think that future contingents have truth values and that an omniscient being should know everything that has a truth value. God's sovereignty. So I'd probably not want to go theological determinism because I do have worries for compatibilism, especially if you're combining this with eternal conscious torment. That could be, that could be pretty bad. What about human freedom? I probably want to go libertarian freedom. I mean, if you're, a, if you're a compatibilist and a theist, I mean, you do face potential difficulties pertaining to the problem of evil, right? Because when skeptics ask, well, oh, hold on a second, like, couldn't God have made us such that we're free, but nevertheless, we always do the right thing, right? After all, isn't that what God was like? Isn't that, isn't that what Jesus was like? Isn't that what, as Catholics think, Mary was like? You know, surely God could have created us such that we are free in each of our actions and morally responsible for them. And yet on each occasion, we do the right thing, right? So you wouldn't have people raping each other and you wouldn't have people committing holocausts and so on. That would seem to be a far better world. And it would seem to be immensely surprising that God created our world here where we're not like that as opposed to that other world. So we'd get some pretty significant disconfirmation of theism. So the argument goes. But if you're a libertarian, right, you have an easy response to this. And this is what lots of theists respond to. They're like, well, hold on a second. That's not up to God to be able to choose to actualize a world wherein everyone does the right thing on all occasions. Because part of the reason a particular possible world is actualized is because of the creatures' free decisions themselves. That's up to them and how they exercise their libertarian freedom. God couldn't decree in advance and actualize a precise particular possible world because he needs to do it in cooperation with creaturely libertarian freedom. And creatures might very well go wrong. And it's not up to God to be able to ensure that they all go right without, of course, taking away their freedom. So I'd probably want to go a kind of libertarian with respect to human freedom. God's imminence or transcendence? Yeah, I mean, this is interesting. I mean, I do kind of like panentheism because you can preserve the principle that every material object that begins to exist comes from some pre-existent things or stuff, right? Because under panentheism, you can have creation ex deus, where God creates out of the resources of his own being. And, you know, you could even potentially combine that with maybe a theistic idealist view, potentially. I mean, again, I, I voiced earlier some reservations for theistic idealism, but, you know, maybe you can get around those. But yeah, I mean, I, pan panentheism allows us to get both a kind of transcendence because God transcends the universe. He's more than the universe and he could have existed without the universe. But it also gives a kind of imminence, right? We are all in some sense within God. We are all in some sense in God, right? Panentheism, all is in Godism. In God, we live and move and have our being in the most literal sense of that. So anyway, I'm sympathetic to panentheism, but also I still quite like the traditional perfect being theist view where God is super duper transcendent. I don't know which one I would take. The, the more traditional perfect being theist view where God creates ex nihilo and he's more transcendent than imminent versus the panentheism. So what is salvation? I mean, presumably salvation would be redemption of this broken creation. Clearly there's some sort of brokenness around us. So what would salvation amount to? Well, it would be a redemption of this, a fixing of this, the lion laying down with the lamb. Mechanisms of salvation. Yeah, I'd probably have a universal salvation. That that would include, right, probably punishment, right? It would include a finite hell because finite crimes committed on earth and so on. So it would probably include something like a kind of purgatorial 
suffering, a suffering that can help to redeem souls rather than destroy them, more so a regenerative or purificatory style of punishment, where by means of the punishment, people are freed from the chains and the shackles of sin and selfishness and pride in which they locked themselves while on earth. And then after they're freed from that, right, they enter into perfect communion with God and the rest of the people in this kind of blissful, everlasting life. So yes, it would probably be universal reconciliation with God. Death and the afterlife, heaven or hell, kind of just articulated that. I think uh, you could call it hell, you could call it purgatory, but it would be some sort of punishment for earthly crimes. But the punishment doesn't serve solely a punitive purpose. It also serves a redemptive, regenerative, purificatory purpose. And it's ultimately for the sake of uniting the sinner or the person enslaved to sin and pride and passion and so on. Uh, It's for the purpose of uniting them to God, ultimately. Views on scriptures. I'll just talk about Christianity. I would take Randall Rouser's view. He has a providential errantist view where God providentially includes certain mistakes within the Bible, like depicting God as commanding genocide, right? I take it as just a, a Morian fact, a self-evident fact that a perfect omnibenevolent being could not command genocide or could not command you to, to go and slice the heads off of innocent children and animals and so on. So given that this is indeed arguably depicted in the scripture, well, then I'd want to say that this is an error that God has providentially included within um, the Bible for God's purposes. We might not know them. We might know them partially and so on. I recommend you guys check out Randall Rouser's book, Jesus Loves Canaanites. Uh, What or who is God? Yes, I'd say God is personal. Solution to the problem of evil. Well, I just take a panoply of different solutions. I mean, honestly, if I were a theist, I don't know why more theists don't do this. I'd probably just say, yeah, evil is evidence against God's existence, clearly. (laughs) But I would say the evidence for God's existence just sufficiently outweighs that, right? That's what I would say if I were a theist. (laughs) I'd say, yes, evil clearly provides evidence against God's existence, especially things like evolutionary animal suffering. But we just have sufficiently good reason for God's existence. So we go with what the evidence overall leads us to. And of course, you know, I'd probably say things that could at least help mitigate the problem of evil, you know, at least mitigate the evidential force it has for atheism. I'd probably go with something like a soul-making theodicy and other sorts of things like that. Christian mystic. So would I be a Christian mystic? No, I'm not sure if I'm even capable of that. Ontology of reality, dualistic, idealistic, or naturalistic. If you have God in the picture, then reality as a whole is already demarcated into creator and creation. So that's already a kind of dualistic picture. I guess if you're asking about the nature of I guess the humdrum created reality, would that be dualistic, naturalistic, or idealistic? If I were a theist, I'd either accept the dualistic or idealistic view. I mean, either theistic idealism is true, or if I wanted to go with a more traditional model of God, then I'd probably go with a more dualistic view rather than idealistic view. All right, we're back. We're alive and kicking. And on to more questions. Okay. Macho Chico says, what is the highest order of knowledge in your opinion? Is it logic or is that trumped by reason slash rationality or perhaps even philosophy itself? Does it depend on if you're religious, whether or not theology trumps logic? Do language and history play a major role? So I'm tempted to say that there's no highest order of knowledge, but it does seem that some pieces or domains of knowledge are more important, maybe more valuable than others. So for instance, like knowing the fundamental nature and structure of reality seems more important or valuable than knowing how many blades of grass there were in my front lawn on October 3rd, 2014 at 3.05 PM. So maybe there are quote unquote higher forms or more valuable forms of knowledge than others. On reflection, that does kind of seem plausible. And you're also probably right that being religious will affect this, right? If you're religious, well, then presumably knowledge of God is the highest order of knowledge, as you put it. And then Macho Chico also says, please make an atheist tier list. Well, eventually I will, um, maybe in September or something like that. Super busy as of late. Rigo Ferrer says, congratulations, Joe, by far my favorite YouTuber. It's a privilege to learn from you. Well, thank you very much. That means so much to me, my dude. My question, uh, objections to, oh, your first question, objections to Professor Oppie's account of metaphysical modality slash argument from the simplicity of naturalism. Question mark. Uh, Sometimes it feels weird when explaining, say, the applicability of mathematics or the fine tuning of natural laws by appealing to metaphysical necessity. So I like Oppie's view of the metaphysics of modality. It's one that Alexander Proust, I'm seeing if I have the book next to me, uh, it's it's in a stack next to me, so I'm not going to go and get it. But I like the metaphysics of modality that Oppie subscribes to. It's a broadly Aristotelian view on which something is possible, if and only if it's either actual or the potential outworking of the causal powers of actual things. Okay, I got it out. Actuality, possibility, and worlds. Alexander Proust defends this kind of view of modality, and lots of other philosophers, both theists and atheists and agnostics and so on, 
accept or at least are sympathetic to views broadly along those lines. But importantly, you know, accepting Oppie's view of the metaphysics of modality doesn't automatically commit you to the way that Oppie uses that metaphysics of modality to try to respond to certain natural theological arguments. So for instance, when Oppie is responding to the fine tuning argument, I don't share his response there. I don't make his response. I don't think it's plausible, to be honest. I accept a broadly Bayesian style epistemology, at least in lots of domains. But by contrast, Oppie doesn't. And so my objection to Oppie's appeal to metaphysical necessity to try to explain the fine tuning would be that the data isn't expected under Oppie's view, or at least with my theist hat on and trying to defend the fine tuning argument, I would say, who cares if you know, you're saying that it's metaphysically necessary? The point is just that the data, the fact that the constants and initial conditions of the universe fall within a very narrow range, which is life permitting, that's not at all expected under the naturalistic hypothesis. You could, of course, just say, oh, no, my hypothesis is that it's necessary. And so the probability is one. Yes, you could say that, but then you're drastically, drastically and correspondingly, right, to the exact same degree, you're lowering the intrinsic probability of your hypothesis. Because why would this set of values be the necessary set of values as opposed to the necessary values and initial conditions being any of the other nearly infinitely many epistemically possible initial conditions and values? without any special reason to think that these particular values would be the ones that are metaphysically necessary as opposed to all the other epistemically possible values, you're only purchasing a high predictive power with respect to the data by correspondingly decreasing your intrinsic probability. Furthermore, even if we granted that the laws and initial conditions and so on are metaphysically necessary, we can still ask which hypothesis, which theory better predicts that this set of values would be the necessary set of values. And so the theist would argue that's much better predicted under theism than it is under naturalism. Suppose that you know we examined the initial conditions of the universe and we found out that they spelled out in perfect Koine Greek the first 14 verses of the book of John. Right? Imagine that happened. And now imagine that someone comes along and just says, oh no, you, you don't need to appeal to a designer, right? That's just explained by its metaphysical necessity. What? <laughs> Like, firstly, even if we grant that it's metaphysically necessary that the initial conditions spell out in perfect Koine Greek, the first 14 verses of John, that in and of itself is profound confirmation of theism, and in particular, Christian theism. That in and of itself is far more expected under Christian theism than it is under any other hypothesis. And so it's still profound evidence for Christian theism, even granting that it's metaphysically necessary. But also, again, even though your hypothesis is purchasing predictive power of the data, right, your hypothesis, according to which it's necessary that the initial conditions spell out the 14 verses of John in this way, even though you're purchasing predictive power of that and saying that, yeah, it's a probability of one under my hypothesis, again, you're correspondingly decreasing your intrinsic probability. There seems to be no reason why the metaphysically necessary initial conditions would take on the character of the first 14 verses of John as opposed to the near infinitude of other epistemically possible initial conditions that it might have taken. And so merely appealing to metaphysical necessity isn't going to help here. You're just relocating the improbability from the likelihood of the data under your hypothesis to the intrinsic probability of your hypothesis. You're just relocating the improbability. You're not getting rid of it. This person's second question says, could you elaborate in detail on your positions regarding philosophy of time? Do you lean towards presentism, growing block, et cetera, and why? Yeah, so I think or maybe thought that I was or am a lukewarm presentist, by which I mean very slightly and tentatively leaning towards presentism. The main reason is or was, I'm going to explain why I'm saying that. The main reason was to explain our phenomenological experience of temporal becoming, plus reasons for ruling out non-presentist but tensed views of time, like growing block theory. For instance, growing block theory suffers from pretty serious skeptical challenges pertaining to how you know whether or not you're in the present moment. But as of late, honestly, I mean, I've been starting to question this lukewarm presentist commitment, especially in light of relativity theory. I mean, if, as at least orthodox interpretations of relativity would suggest, simultaneity is relative to reference frame, well, then it becomes exceedingly difficult to maintain presentism. Since then, what exists would be relative to and dependent upon reference frame. But such a fragmented view of reality is surely absurd. Yes, yes, I know. Presentists try to get around this by appeal to things like neo-Lorentzianism, etc., but those views are typically more complex, more ad hoc, and it's not clear that they're as evidentially confirmed as the orthodox interpretation. But anyway, all of this is a subject for another time because my views here are in quite a flux, as you can see. Mardio says, my question, are you planning to be a full-time YouTuber? If not, what are your plans for this channel? Well, uh, if you guys would be willing to fund it, I would become a full-time YouTuber. <laughs> I mean, currently the funds aren't near that level for it to be sustainable at all. 
but I'm open to it. If the channel keeps growing and more people become patrons and so on, then yeah, I'd be willing to do that. But if such funds are not forthcoming, well, then the plan is basically to continue as usual, right? Making one video once every seven to 14 days or so. Usually it's about nine or 10 days. Still having discussions with philosophers, still making my own lecture videos, still making videos like this, et cetera. But I mean, if I were to do full time, right? I mean, I could get a decked out studio. I could get a really nice camera and mic. I could travel around and interview scholars in person. I could make more videos and more frequently, et cetera, right? So um, it's definitely something I'd be willing to do. The only barrier is really just securing the funds that would make it financially possible. But that's up to you guys. Caleb P says, congrats. How would you describe your position on the free will debate? Why do you believe in free will as I do for context? And how do you respond to the best arguments against it? I answered this earlier, basically following Al Mealy, I adopt what's called agnostic autonomism, where you say, yes, we do have free will, but you're agnostic on whether or not it's of a libertarian or compatibilist variety. Some reasons in favor of free will, of course, include that it's, well, an obvious datum of experience. You can appeal to phenomenal conservatism. You can appeal to certain moral responsibility practices and the fact that, for instance, it seems obvious that let's say Hitler was morally responsible for exterminating the Jews and that he could only be responsible in that manner if he has free will, etc. What about the best arguments against it? Well, you'd probably have to take those on a case-by-case -case basis. So for instance, Greg Caruso's arguments, I mean, he basically just says, if determinism is true, we can't be free. And also if indeterminism is true, then we can't be free. I would challenge both of those claims. Greg Caruso then appeals to the standard, standard arguments like luck and uh, manipulation arguments and so on. So I, you'd really just have to take this on a case-by-case -case basis. Cosmology, philosophy, and pharmacology says two short questions to Schmid. Uh, one, what do you think about Roe v. Wade being overturned? Yeah, so I discussed my view on the morality of abortion in my 3K AMA video, but I found the debate about the legality of abortion to be even far more difficult than the already incredibly difficult debate about the morality of abortion. And it's also because it's the legality of things, and I literally don't study that at all. I found it also to be kind of beyond my pay grade. So I'm still trying to formulate a settled view on its legality. So you're gonna have to check up on me in, in the future, maybe to see if slash when I reach a settled view here. Two, what's your view on Van Tilian or Greg Bonson's presuppositional apologetics? Well, I don't quite take it seriously, to be honest, philosophically speaking, at least. Earlier in this video, I gave some resources on presuppositionalism, and there are far more. So if you want at least a little bit of an elaboration on my response there, you can check that out. Chad McIntosh, if this is the Chad McIntosh, much love to see you here, my dude. Congratulations, he says. Built a successful YouTube channel, consistently uploaded high-quality videos, and have amassed an impressive publication record, all the while taking and smashing challenging college courses and within just a few years. My question is, when are you going to stop being so lazy? <laughs> uh, much love, my dude. Ahmad M. Nassar says... Do you enjoy playing soccer more than doing philosophy? So this is an excellent question. I mean, I had to really ponder this one. In terms of raw pleasure, of course, soccer beats out philosophy because it's just so fun in the moment. But I guess in terms of enjoyment, which is a different concept from raw pleasure, I guess I'd say I enjoy philosophy more. It engages my mind and my heart more. It contributes more to my flourishing. It helps me grow morally and intellectually. It helps me gain things more important than temporary pleasure, such as knowledge, intellectual virtue, and the methods and tools and skills to be able to think critically, assess arguments, detect bullshit, and more. So ultimately, the answer is philosophy, but that's not to detract away from the sheer enjoyment that I experience when I play football or soccer. Faraday says, congrats. My question is, are you happy with where you are in life right now? Yeah, I'm pretty happy. I've got grad school coming up soon. That's going to be fun. I publish stuff. That's always really fun. I quite enjoy that. It's a pain sometimes when you get ludicrous referee reports back from the anonymous reviewers or the anonymous referees where they completely misunderstand your paper and bring up the, the dumbest objections possible, even ones that you already addressed in your article. Anyway, this is not a therapy session for me. Maybe it is, though. I quite enjoy doing things on YouTube. I have a nice and supportive and loving family and relationships and so on. So I'm very grateful as well as very fortunate. Of course, not everything is hunky dory, right? I mean, I have anxiety and you can go through it up, uh, you know, this list of negative things that we might want to pinpoint about my life. But overall, yeah, I'm very happy. I'm very grateful and I'm very fortunate. Greetings from a Phil 301 classmate. <laughs> nice. Yes. Phil 301, History of Ancient Philosophy. For those of you who don't know, Purdue. It's wonderful when people that I've met or have seen in real life tell me that like, hey, I've seen your YouTube stuff and I really enjoy it. I'm like, ah, oh, thank you. Hello says, congrats, Spider-Man. Keep doing wonderful works. Questions. 
Number one, your top five philosophy books by Muslim philosophers. Well, I don't have a top five book list here, but I have enjoyed and benefited from the work of, for instance, Mohammed Saleh Zawarpour. And I've also enjoyed some medieval Islamic philosophical theology as well as philosophy, such as Al-Ghazali, as Craig would put it, as well as Avicenna or Ibn Sina. Two, will you have conversations with Muslim philosophers like Thought Adventure Podcast, Mohammed Hijab, uh, Hama? <laughs> Hamad uh, and so on, like you do with Christian philosophers at some point when you will have free time. Um, as for Thought Adventure podcast, sure, I'd be happy to go on. Mohammed Ijab, uh, no. You can see lots of the antics that he pulled with Cosmic Skeptic for one reason that uh, I'm not open to that. Hamza Tsurtsis, um, I haven't heard of this person, but if they're not tribalistic and if they're scholarly and if they're interested in the truth and if they want a conversation, I'd be down. Uh, number three, what are your views on multiple gods versus only one god? Can there be multiple necessary beings? So these are kind of two different sub questions here. So I find monotheism more plausible than polytheism. I tend to think that what is a God? A God would be something that's worthy of worship. What would something that's worthy of worship be like? It would be perfect. What is a perfect being? A perfect being has all perfections essentially and lacks all imperfections essentially. But arguably one perfection, and this just seems really intuitively clear to me, one perfection is being the source of everything apart from yourself, or at least everything concrete apart from yourself. But in that case, there couldn't be two perfect beings because if they each have this perfection, right, to be a perfect being is to have every perfection, essentially. And given the fact that this property that I mentioned is a perfection, it would follow that each of these perfect beings would have to be the source of everything apart from themselves. But then they'd be the source of each other, right? So this one would be dependent for its existence on this one. But then this one would be dependent for its existence on this one in turn. So maybe you're hearing that ringing noise right now. I don't know what that is, but hopefully it'll be gone sometime soon. And I'm just going to carry on, right? Keep calm and carry on. So yeah, you would have one perfect being depending on the other for its existence, but then this one in turn, depending on the first for its existence. And that just strikes me as absurd. You would have a kind of vicious circle of dependence. So plausibly, there couldn't be two perfect beings and hence there couldn't be more than one God. That's sort of an argument that I find at least somewhat plausible. And, you know, that would be an argument for monotheism over and against polytheism, for instance. Now, as to your question, can there be multiple necessary beings? I mean, I don't see why not. And, and the arguments that I have seen for why there can only be one are typically hopelessly confused. So, yeah. Question four from this person says, since you like stage one of contingency arguments, but disagree with stage two, can you please invite Dr. Mohammed Saleh Zawarpour for a dialogue on his recent book, Necessary Existence and Monotheism, and or Mohammed Ijab, who is currently doing his PhD on contingency arguments and wrote a book on this they can represent Islamic version of contingency arguments, which is a little different than popular versions presented by Christian philosophers. It will be a very fruitful discussion. So I could perhaps get Zarapur on. It all just depends on how busy I am. Right now, at least, I've bitten off far more than I can chew. <laughs> but maybe in the future, I'll be able to have uh, Zarapur on. Again, thanks for everything, Spider-Man. Well, thank you, my dude, for your support, for your comments, and for everything that you do. Oh, hello, also made another comment asking your favorite paper of all time. So here is my favorite paper of all time. Nine other works have cited this paper. David Oderberg actually wrote an entire article responding to this article. And, you know, David Oderberg's article is like 20 pages or so. Um, so, yeah, here's the article. This is the entire article that you can see on the screen here. It's called A Demonstration of the Causal Power of Absences, published by Tyron Goldschmidt in the journal Dialectica page 85. And yeah, here's the article. As you can see, it's very insightful. It's very forcefully argued. It's very clear. I actually didn't find a single grammatical mistake, which is pretty rare for articles like this. Yeah, so this is this is just a wonderful article. Death Note asks, what's what? I say, you tell me. Joe Mama says, Cong congrats, bro. Question, do you pray? You've mentioned agnostic prayer before, or do you ever have days where you feel that there is a God and vice versa? So as for the first question, yes, occasionally I make conditional prayers. You can see my response to Matthew Lavagna from earlier for uh, defense of the rationality of that. I also highly recommend that y'all check out Paul Draper's paper, Confessions of a Practicing Agnostic. Now, Draper's view is a little bit complicated because he's not agnostic on a kind of traditional perfect being theism. He's actually atheist towards that because of considerations of the problem of evil. But he is agnostic towards whether there are more non-traditional but still theistic or at least quasi-theistic views of ultimate reality. So he's agnostic on that and between that view and naturalist views and so on. He defends this more in his forthcoming book entitled Atheism and the Problem of Evil. Now, you also ask, do I ever have days where I feel that God exists or doesn't? So I guess it depends on what we mean by feel. But I mean, I guess the answer is sort of yes to the question, you know, like occasionally I'll just be struck by something like the beauty of nature or something. And this is on a rare, rare occasion, but occasionally I'll be struck by that. Or, you know, I'll be studying like cellular biology and I'll be like, this is all so complex and intricate and beautiful, like there must be a God, you know, like those sorts of things that, that like floats through my mind. Right. 
But also, you know, this happens in the reverse equally often, perhaps even more often, where I turn on the news and I see thousands of children starving and dying alone as a result of like a tsunami or something. And I'm like, come on, you've got to be kidding me, theists. Like, there is no way that a perfect being could allow this sort of atrocity to transpire. And, you know, like these aren't, again, these aren't like arguments that I'm developing, right? This question is asking, like, do I ever have days where I just feel that there's a God or feel that there's no God? And as I said, every once in a while, these sorts of short thoughts do just like cross my mind and sort of grip me in the moment, both for and against God's existence. Or the other day I was watching a video where uh, it was very disturbing. It was a bear that was like eating a deer and the deer was like moaning in pain and just crying out for someone or something to help it. And it was, it was enraging of sorts. It was very frustrating. I was like, come on, like any being with the power to stop this sort of thing, it's just a moral failing on the part of that being not to stop that. And so it would be a moral failing on God if God exists not to stop that. So again, I get struck by these sorts of poignant thoughts and brief seemings that just cross my mind, both for and against God's existence. Roy says, hi, Joe, huge congrats. Your content has been a huge help to me, and I especially love your commitment to agnosticism and steel manning. Well, thank you. That does really mean a lot to me. And I, I you know, I do have a, I, I, I try to commit as best as I can to steel manning other views. My question is, for your list of qualities that good worldviews should have, simplicity, explanatory power, et cetera, how would you approach defending these, particularly to lay people, or maybe at least laying out the intellectual price tag of not using them clearly for someone? So how would I do this for lay people? I mean, I guess I would probably take ordinary examples. So we just compare the theories with respect to some ordinary examples. So suppose you wake up, there is a little hole in the side of your wall, your cheese is missing. You kind of woke up in the middle of the night and you heard something like the pitter patter of feet at midnight. And there are also little droppings of little dark things that almost look like chocolate, but they smell very gross. You have all this data here. And now we can compare two theories. One of the theories is that there's a mouse in your house. Another theory is that ghosts are playing a trick on you and trying to make you think that there's a mouse in your house. Now, obviously, we should infer that there's a mouse in your house. And why is that? Well, then I talk with this ordinary person about the various theoretical virtues that this hypothesis exhibits vis-a-vis -vis or in relation to this ghost hypothesis. It's much simpler. It fits much better with our background knowledge. We're not postulating additional entities. We're not postulating radically different kinds of entities and postulating radically different kinds of causal transmission. We're not having to postulate seemingly ad hoc and arbitrary intentions on the part of things. So the mouse explanation is much simpler. It seems to have a greater explanatory power. If it's better with our background knowledge, it unifies all these disparate pieces of data together into a, it unifies all these seemingly disparate pieces of data together into a global explanatory hypothesis with respect to that data and so on down the list. I'd also try to convince the layperson of the importance of explanation. Explanatory power is pretty huge. In general, when we look around us, we see that things have explanations. We witness a kind of global uniformity that things are explained. And so when we're comparing theories, the theory that explains more seems to fit the pattern that we observe in reality. In other words, explaining more is a guide to truth. I'd also talk about the justification for why we should prefer simplicity. More complex hypotheses and theories make more claims about the way that the world is. And so they have more opportunities to be false, in which case they're less likely to be true, right? They have more opportunities to be false. There are more ways in principle for it to be false. And so there's a greater chance that it is indeed false. And so simpler hypotheses, contrary wise, are going to have a greater probability of being true, at least all else being equal. But anyway, I could go into more depth, but I think that suffices for present purposes. Murtasa Shafiq says, thanks for producing well thought out and intriguing philosophy videos. Joe, my question is, what do you think about the concept of there being more than one necessary being, more so concerning polytheism? So I did kind of answer this earlier. I don't see any problem whatsoever with there being more than one necessary being. That's just more than one concrete object, which is such that it cannot fail to exist. I see no reason whatsoever why we couldn't have, for instance, multiple foundational quantum fields, each of which is such that it cannot exist or multiple fundamental particles, each of which is such that it cannot fail to exist, etc. Now, as for polytheism, I gave some reasons earlier why, if I were a theist, I would lean towards monotheism, not polytheism. Uh, Death Note says you should watch anime. Start with Death Note. It's about detective thinking and God of the New World. Totally unbiased suggestion. They also say, what if you can just pick one book for the rest of your life? What will you choose? That is a very difficult question, but honestly, I'd probably choose the Atlas of Reality, which is right back up there. Because, because, well, firstly, it's like 800 pages, so it can keep me occupied for a long time. It talks about methods and tools of doing metaphysics, and it has a whole host of metaphysical theories it outlines and discusses and gives arguments for and against a whole host of different 
metaphysical views and different metaphysical debates and so on. So it's just a goldmine of information and basically can help to keep my mind alive. Silas Abrahamson says, congrats, man. What are your views on political philosophy, gender, and other such hot issues? Do you think they're important and do you take any stances on them? Well, for political philosophy, you can see one of the earlier questions in my 3K AMA. For gender, I don't really have a view here. I haven't really studied that. Other hot issues, uh, I'm not quite sure what you are referring to, but I mean, abortion is one such hot issue. Uh, I talked about that also in my 3K AMA. As for whether or not these sorts of things are important, yes, I do think that they're immensely important. For a lot of these, what's at stake is women's spaces, the control of language, uh, the relationship between language, human constructs, and objective reality. People's rights and interests are on the line here, and so on. So yes, I do recognize that these are immensely important. But of course, we have to divvy up our intellectual attention. Nicholas Newberg says, well done, sir. I'm going to be talking about planning his modal ontological argument with some folks here soon. And I wonder what you think of Ben Arbor's claim that the statement, there is no God, God being a maximally great being with necessary existence, is incoherent. Sounds too good to be true, if you ask me. Yeah, it does sound too good to be true, if you ask me as well. Honestly, I'm going to be honest with you. I think that seems obviously false. There is no contradiction whatsoever in merely saying that there is no God. You're just saying that there does not exist an X, such that X is a maximally great being with necessary existence. There's no contradiction in that whatsoever. Jamie Siegel says, congrats, Joe. I say thank you, Jamie. Wolf Eidegger says, congratulations. I have a question. Could you discuss the gap problem, especially when it comes to cosmological arguments? When can we expect a long video on it? Could you recommend some resources? Thanks. So I've discussed this in many videos of mine. And because I've already canvassed that, I'm not going to discuss it here. As for which videos, well, a lot of them, particularly my contingency argument playlist. But I guess I could just pick out three here for your interest. The first one is 20 cosmological arguments and analysis. I basically go through a whole concoction of naturalist friendly proposals of a necessary foundation. These are perfectly respectable views. And so anyone who's mounting a stage two case for cosmological arguments needs to rule out each and every single one of those views. And those are just the ones that I mentioned in the video, right? There are still further ones out there in the literature. Also, check out the argument from limits section of my 100 plus argument video. And then another video where I discuss the gap problem is my video, The Leibnizian Cosmological Argument. I talk about some of what Proust says with respect to that. As for resources, so there really hasn't been much written on the gap problem, honestly, but I can at least recommend, number one, Proust's entry in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, as well as the references therein. So for instance, he references some of what Jerome Gelman has produced on the gap problem. Um, Josh Rasmussen, he talks about the gap problem in his book, How Reason Can Lead to God. Hugh Gidiet, that's J-I-D-I-E-T-T-E. -E. He has a blog wherein he discusses some of what Josh Rasmussen says in the book that I just mentioned from Josh. You can also see my response to Trent Horn regarding stage two of the Kalam. That's going to be in my Kalam playlist. You can check on my contingency argument playlist where I talk a lot about stage two, as well as the videos that I recommended from earlier. And as for Phaser's stage two, in my forthcoming book with Springer, I have an entire chapter on Phaser's stage two inferences. None of them work. The Piano Man says, do the CC thumbnail guys do yours too? Also, congrats. Well, thank you very much. Usually I make my own thumbnails. I think there have been three videos where I haven't made my own thumbnails. One of them was the one which was the response to Chad McIntosh, where I said, was I lazy or something like that <laughs> on the cover? Uh, yes, Cameron made that for me, Cameron Bertuzzi. And then the ones where it's like William Lane Craig and Spinoza on the cover, as well as Aquinas and um, Graham Oppie on the cover, those were made by Stephen Woodford. So thanks to them. Matthias says, congrats, Joe. Love the work that you do and how you inspire people to study philosophy. Well, that really does mean a lot to me. So thank you, Matthias. I have three brief questions. One, what do you think of planning as evolutionary argument against naturalism? So I'm not convinced by the argument. And there's a really nice critical appraisal that would summarize a lot of the things that I would want to say. And it articulates them in clear fashion and so on much more rigorously and better than I can do here. So it's published by philosopher Troy Cross. It's called On Planting on Belief in Naturalism. This is freely available online. All you need to do is search up On Planting on Belief in Naturalism and it will pop up. It's on fill papers and there's a free PDF that you can just click and read. So I highly recommend you guys to check this out. All of you who are interested in the evolutionary argument against naturalism. Do you participate regularly in any religious ritual like mass every Sunday, for example? Uh, so I occasionally go to Mass with my family, yes, but it's only occasional. Uh, I also pray conditional prayers, largely because I think that that's eminently rational as an agnostic. Indeed, failing to do so may be irrational as an agnostic. Saba Hafaridze? Jafaridze? <laughs> I'm sorry. Congrats. My question is, what is your favorite argument against external world skepticism? So I outlined some of the arguments earlier in this video. I also talk about several such arguments in my video with Dr. Andrew Moon. It's called something like, How Do You Know? You're gonna have to scroll down on my channel. It's a little bit earlier, but it's an excellent video if I do say so myself. I mean, it was mainly a presentation from Andrew Moon and he's a really good philosopher, so. But what is my favorite argument? I mean, 
I don't know, I'd probably, again, go with something like phenomenal conservatism or something like a Morian shift, where the Morian shift is understood as a comparison of plausibility between the conjunction of the skeptic's premises and something like, here's one hand and here's another hand. <laughs> but there are other sorts of considerations that people raise in response to skepticism, like going externalist. I think that's a respectable view. You know, a lot of people argue that these sorts of skeptical arguments are problematically self-defeating and so on. J. Victor asks, you think that we can explain God with our reason or our reason with God? So can we explain God with reason? Um, if you mean, can we explain what God is or would be like with our reason, with our rational faculties, then to at least some extent, the answer I would say is yes, right? We can develop models of God, we can debate them, we can debate their relative merits, and if God exists, we can come closer to the truth, at least with respect to what God is or would be like. Now, not fully, of course, right? <laughs> Given God's infinitude and his transcendence, we wouldn't be able to fully comprehend God with our reason or fully model him and his nature. Can we explain our reason with God? Well, if you mean that God is a candidate explanation for the existence of our rational faculties, then this is correct. He's at least a candidate explanation. But the question is, of course, whether it's a good explanation or the best explanation. And that's a much more difficult question. J. Victor also says, do you like Minecraft? If not, what games do you play? So I do not play Minecraft. Uh, I don't play many games largely because I don't have the time. But when I do, very rarely find the time, <laughs> I'll play FIFA or I'll play things like Call of Duty. J. Victor also says, what is your view on Alvin planning as model of reformed epistemology? That is the view that belief in God in general and in Christianity in particular is rational apart from any arguments. Well, we should note that planning as reformed epistemology is conditional in character, right? It's along the lines of, if Christianity is true, then Christian belief can be rational apart from arguments. So this view does rely on externalism. Planning has his own specific version of externalism, like his own specific version of proper functionalism with a design plan and faculties with certain teleological aims, etc., so it does rely on a version of externalism, and that is a very controversial thesis in philosophy, right? There are lots of very good internalists in epistemology. I mean, as I explained in my 3K AMA, I guess I lean towards maybe a middle ground of sorts between internalism and externalism, namely epistemic pluralism, and I give some references therein for that, um, where basically, according to this view, a plurality of epistemic good-making features, either internal or external, can contribute to or undergird knowledge. But still, an assumption of externalism is indeed controversial. But also, it's important to note that even externalists grant that internalist factors can serve as defeaters. And indeed, things like disagreement across religious traditions, that may very well serve as a defeater in the case of Christian belief forming practices, absent argument and or rational considerations. So even if we grant externalism, there may still be defeaters of an internalist sort that go against planning as thesis. Philosopher Philippe Leon has also done a lot of nice summary work on his blog of published criticisms of planning as proper functionalism, as well as planning as reformed epistemology, etc. So he has this article, for instance, he also has a really nice index about assessing theism in general and Christianity in particular. A lot of these are his own blog posts, but many of them also are just pointing people to new papers and new books that have been published in criticism of the relevant views. So for instance, planning as argument from proper function, he has various different uh, blog posts on that. And as well as planning as reformed epistemology, you can see that he has tons of blog posts here. He has stuff on planning as evolutionary argument against naturalism and presuppositional apologetics. So I can recommend this for all those people who talked about presuppositional apologetics. But yeah, he's also here, he summarizes different literature and different criticism of planning as account of warranted belief. So firstly, argue lots of different authors. His analysis, his as in planning as analysis of warranted Christian belief can't adequately account for the variability of belief among Christians. His postulation of a census divinitatis in human beings is at odds with the empirical evidence regarding the demographics of theistic belief. And ironically, his account entails that the belief of most Christians has little by way of warrant. And of course, there's the great pumpkin objection. You know, people like Andrew Moon have written in response to that. But of course, you know, you can go back and forth and back and forth. And, you know, Felipe Leon, he has these little footnotes here. He's directing you to a lot of different published articles and other sorts of things that have criticized in peer-reviewed journals like News, for instance, and Metaphilosophy and so on, that criticized planning as view here. So anyway, check all that out if you're interested. Jobin Biju says, how has your views on the plausibility of various arguments evolved through the years? Are there any arguments for the existence of God in which your confidence level has actually increased? Cheers and keep up the good work. So regarding cosmological arguments, I'd say, yeah, over the years, I've come to have way more respect for several versions of the contingency argument after reading Proust and Rasmussen, for instance. Like very recently, as in the last few months, I've become unconvinced of two of their modal arguments from beginnings in their book, Necessary Existence. I've actually got two papers under construction on them right now. 
Also, I've come to have a very high degree of respect for the new Kalam, that is the Kalam that relies on causal finitism. You can see my video with adherent apologetics for a brief summary of my reservations for the new Kalam and for causal finitism. I also put that in my Kalam playlist and more generally check out my Kalam playlist. As for ontological arguments, so I used to think that they were quite uniformly poor, though recently I've come to have respect for certain potential symmetry breakers in the context of the modal ontological argument. Indeed, I have a paper under review on this. Actually, two papers under review on that. Well, one of, the, one of them is just my paper on modal arguments for moral realism. So that's not necessarily a paper on the modal ontological argument, even though I talk about it in there. But I do have a paper expressly dedicated to a new symmetry breaker for the modal ontological argument. And I discussed that on Capturing Christianity with Alex O'Connor or Cosmic Skeptic. As for teleological arguments, I've come to have more respect over time for arguments from things like cosmic order and harmony and thinking that they do provide uh, evidence for God's existence. What about consciousness? Well, very recently, I've come to really think that the argument from psychophysical harmony that Brian Cutter and Dustin Crummett have developed provides some serious evidence for God's existence. What about non-traditional arguments? Well, I used to think that arguments from abstracta for God's existence were actually quite powerful. But as of late, like as within the past year or so, I actually think that they're very weak and indeed actually probably support atheism more than theism. So for instance, you can see my answering over 100 arguments for God video, as well as my discussion with Felipe Leon on From Abstracta to Atheism, and more generally my God and Abstract Objects playlist. Mentat says, do you think Gramapi's sort of view depends crucially on a B theory of time, since otherwise the initial state ceased to be? That is, it would be true for you or I to say that the initial state is not the case anymore. Well, that would only be the case under like a presentist A theory view, right? I mean, you could have an A theory view on which the past exists, right? Growing block theory, for instance, or moving spotlight theory, for instance. We could recast your question as saying, does Oppie's view depend crucially on a denial of presentism? So it's actually not clear to me that it does. You could, you could still have this necessary initial segment obtaining in every possible world, right? So every world begins the exact same way. Even though it no longer exists right now, it still used to exist. And every single possible world has an initial, and every single possible world shares that initial segment. We have to distinguish existing in all possible worlds, which is all you need for necessary existence, from existing at all times in all possible worlds. That is not required for necessary existence. So something could be necessarily existent in the sense of it exists in every possible world or it obtains in every possible world. But nevertheless, it could still fail to obtain at all times in all possible worlds. And so if presentism is true, it may very well go out of existence but it could still be necessary in the sense of obtaining in all possible worlds. And I think that's really all that Oppie wants out of his view. That still allows him, so he thinks, to provide a principled explanatory stopping point for the great chain of explanation in reality. Question two, do you agree with Oppie that necessity is an explanatory stopping point, or do you think that some things are ruled out from being necessary, like say things that aren't always the case or things that depend essentially on contingent factors to obtain? Well, I think necessity can be an explanatory stopping point, but I totally disagree with Oppie that necessities cannot be further explained. It's commonplace and nearly universal in metaphysics, mathematics, ethics, metaethics, etc., to explain necessities or necessary truths or necessary facts by appeal to deeper unifying by appeal to deeper, more unifying necessary principles or entities or facts. Plausibly, for instance, it is necessarily wrong to torture toddlers for fun. But this isn't some inexplicable fact, right? Surely it's explained by the nature of toddlers and their flourishing conditions and or the nature of suffering and or the nature of torture and its effects on the victim and or facts about utility or whatever. The Pythagorean theorem is plausibly explained by more fundamental mathematical truths. For example, the parallel postulate. Facts about arithmetic, for example, 10 plus 10 equals 20, are plausibly explained by the axioms of piano arithmetic. Necessary sets, for example, the set whose elements are all and only the natural numbers, are plausibly explained, at least in part, by the existence of their necessary elements, right? Sets depend on their elements for their existence, and so on, right? Explaining necessities is not only legitimate, but indispensable to a wide variety of fields. And this is pretty widely recognized. So yes, in some cases, I think necessity can be an adequate stopping point, but I disagree with Oppie that necessities cannot be explained in principle, or at least cannot be explained further in principle. Zolt Nagy says, why is it called one man's modus ponens is another man's modus tollens when modus ponens, modus tollens, destructive syllogism, and indirect proof are essentially the same logical inferences? Shouldn't then that phrase be called rather one man's modus ponens is another man's modus tollens, another man's disjunctive syllogism, or another man's indirect proof? Well, one thing is that those just don't have the same ring, 
right? It just has a kind of ring to it, right? One's modus ponens is another's modus tollens. That has that has a much better ring to it than one's modus ponens is another's modus tollens or destructive syllogism or indirect proof or etc. But also the saying is fine as it is, since it better captures the structure of many dialectics and the reasoning contained therein. Even if these inferences might in a technical sense be logically equivalent, they still have a certain structure which better and more naturally maps onto some of our dialectical contexts and arguments. So consider, for instance, manipulation arguments and compatibilism. We could argue, premise one, if compatibilism is true, then a manipulated agent is free. But premise two, a manipulated agent is not free. And so conclusion, compatibilism is false. Now, one person might run this modus ponens argument and say, yeah, both of those premises are true. Therefore, compatibilism is false. But someone could equally run that argument in reverse. Yes, if compatibilism is true, then a manipulated agent is free, but compatibilism is true, right? And so it follows that a manipulated agent actually is free after all. And so one person's modus ponens in this case is another person's corresponding modus tollens. And no headway is made in this dispute between people like preferring their own argument as opposed to the other. Unless, of course, you can give independent reasons for asserting the antecedent rather than denying the consequent. Pudis Spencer says, congratulations, nerd. I say thank you. Question one, what is your knockdown or go-to rebuttal of precepts? So you can see what I said earlier in the video. Do you think arguing that God would have a friction between its impassibility and non-arbitrary creation is a fruitful argument against classical theism? Pulling from Mullins in your own paper. So for those of you who want some context, this person is referring to my article here, Classical Theism, Arbitrary Creation and Reason-Based Action. What I argue herein is that Mullins's argument succumbs to a pretty serious problem, but I develop a new problem of arbitrary creation for classical theism that doesn't succumb to that problem. So yeah, I basically extend the argument in a way that doesn't succumb to the problem that afflicted Mullins's argument. So basically, I mean, here, here's the syllogized version, but I go through and defend these premises, etc. So um, back to the question. So yeah, to answer the question, I tend to think that Mullins's argument by itself doesn't work, as I explained in my article. However, as I also explained in my article, I do think a closely related argument against classical theism is at least potentially quite powerful. I also recently read a paper by Noel Blas Science. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's a nice paper arguing against uh, divine simplicity. And interestingly, one of the problems for divine simplicity that science develops in this paper, what science calls the problem of dependent intrinsics, is actually quite closely related to the argument that I just showed that I develop as an extension of Mullins's problem of arbitrary creation. So yeah, check out these papers if you're interested in divine simplicity and arguments for and against it. Andreas Jacobson says, congrats, Joe. I wonder what the practical consequences of being agnostic are. Usually theists pray, atheists don't. Theists worship, atheists don't. Theists go to synagogue or church or mosque or whatever, whereas atheists don't. But what's the way of agnosticism? What do you do? So earlier I described conditional prayer, so that's one thing. Um, you can also see my video, Why Am I Agnostic? It's one of my earliest videos, so you're going to have to like scroll down on my channel a little bit. But I talk therein about a distinctive way or mode of being for agnostics. So definitely check that out. And finally, see Paul Draper's article, Confessions of a Practicing Agnostic. It's a beautiful and wonderful piece that you should read because it pertains very closely to your question. The Real Truth Videos asks, are you agnostic on the existence of unicorns, elves, ghosts, dragons, etc.? Unicorns. Am I agnostic on them? No, because there aren't good reasons to think that they exist, and there are good reasons to think that they don't exist. And this is different, of course, from God's existence, as I explain on my channel. What about ghosts? Oh, no, you asked about elves first. No, because there are good reasons to think that they don't exist, and no comparably good reasons to think that they do exist. The same is true of ghosts. What about dragons? Well, Komodo dragons exist, and to the extent that they're dragons, uh, I believe that dragons exist, so I'm not agnostic on the existence of dragons. But if you mean the fire-breathing creatures of fiction, no, I'm not agnostic on them for the same reason that I'm not agnostic on unicorn selves and ghosts. Philadelphia Collins says, congrats, Joe. Been here since before 3K subs. Yes, much love, my dude or dudette. Uh, my question is this. What are your thoughts on reformed epistemology? Do you think belief in God can still be rational without evidence? Thanks. So a few questions ago, I answered that. So check out my response to that. Ah, Ghosts says, yo, congrats, bro. I love your content so much. I love your discussion on meta-ethics with Ask Yourself, and I'm really interested in ways to defend moral realism. What do you think of quasi-moral realism? Also, do you think there are reasons beyond bare intuition to think mind independent moral facts exist, if that question makes any sense? Like, can I justifiably, as a moral realist, say more than it sure seems like these things exist when debating 
when debating anti-realists. Keep up the dope content, yo. Well, thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate your question and your comments and your nice words there. So about moral realism and the arguments for it and some of the considerations that I would level in favor of it, you can check out earlier on in this video. I discussed that in two or three other questions. So I direct you to that because what I say therein applies here, mutatis mutandis. Mutatis mutandis. But yes, as for quasi-realism, there are different versions of quasi-realism, and so it's difficult to offer thoughts on it in general. Nevertheless, I'll offer one such thought here, and it's a very brief thought. Basically, my reasons for being a moral realist are ipso facto arguments against quasi-realism. That's basically how I would go about this. But again, thank you very much for your comment and uh, yeah, for watching my content. I hope that it serves you in your pursuit of truth. DH says, I'll spare you for the kids. Well, thank you very much, DH. Soggy Nuggets. What a name, Soggy Nuggets. Do you speak any other language? And if so, when did you learn it? Pues he estado hablando español un poquito, solo un poquito desde primer grado. So again, I'm not fluent. No soy fluido. <laughs> Duong says, opinions on the works of William Norris Clark. So I've only looked into his The One and The Many. I thought it was a little bit too continental for my liking, uh, but still not bad and still interesting. I actually cite it in my forthcoming manuscript. So yeah, something to look forward to. Aspiring scholar Caleb. I like the name. What are your thoughts on the epistemology of people like T-Jump? And to follow up, have you heard any theistic epistemology which is more plausible than that of someone like T-Jump? By the way, T-Jump's epistemology is explained in his first video on his channel. So I'm not going to do any research into his epistemology for purposes of this video. All I know is that when I first talked to him on his channel, um, his epistemology seemed very confused. But again, we only talked about a narrow range of topics, so maybe it doesn't cover his full epistemology. So yeah. Athleo says, congratulations, Joe. I was wondering what your thoughts are about the name the trait argument by Ask Yourself. Thank you. So I'm not familiar with how Ask Yourself develops the argument, but I'm guessing the basic idea is to name the relevant difference between non-human animals and humans, especially so-called marginal cases like, you know, infants and severely mentally handicapped individuals. To name the relevant difference between non-human animals and humans, especially marginal cases, that would morally justify killing and eating the former, but not the latter. So I'm not fully sold on a correct answer to this, at least not yet, but I'm also not sold on there being no answer. I guess one proposal might be a rational nature. And this is of course different from occurrent intelligence. A pig might have higher intelligence or higher occurrent intelligence than let's say a toddler. But if you have like a Neo-Aristotelian view featuring natural kinds or natures or whatever, and you think that we're biological organisms falling in certain natural kinds, well then your moral value could very well be a function of the nature that you have. And a rational nature possessed by humans is going to be different from non-rational natures possessed by non-human animals. And it's not implausible that a rational nature can bestow greater value than non-rational natures. I talk about this a little bit further in my response to Trent Horn. I talk about a neo-Aristotelian rendering of this, and I talk about and I talk about the importance of the distinction between a causal power and a disposition on the one hand, and the manifestation of said causal power or disposition on the other. So anyway, check out one of my most recent responses to Trent Horn. It has a rather basic thumbnail. It's just Trent Horn with a big red thing rebutted on the front. So yeah, check out that video. It's near the end where I talk about the moral argument. Aaron Powell says, why is there something rather than nothing? So I discussed this in my 3K AMA. So definitely check that out. Click on the description and it'll be the portion of the video called Explaining Existence. I think that's what it's called. Athlete Ethic says, congrats on 10K. My question, thoughts on veganism and animal rights. So I discussed this earlier in this video as well as in my 3K AMA. So I kindly advise you to check those out. Javier Fernando says, what is your take on Advaita Vedanta slash non-dualism and their model of God? Like all of consciousness being part of an undivided Brahman as well as Hinduism in general. So I haven't studied this much. Uh, I don't really see much of a reason to think that it's true. And further, I seem to be my own substance in my own right and not some proper part of a larger, more encompassing substance. But ultimately to have a fully informed view here, I'd have to kind of formally study this, so. All right, another change of scene, another change of clothes, another day, another dollar. Hey, what this means is that I'm putting in so much effort into this, so yeah. But anyway, on to the next question. Has your views on agnosticism shifted over the past years? Not really. I mean, my views on particular arguments have, but not necessarily my views on agnosticism. Have you leaned more into any side slash become an atheist with any models of God? Well, over the years, I've increasingly found classical theism, a kind of high octane traditional classical theism to be more and more implausible and to be fraught with more and more problems, many of which I've published on. So, I mean, I'd probably be characterized as an atheist with respect to this model of God, but with respect to other models of God, I'd be an agnostic.
Have you started to find some arguments more plausible slash less plausible in the past year? So yes, definitely. So in some of my earlier questions, I answered questions similar to this, but within the past year, one argument that's really come up on my radar that I think is super fascinating, and I do think it's a really serious contender, the argument from psychophysical harmony. It has been developed by Dustin Crummett and Brian Cutter, two philosophers. And also within the past year, I've come to see arguments from abstracta for God's existence to become more and more implausible. And honestly, at this point, I think abstracta actually offer evidence for atheism over theism. Also, this person continues, you should do more theist argument content has been mostly arguments against traditional theism recently. So my answer is potentially uh, the main reason I focus on my channel on arguments for and against traditional theism, specifically classical theism, is because that's my research focus. Another reason is that most atheist content critical of traditional theism is very poor. And so at least on YouTube, traditional theism is sorely lacking in substantive, philosophically informed criticisms. And finally, another reason why there isn't as much defending theistic arguments. I mean, I still defend numerous theistic arguments, don't get me wrong. But the reason why there isn't as much defending theistic arguments is that apologetics channels are pretty much already shoving that down people's throats 24-7. So, though, of course, all over my channel, I've defended stage one of certain versions of contingency arguments. So... Angelo Mateo Moreno says, do you believe that us humans have libertarian free will? So I think we have free will, but I'm agnostic on whether it's libertarian. Crandi says, Joe, you're so smart and I learned a lot from you, but do you really believe that there are mind independent facts about how we should act in a non spatial temporal dimension that we somehow recognize through something as frail as our intuitions? So for starters, I'm not necessarily committed to the existence of non spatio temporal things or facts. We could very well just have these non-natural truths that aren't made true in virtue of, let's say, purely descriptive, empirically investigatable facts. But nevertheless, those truths might not correspond to non spatio temporal propositions or properties or states of affairs or whatever. They might, but also they might not. That's not a requirement on a kind of non-naturalist, moral realist view. In other words, a nominalist could be a non-naturalistic moral realist. But also, I mean, just take a step back here, right? I almost see this as analogous to like, listen, Girdle, you know, I've learned a lot from you, but do you really believe that there are mind-independent facts about math and logic in this non spatio temporal dimension that we somehow recognize through something as frail as our intuitions? And I mean, the answer to that is... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of course. Yes, one plus one equals two. Uh, modus ponens is valid, etc. And we know these things simply through our faculty of intuition. So I think an analogy to math and logic is relevant here. This person says, yes, I know torturing babies for fun seems wrong, but why not just say it's explained by evolution and how your parents raised you? I mean, again, you can apply this to all these other sorts of things. I mean, yeah, it seems to be the case that one plus one equals two. And it also seems to be the case that modus ponens is valid. But why not just explain this in terms of early teaching and socialization together with evolutionary forces over the eons on our ancestors? Or you could say the same thing about perceptual knowledge, right? You could say, yeah, it seems like there's a computer out there in front of you. But why not just say that that's explained simply by the mere fact that you have certain brain states in a certain arrangement and firing in such and such ways? After all, we can perfectly well account for your having an experience as of there being a computer out there solely in terms of the various goings on in your brain, right? That's what happens, for instance, in dreams. That's what happens when the people are in the matrix. That's what happens when you're a brain in a vat and so on. The way you get around these various skeptical scenarios and so on is basically by recognizing that in general, we should trust our strong seemings unless given comparably strong reasons to doubt them. And so if it very strongly seems to be the case that torturing babies for fun is wrong, then I have pretty strong justification for thinking that this is true, unless and until I'm given sufficiently strong countervailing considerations, either in the form of an undercutting or rebutting defeater. Product Sports Equipment says, uh, what in your view is more probable, theism or atheism? So in light of all my evidence and reasons, I say that they're very roughly equally probable. Hamad Akhtar says, what's your favorite argument for theism and atheism both? So I've already covered this in terms of what I think are the best arguments other than cumulative cases. But as for favorite, uh, I mean, I like thinking about the modal ontological argument, but specifically, I like thinking about symmetry breakers with respect to it. It's really fascinating. Again, I'm not interpreting this as best. I've already answered questions about best arguments on either side. Hello says, is necessary being fundamentally a brute fact? If yes, then what's the difference between necessary being and brute fact universe? So we need to distinguish between necessity and bruteness, right? So necessity is a modal notion, right? Something is necessary just in case it cannot fail to exist. 
Bruteness, by contrast, is an explanatory notion, right? Something is brute just in case it doesn't have an explanation. Now, given this, there's nothing incoherent about a brute necessary thing or a non-brute necessary thing, right? A brute necessary thing might be, for instance, as theists take it, God, right? God doesn't have any explanation for his existence. There isn't something upon which God depends for his existence. I mean, of course, you could say, oh, well, maybe God, maybe God's existence is explained in terms of his necessary existence or something, or maybe in terms of his perfection. Okay, fine. But focus on that further fact that whatever you take to be the most fundamental fact uh, that explains God's existence. My point remains unchanged. We're going to have something that's brute and necessary here at the end of the day. But also there's nothing incoherent about something being non-brute, but also necessary. For instance, the set containing the natural numbers, sets depend on their elements. Their ele elements are more fundamental than the sets containing them. And so the set containing natural numbers, since the natural numbers necessarily exist, the set also necessarily necessarily exists. So the set is a necessary thing, but it's non-brute, right? It's explained in terms of something more fundamental. God's ideas, for instance, for theists, those are dependent on the more fundamental reality of God himself. And yet God doesn't like contingently have the ideas he does. God necessarily has ideas of the number one and of the number two and of the number three and of the various possible worlds that God might have created and so on. Now you do ask, is it possible for a necessary being to be a brute fact? I mean, I don't see why not. I mean, I guess someone could say that the explanation for any necessary being is the very fact that it must exist or equivalently that it's impossible for it not to exist. But of course, then we can just ask, well, what explains that further fact? That is the fact that it must exist. And eventually, lest we have an infinite regress, an infinitely descending chain of explanations, it seems we're going to have to hit some kind of brute fact in this explanatory chain. You also ask, can a necessary being have two right hands, non-human, unlike any creation, necessarily? So I don't think I understand this, to be honest. I mean, I understand your question, but I don't understand how something could have hands that are unlike anything in creation, right? To be a hand is to be sufficiently similar to what's at the end of the forelimbs of humans and chimpanzees and so on. So yeah, I guess I don't, I don't even understand what it would be for this view that you're describing to obtain. Reedy and Naturalist says, congrats, Joe. Planning his modal ontological argument plausibly shows that the existence of a perfect being is either necessary or impossible. One might then reason that since there's nothing contradictory about a perfect being, it is not impossible and therefore it's necessary. So I know you have more to say. I'm going to stop you there, right? <laughs> in my notes, I'm just like, I'm going to cut you off there. So it's well nigh universally recognized in philosophy that absence of contradiction is entirely insufficient for being possible. Right. Lots of things are not strictly contradictory and yet nevertheless are impossible. For instance, if you're a theist, naturalism, right? Naturalism, right? Sufficiently robust and worked out views of naturalism aren't strictly speaking contradictory or incoherent, but nevertheless, they're metaphysically impossible. Or if you're a naturalist, right? Focus on theism. It's pretty easy to cook up a consistent model of God. You can even just take Nagasawa's approach where you're just defining God as having the maximal consistent collection of great making features. So it's not that difficult to find a strictly speaking, logically consistent view of God. Nevertheless, for the naturalist, that's going to be impossible. Or consider God's being Unitarian or God's being Binitarian or God's being Trinitarian, right? Each of these is coherent models, but God would be essentially Trinitarian if he's Trinitarian at all. It's not like God could find himself, wake up in one world and he's Trinitarian, and in another world, <laughs> he's like Unitarian. Or water's being H3O, right? So in the mere statement that water is H3O, there's no strict contradiction there. And yet it's metaphysically impossible given the nature of water. Water is by nature, or essentially H2O. There's also nothing contradictory about a prime minister being able to be composed entirely of prime numbers or a prime minister being produced by a prime number. And yet these are obviously impossible. Similarly, there's nothing contradictory about my having different parents, but plausibly I couldn't have had different parents. If there were different parents, right, the child that they had just wouldn't be me. I'm essentially tied to my originate, my actually originating parents. Or consider Platonism versus nominalism versus Aristotelianism, right? One of these views is true. And the other ones are false, but also these things are about the very nature of things like the number one and the number two and properties that wouldn't just happen to obtain. It's not as though like nominalism would be true in one world and then Platonism would be true in another world. No, each of these is strictly speaking consistent. They don't have contradictions in them. And yet at least a lot of them are going to be metaphysically impossible. A lot of them are going to fail to capture the very nature of numbers or property dualism versus substance dualism, right? The nature of mental properties. Both of these views are perfectly coherent. And yet if we are souls, then we are essentially souls. Or if we are material objects, then we are essentially material objects. 
material objects with non-physical properties, of course, but still. And yet there's nothing strictly speaking contradictory about either of these views. Or consider the Neoplatonic one or different models of ultimate reality like Hinduism and Brahman or the Tao or an impersonal absolute or a personal absolute, right? These things, because they're getting at these broad foundational fundamental metaphysical features of reality, they'd be necessarily true if true at all. And yet only one of them can be true. Only one of these ways to characterize fundamental reality. And so lots of them are going to be strictly speaking coherent. They're going to be absent of contradictions, and yet they're going to nevertheless be metaphysically impossible. And so on ad nauseum. So basically, there are boatloads of things that are necessarily false and yet not contradictory. So that's my first point that I'm going to say in response. The second point that I'm going to say in response is that even if it were sufficient for possibility, that is, even if it were the case that something's being absent of contradictions or something's being coherent, even if that were sufficient for possibility, that doesn't actually break the symmetry between the forward and the reverse modal ontological arguments, right? The forward ontological argument said it's possible that God exists. Per S5, it follows that God exists. The reverse says it's possible that God doesn't exist. Per S5, it follows that God doesn't exist. So if we're just appealing to coherence or absence of contradiction, that's not going to break symmetry between these two views, right? There's nothing contradictory about the bare proposition that there does not exist a perfect being, nor is there anything contradictory about lots of other propositions, which if they were true, would entail the non-existence of an necessary being, such as the existence of a no-no being, where a no-no being is a being which knows that there is no perfect being. Or for instance, there's nothing contradictory about mental privacy, whereby mental privacy, I mean, each of us having privileged access to the contents of our own minds. If there were a possible world where we each had privileged access to our own minds, well, then there wouldn't be an omniscient being in that world and hence no perfect being in that world, right? Because an omniscient being is privy to all the truths that there are, including the truths about the contents of each of our minds. And, and again, there's nothing contradictory about mental privacy. There's also nothing contradictory about there being intrinsically impermissible evils and states of affairs, where an intrinsically impermissible state of affairs or an intrinsically impermissible evil is some state of affairs or evil that obtains, but anyone with the power to prevent it from obtaining is morally culpable and blameworthy for not preventing it from obtaining. If any of these things that I just mentioned were possible, it would follow that there's a possible world in which no God exists, in which no perfect being exists. And so we can equally cook up perfectly coherent scenarios that are absent of contradiction, and yet that would justify the reverse modal ontological argument. So anyway, that's what I'm going to say in stopping you there. Now, you continue, you continue with your comment. Uh, one might respond to this by saying that there's also nothing contradictory about a necessarily existing unicorn or quantum field. However, I think there is an interesting difference in that the property of being perfect entails necessarily entails necessary existence, while nothing about a unicorn or quantum field entails necessary existence. So first, it's at least not immediately clear that being perfect entails necessary existence. Several prominent theists think that God is perfect and yet not necessarily existent. For example, Richard Swinburne. These theists argue that no concrete thing could be necessarily existent, even in principle. Second, it's not at all clear that nothing about a quantum field entails necessary existence, right? We have to distinguish between seeing no entailment versus not seeing an entailment, right? There's a distinction there. It might be the case that I don't see that there's bacteria in the room, but it doesn't follow from that that I see that there are no bacteria in the room. I can't positively see that there are no bacteria. I just don't positively see that there are bacteria. And similarly, even if you don't see anything about a quantum field that would entail necessary existence, it doesn't follow that you see that there's nothing about it that could entail necessary existence. I mean, for all I know, and I would argue for all you know, Something like naturalism is true, and the necessary foundation of reality is a quantum field. Thus, for all I know, there is something about a foundational quantum field that entails necessary existence. To succeed, your hypothetical response here would have to rule all scenarios like this out, and that's an extremely difficult feat, and it's one that your hypothetical scenario has not accomplished. Third, this is my third response to what you say there, even if there's nothing about a unicorn or quantum field that entails necessary existence, there is something about a necessarily existent unicorn or a necessarily existent quantum field that entails necessary existence, right? We can simply stipulate a definition here. I'm just defining, let's say, Fred as a necessarily existent unicorn or a necessarily existent quantum field. So there is something about Fred that entails necessary existence. And yet there doesn't seem to be anything strictly contradictory about Fred, so specified. So if non-contradictoriness were sufficient for possibility, it would follow that Fred is possible. And per S5, it would follow that Fred is actual. Now, of course, this is absurd. There isn't an actual, there isn't actually a necessarily existent unicorn. And so what follows from this is that non-contradictoriness is not sufficient for possibility, in which case the original defense of the possibility premise by appeal to non-contradictoriness fails. So that's my third response. 
My fourth response is that there are parodies that completely circumvent this objection, right? So we can actually cook up things that we can see by their nature, by their definitions, would entail necessary existence. So consider consider the perfect being of Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, New Unitarian Christianity, Trinitarian Christianity, indigenous religions, like how the Native Americans conceive of the great spirit, different models of God, like the perfect being of Molinism, or the perfect being of theological determinism, or the perfect being of simple foreknowledge views, etc., 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 different numbers of divine persons, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way up through all the natural numbers, right? And note that I'm talking about the beings satisfying the exact descriptions that Muslims and Hindus and Jews and Unitarian Christians and Trinitarian Christians ascribe to their respective gods. And there might be a sense in which all of these different religions are referring to one in the same ultimate reality. But when I'm running this argument, I'm just talking about definitions, right? I'm talking about the exact being that satisfies this exact description. And we could just run your argument in terms of the exact being satisfying this exact description. If all that we'd be able to prove an infinite array of an infinite array of gods, which is just, of course, absurd, because lots of these are going to be strictly speaking coherent. They're going to be absent of contradiction. And so if non-contradictoriness were sufficient for possibility, then we'd be able to conclude that there is this infinitude of gods. And moreover, because each of these respective groups does indeed conceive of their god as perfect, right? You've already granted in your hypothetical reply here that, that perfection plausibly entails necessary existence. And so this... And so the parodies that I'm articulating here are going to entirely circumvent the problem that you allege afflicts the appeal to unicorns and quantum fields as a parody. Reedy and Naturalist goes on to say that one might maintain that a necessarily existent unicorn or quantum field is a contradictory concept because we have good reason to think that they are by nature contingent. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, the first thing that I would say is, again, I can run parodies that aren't tied to the case of a quantum field or a unicorn. Uh, I can run parodies in terms of these divine or quasi-divine like beings, which will circumvent even this objection. But set that aside and let me give two more responses. So the first is why, right? Why think they're by nature contingent, especially say a foundational quantum field? I mean, like, okay, I, I might spot you the thing about the unicorn. I mean, as I understand a unicorn, right? It would presumably have to come about by something like an evolutionary process. You know, it's like a single horned equine-like being. And that would plausibly have to come about by an evolutionary process, which requires whole hosts of contingent factors to be in place. Okay, fine. But it's not at all clear that that would be true of like a foundational quantum field, which if naturalism is true, might very well be the fo ultimate foundation of reality. Why, why on earth should we think that that thing would be by nature contingent? So that's my first response. My second response is that, well, the parody itself, right? The parody itself appealing to the necessarily existent unicorn or quantum field shows that we have very good, indeed decisive reason to think that Fred is not by nature contingent, right? Return to the Fred example that I gave, assuming, of course, the link between non-contradictoriness and possibility. Of course, we shouldn't assume this since it's false, right? But the point is that the original defense you've proffered for the modal ontological argument's possibility premise does assume this. Basically, the parody argument itself would show that we have decisive reason to think that Fred is not by nature contingent. Jose Miguel Tahan Dumat says, what do you think of, I'm gonna do an American butchering, Henry Bergson. Now, I think it's, I think it's something like Henri Bergson or something like that, like Henri Bergson or something. I'm pretty sure it's like Henri uh, Bergson or something. Yeah, anyway, uh, could you give us your thoughts on his philosophy? So I haven't studied his philosophy enough to offer intelligent comments on it. I just have a very basic grasp of it. So sorry. Oscar says, consider some phenomenon X. There are two hypotheses under consideration. One is realist about X, but doesn't explain why you would have the intuition that X exists. The other hypothesis is anti-realism about X, but does explain why you'd think X is real. Now conditionalize on you having the intuition that X is real. On Bayesian grounds, you have, on Bayesian grounds, you having the intuition would be evidence for the anti-realist hypothesis here, since it explains why you'd have the intuition. On phenomenal conservatism, however, you having the intuition would be evidence for realism, since intuitions are justifying. What do you think of this contrast? What way do you go when these collide? In some cases, there will be a clear defeater, and in those cases, I guess they don't collide. So this is an excellent question. Uh, there are different potential responses floating through my mind. One response, and I, you know, this is probably the more plausible response of the two, but 
Yeah, anyway, this first response is that under phenomenal conservatism, as I'm sure you know, the evidence that seemings provide is defeasible. That is, their evidential support can be overturned or undermined or overridden by countervailing considerations, such as undercutting or rebutting defeaters. But arguably, one such defeater is if we have good reason to think that one's intuition isn't explanatorily connected to the fact being intuited. And in the case you described, arguably, this is precisely the reason we're being provided, right? The realist theory doesn't offer an explanation of why we would have this intuition. And hence, the intuition by the realist theory's own lights isn't explanatorily connected to the fact being intuited. Whereas the anti-realist theory explains why we have the intuition and explains it in a way wherein our intuition isn't explanatorily connected to the fact being intuited. So arguably, we actually have a defeater on our hands here for the intuition's evidential efficacy, even by the lights of phenomenal conservatism. So that's my first potential response. My second potential response is, you could just say that, listen, different epistemic considerations pull in different directions. Uh, we can have evidence for Proposition P by dint of phenomenal conservatism, and it's seeming to be the case that P... But we can also have evidence for the negation of P, or not P, by dint of Bayesian considerations. Namely, the fact that it's seeming to be the case that P is more expected on the hypothesis that P is false than it is on the hypothesis that P is true. So really, different epistemic considerations can pull in different directions, and this may very well just be one of those cases. What direction should we follow, you ask? Well, I mean, perhaps it'll just depend on how significantly we weight the considerations in comparison with one another. And that's no easy judgment. I mean, I'd probably want to take it on a case by case basis. But hey, who said epistemology was easy? <laughs> anyway, again, those are just two potential responses. I really like the question and I hope to think about it further. Senku Ishigami says, will you and Steve invite atheists and theist scientists and mathematicians in your scientific evidences for the beginning of the universe and Hilbert's Hotel episodes? Because those are scientific and mathematical matters, not just philosophical. So we are looking into the work of mathematicians, scientists, and philosophers in our series, especially when we talk about Hilbert's Hotel and, and Seto and the scientific case concerning the purported origin of the universe. So we've got that covered. Of course, we're not going to invite them into the episodes themselves because, well, it's our series, right? Stephen and I are the ones presenting and recording. We're also going to have both scientists and philosophers as consultants, as it were. So this person also asks, will you make your Kalam series into a book? Good question. The answer is actually probably yes. Uh, we haven't fully decided on this yet, but it's maybe like 60% likely at this point that it's going to be turned into a book. Christian says, congratulations on 10K. Glad to see you get this far. And I hope you go much further. Well, much love, Christian. Questions. Does an omniscient being have to be omnipotent? So I don't really see any reason why it would have to be. I mean, again, like just imagine this sort of scenario. Imagine that there's this being who like can't, could barely do anything, right? Um, maybe all it can do is like, cause electrons to change position by one centimeter or something. That's like its only power. So it, it's really impotent. But nevertheless, it's got this like gigachad mind and somehow it just peers into all truths. Like it just knows all truths. It's got super duper cognitive prowess, but in terms of being able to act out things, it can only move electrons one centimeter. What's incoherent about that? I don't see anything incoherent about that. So I, I really don't see why an omniscient being would have to be omnipotent as a matter of principle. What view of foreknowledge do you find most plausible? So my favorite view right now, I guess I would say, is simple foreknowledge. There are difficulties with Molinism, especially ones that Nevin Kleiman Hager, Daniel Rubio, Philip Swenson, et cetera, published on. Difficulties with theological determinism that I covered earlier in this video. And I've also covered difficulties with open theism earlier in this video. So yeah, check out kind of what I said earlier in this video. Do you think foreknowledge is a problem for free will? Well, it's an extremely difficult issue. I'm going to be honest with you. If I were a theist, I would think that this is one of the most difficult problems that I face. This is this is genuinely one of the most difficult problems. This person says, are you still undecided between compatibilist and libertarian free will? Yes. Uh, do you think you'll ever stop being an agnostic? Not chastising. I'm genuinely curious. Well, potentially, right? As I study further, my views could very well change. Also, would you consider collabing with Apologetic Squared? I say, sure. If he wants to, I'm definitely down. At the present, I'm probably too busy for a collaboration. I have bitten off much more than I can chew as of late. <laughs> but in the near future, I'll probably have more time for one. 
Lord Yamka says, thoughts on Muslim philosophers. Are you willing to engage non-Christian arguments for theism? Note that I have engaged many such arguments. For example, arguments from change date back to Aristotle and have received influential treatments from Islamic, Jewish, and Christian thinkers. Maimonides, for instance, who wrote before Aquinas, offers almost carbon copies of lots of Aquinas' central arguments for God's existence, including arguments from change and contingency. Also found across traditions and deriving from non-Christian Neoplatonic thinkers like Plotinus and even Plato himself are arguments from composition, right? Now, in my forthcoming book, Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs, I explore in immense depth arguments from change and composition, and I cite and engage with boatloads of non-Christian thinkers, including ones who defend the arguments from change and composition. So clearly, I am willing to engage these sorts of arguments, and I have engaged them in the past. And also in my 100 plus argument response video, the 12 hour one, many of those arguments are defended by non-Christians. So yeah, check that out. I've already engaged many such arguments. As for thoughts on Muslim philosophers, I've quite enjoyed studying medieval Islamic philosophy in particular. And I've also enjoyed the works of some contemporary Muslim philosophers like Mohammed Saleh Zarapur. Jerome Mosk says, congrats on 10K question. What are your thoughts on the argument from arbitrary limits? I have just the video for you. I made a 12 hour video, which is called over 100 arguments for God answered. And I spend like 30 or 40 minutes on the argument from limits in there. So check that out. Jake K says, hi, Joe, what are your thoughts on linguistic arguments for gods like the Bonavac one you went through in your 100 arguments video? So I haven't researched these much. I'm sorry, dude. So I really don't at least currently have any significant contributions to the discussion, right? I mean, I think it's important to recognize and emphasize their epistemic limits when they're present. And this is one case where I'm epistemically limited. So I'll just recognize that emphasize it and move on. Okay, John says, congrats, Joe. In your review of the Horn-Watkins debate, you gave a pretty good neo-Aristotelian account of human rights. How do you defend your essentialism about humanity, like human essence, given the consensus against it in contemporary philosophy of biology? So one thing we should note here is that, and I should have clarified this in the original video, is I'm not sure I full-blown accept that view. Part of the function of me bringing up that view in that video was that it's dialectical, right? I know that Trent Horn is an Aristotelian. I know that he thinks that there's such a thing as a human essence. He accepts these sorts of things. So what I wanted to bring out was that, listen, you don't need some spooky being in the picture here (laughs) to put things pejoratively. You just need the intrinsic natures and characters and the flourishing conditions set by those intrinsic natures and characters of human beings to be able to account for things like human rights and so on. So that part of the video can largely be understood as a dialectical move. Now, with that said, I still do have some sympathies with the view. Again, if I were to be tortured to pick a view on personal identity, I'd pick something like animalism. So I think that humans, human persons, are biological organisms and we're of a particular species uh, or a particular natural kind. I mean, I think that there are like neo-Aristotelian ways to render this more respectable than what Aristotle himself, for instance, might have held. And while it is in the minority, there are still significant voices defending the existence, for instance, of natural kinds, even in the biological world. I mean, one pretty good critical appraisal of lots of the popular arguments in philosophy of biology, et cetera, against essentialism in biology are tackled in uh, David Oderberg's Real Essentialism. So this is a pretty good book that, you know, systematically goes to these sorts of arguments. His arguments in here aren't crazy. At least by Oderberg's lights, they don't at all succeed. And there's plenty of room for a new Aristotelian natural kinds type view, even with respect to biology. But again, I recognize that it's controversial and that that is a minority position. Even still, right, we can understand my criticism in that video dialectically. Trent Horn himself is committed to it. So basically, I was pointing out that by his own lights, his moral argument doesn't work and that you don't need God in the picture to be able to account for these sorts of things. And hey, if that view is false, I'll just ground moral rights in the next most plausible theory. So maybe it's going to be like a contractualist theory of sorts. It depends. Mode Allah says, what's your IQ? I'm not answering that. Miriam Abdullah says, are you vegan? I say, not currently. Senku Ishigami says, will you do more formal debates? I say, maybe. I tend to find formal debates a little bit too tribal for my liking. And they also take lots of preparation. And I already have bitten off more than I can chew in terms of my research and commitments and so on. Wesley Bassanar says, what is your second favorite ear? So presuming that you're asking about my ears, I like them equally. So I I don't have a second favorite. Just Chris says, congrats, Joe. Uh, My question is, are there any non-philosophy YouTubers you watch? The answer is actually, yeah, a little. So only five come to mind here. And again, it's only a little like, I don't have 
all the time in the world. <laughs> I am a, a very busy individual. But yes, I will occasionally watch non-philosophy YouTube. So yeah, I put down five here because they're the only five that came to mind. Uh, one, Vsauce, of course. Number two, Veritasium, of course, right? Number three, Ali Abdal. I like his stuff on productivity, etc. Number four, Sean, S-H-A-U-N. He is nice, rigorous, researched, social and political commentary. And then the measured response videos of H Bomber Guy. Those are the best. JL Keener 77 says, Hi, Joe, I love your channel. Please give us some history about your academic background and family background. As such a young man, you're already so well-versed and competent in many areas of philosophy. How did you become such a brilliant prodigy? Well, <laughs> thank you for the kind words. I don't feel that I fully merit them. I'm always returning to Isaac Newton's famous line that if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. But I guess here's a little bit more on my academic background. I mean, I've had the nice privilege of going to private Christian schools where I got a very nice education, small classes, teachers who really cared about my development and so on. I got to take theology classes basically every day, which exposed me to thinking quite abstractly and thinking in terms that are close to philosophy of religion. When I got my little iPod touch, when I was like in fourth grade or something, I downloaded lots of apps that I had fun on like Doodle Jump, but also Instagram, because that's what all the cool kids were doing. And uh, yeah, I mainly just went on there and debated random strangers on the internet, you know, probably 30, 40 year olds, et cetera, <laughs> or 20 year olds. And um, and I found forums where it was really substantive conversations. It wasn't just like poo flinging back and forth. It was actually paragraph upon paragraph comment sections. I remember distinctly these sorts of discussions that I had. They were very substantive and uh, cordial and so on. Somehow I, I stumbled into the right places. And so, yeah, that interest, I was always on that. I was always doing that, you know, continually taking challenging classes in high school. For those of you who know, there's in this thing called the International Baccalaureate Program or IB. It's similar to AP, but but at least by my lights, it focuses less on like rote memorization and stuff than AP. I think there's a lot more writing, et cetera, in IB. But anyway, set that aside. So, yeah, I did like the full IB program in high school, and that really pushed me and really developed and honed my academic skills, my critical thinking skills, my writing skills, dialoguing with philosophers throughout this time, you know, like emailing Josh Rasmussen back and forth and back and forth, reading papers, books, et cetera, watching substantive content on YouTube, including free courses. There are so many free courses that I've taken over the years just for fun. So I think a large part of it is just a love for learning. And it's unfortunate that our education system, as I said earlier in this video, kind of beats that out of people. But you know, you might find a teacher along the way, as I did, a few teachers who just kind of ignite that spark. Zany's Nerf Gun says, I was wondering if you know anyone who could tutor me online as a beginner in philosophy would be much appreciated. So, hey, my man, it's potentially, I could potentially do that. I mean, I'm super busy, but like, I mean, listen, depending on the pay, I could do it. We can chat about it via email if you're interested. I'm not committing to it, but we could talk about it. Just email me at majestyofreason at gmail.com. TK says, favorite footballer of all time for each degree removed from... Roberto Baggio, I think that's his first name. My respect drops by equal measure. <laughs> sure, showing my age by indicating my guy. Yeah, dude, isn't that the uh, Italian? Uh, I think he played for Juventus, and you know he's got he had like the little uh, little rat tail back here. I think he had that. Uh, oh my goodness. So yeah, my favorite footballer of all time is Cesc Fabregas. He caused me to fall in love with the beautiful game. Modern Moralist says, congratulations on a well-earned subscriber base. My question is this, what is your view on the academic apologetic divide in relation to the moral argument? Zygzebski, Terence Cuneo, and other top Christian ethicists and meta-ethicists find it highly dubious, while it seems to be the most popular amongst those with the least background. Well, in my experience, this is absolutely spot on, modern moralist. I think it highlights how moral arguments tend to be so blatantly out of touch with metaethics. It astonishes me, really. So honestly, I can basically just express my agreement, at least in my experience, with your comment there. Why is this the case? In my discussion with Alex O'Connor on his channel, where we go through the theist tier list or whatever, I give a kind of like error theory of sorts or like a debunking explanation of sorts. I use this notion that Peter Berger calls legitimation. People take God to be the legitimator of morality. And when you zap God out of the picture, they think that's basically zapping the goodness out of things when they're failing to see that the goodness is right there in front of them. Like the goodness is in the virtuous acts, is in the knowledge, is in the pleasure and so on. Anyway, 
you know, we could talk about this. What are the reasons why people find this gripping? You know, one of them is that they're just not sufficiently acquainted with metaethics, honestly. But yes, I've also noticed that trend that some of the best professional metaethicists who happen to be Christians also are like, yeah, this moral argument is, is really sketch. It's not good. <laughs> not absolutely every single one of them, of course, but it's a trend that I've noticed. And others have noticed as well, as evinced by modern moralists' comment. Hamad Akhtar says, uh, what do you think of philosophy of perception? Do you hold a direct realism, indirect realism, idealism, transcendental idealism, or are you undecided? So I've only studied this a very little, so unfortunately I'm undecided. I actually used to say that I'm a disjunctivist, but honestly, this is well outside what I research, and so I really should be taking a stance on it. I don't know, I'm sorry. Josh asks, what are your thoughts on the traditionalists of the 19th and 20th centuries, such as Evola, Guénon, etc.? Sorry, I haven't studied this enough to offer intelligent comments. Angelo Kid says, congrats, Joe. Here are my questions. If the afterlife is real, is it possible to have an afterlife without there being a God in it? So I do think it's epistemically possible. I mean, philosopher Eric Steinhardt, for instance, defends a thoroughly naturalistic afterlife. But more generally, I guess I don't see why God is absolutely necessary for it. I mean, perhaps we're just like naturally indestructible immaterial substances, or perhaps reality is governed by an impersonal karmic cycle of sorts, wherein we are endlessly incarnated. You know, there are various epistemically possible views of an afterlife that don't feature a God. Two, if you were to have an interview with God, what topics and questions would you like to ask him? Well, that's a good question. I'd probably ask him billions of questions, but here are a few. Firstly, what's your nature like? What model of God, if any, is true? Right, I'd want to get to the bottom of that. Secondly, how the hecking heck are we supposed to reconcile human freedom with your comprehensive foreknowledge? What's your profanity? Thirdly, are there abstract objects? And if so, what are they like? Fourthly, is universalism true? And then fifthly, What's what's with what's with all this? I mean, <laughs> what's with all this suffering and you know, child cancer, rape, tsunamis and starvation, hundreds of millions of years of predation and suffering and languishing of non-human animals? C can you can you try to explain this to me, maybe? <laughs> Stephen, Stephen says, "Congrats on 10K subs. I'm happy to be one. Well, thank you. Uh, I've got two kids, and so I can't imagine how you manage this with 12." J.K. Well, much love, my dude. Simple question. This person asks, "Have you read The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis?" I haven't. I'm sorry. It sounds interesting, though. Roberto says, what do you think of DBH's book, The Experience of God? Well, Hart is an excellent writer. It could definitely benefit from more rigor and clarity. That's kind of my analytic instincts, my analytic philosopher instincts speaking. But nevertheless, literarily speaking, and in terms of word choice, sentence structure, etc., right, his pose is brilliant, almost unparalleled, right? I mean, there's, there's really no debate about that, is there? In terms of its content, I'd say it's a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, some elements are pretty good, but others are pretty bad. I mean, he, he blatantly and demonstrably misrepresents non-classical theistic models of God, and his arguments from sustaining causation fail in light of existential inertia, and so on down the list. Overall... But again, that's not to say that there aren't other good aspects of the book, right? So overall, again, I'd say that it's a mixed bag, at least by my lights. That's not to say that people shouldn't read it. I, I just think it's a mixed bag. I think that the arguments it presents, especially for God's existence, don't quite succeed. Guillermo Zavaleta says, did you read the new article Grounding Infinite Regress and the Thomistic Cosmological Argument? The author challenges the idea that a per se causal... The author challenges the idea that a per se causal series cannot be infinite. So I did. I actually did read this, and I cited it actually in multiple chapters of my forthcoming book with Springer. I think I said this at the beginning, but right, but my book with Springer doesn't have to be turned in until early August. So I still have some time to include some edits, include some extra citations, you know, touch up things. This this paper was just published in the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion within the last week. So yes, I did read it, and I cited it multiple places in my book. My principal misgiving for his argument basically derives from the PSR. Essentially, if we have an infinite per se chain without a primary member, then each of the members in that chain doesn't have the relevant causal power of itself. It merely derives it from without. And so they, none of them have to have the causal power. But then, of course, there is the question, why is there any causal power at all in the series in the first place? And under Oberle's view, that's just going to be an inexplicable brute fact, it seems to me. Because again, none of the members of the series have the causal power of themselves. They all just purely derive it from without. And none of them had to have the relevant causal powers. And there's nothing outside the chain which explains why it has it. And there's nothing outside the, the chain of the members which explains why they have it either. So it would seem to be a violation of the PSR. And since I find the PSR plausible, I would resist his proposal that there could be infinitely descending per se chains. At least that's what I'm inclined to think at this point. And we don't even need to have the PSR at this point. We can just say that his view there 
postulate something brute. And that, that's a theoretical vice, right? All else being equal, we would want to explain things further. So at the very least, it's a theoretical vice of his view. And that gives us some weight of a reason to, to reject it, even if we don't accept the full-blown PSR. Question two, what is the best existential inertia friendly account of persistence? Well, that is a super good, but super difficult question, since I think basically all of the accounts, all the metaphysical accounts of existential inertia are defensible. For those of you who want to know what we're talking about, check out my blog post, So You Think You Understand Existential Inertia. Just go to majestyofreason.wordpress.com and then search that up. Or actually, you can find it on Google. If you just search, So You Think You Understand Existential Inertia, it'll pop up. It'll probably be the first result. So yeah, I mean, I think basically all the accounts are defensible. I guess if I had to pick one, which is my favorite, or pick a family of accounts, which is my favorite, I think I'd choose no change accounts. I guess I find them the most plausible. But again, I think all the accounts are defensible. Marcel Gonçalves, something like that. Uh, it's a C with a little thing at the bottom. Anyway, what's your what's your favorite brand in music? I did cover this earlier, another question. So check out the uh, either the description or the pinned comment. Amar Iqbal says, what is your stance on the philosophy of mind? So broadly, non-physicalist, etc. I have covered this. So check out what I said earlier. Brooks B says, hi, Joe. William Lane Craig often says that abstract objects are causally effete. What do you make of this claim? Is there any way that mathematics or abstract objects could bring the universe into reality? I'm new to philosophy and your channel has been a huge help. Thanks a lot. That is so wonderful to hear. I'm always happy that I can help people who are new to philosophy and people who are old in philosophy. So yeah, that is an excellent question. Usually, it's actually just like definitionally stipulated that abstracta are a causal, that is, they lack causal powers, that is, they are causally effete. But there is significant disagreement about how to define abstracta, and some definitions reject that. Indeed, several philosophers have defended views on which at least some abstracta can cause things. Actually, if I recall correctly, again, if I recall correctly, philosopher Eric Steinhardt may have defended a view on which mathematics or abstract objects did indeed bring the universe into reality. So this is an area of debate, as you can see. At least for paradigm examples of abstracta, I tend to think that, yeah, they, ultimately they are causally effete, right? Think about like the number two, right? The number two doesn't, it just, it just seems obvious that it doesn't cause anything, right? Like you won't find the number two making like a sandwich. You won't find it like causing people concussions by bonking into their heads. You won't find it like creating universes like, oh, <laughs> that universe or, you know, that that galaxy over there was created by the number two. It's like, what? And it also seems weird to think that the number two could like causally bring about or like causally burp out like the number three or something. So anyway, I mean, I guess I would lean towards a view on which mathematical objects, at least, and probably abstract more generally, at the very least, couldn't bring the universe into existence. That that seems plausible to me. But again, I have to think about this further. There is debate here. So so yeah, good question. Av Katarkar says, congrats, Joe. Is the self just an illusion? Plus, what are your thoughts on spirituality? Well, I, I tend not to think that the self is an illusion. And for broadly phenomenal conservative-based reasons, um, seems to me that seems to me to be the case that there is a me. I think that I exist. For me to think, it would seem as though I'd have to be there to be the one thinking, right? Thoughts seem to attach to a subject. I seem to be, a, in some sense, a subject of experience. So I tend to think that, no, the self does exist. I exist. Thoughts on spirituality. Well, I guess it depends on what we mean by spirituality. I mean, if you mean getting in touch with a spiritual realm, I'm not convinced that there is such a spiritual realm and you can color me skeptical. Or maybe you just mean practices that people associate with getting in touch in a spiritual realm. Some of those might be eminently rational, um, you know, like if it's rational to believe in God, as I think it very well is, at least for many people, and and if God exists, prayer is rational, well, then it follows that I think prayer could be a spiritual practice, which is indeed rational. I also think as an agnostic, conditional prayer in particular is eminently rational and not doing it might very well be irrational. Alternatively, maybe you just mean various like mental health and wellness practices like meditation and the like. Uh, my thoughts on that is, yeah, more power to you if that helps check it out. I've, I've looked into some of the scientific research on that, and it really does look like meditation has profound and significant health benefits. So yeah, do it. Awesome. Jesse England says, as a Christian, I appreciate your thoughtfulness towards philosophy. What book are you reading now? Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for saying that. What book am I reading now? I am reading Ross P. Cameron's Chains of Being, Infinite Regress, Circularity, and Metaphysical Explanation. It's a 2022 book published with Oxford University Press. It's metaphysics, so 
basically the best thing ever. Jeremy says, congrats. Just so you know, you are my favorite YouTube philosopher and I've gained so much from your videos. Well, much love to you, Jeremy, and you are one of my favorite viewers. So yes, much love. My question, if God exists, do you think it is possible for him to have libertarian free will? My intuition says no, as it seems to me that libertarian free will is an incoherent concept. So I think it's epistemically possible, at least by my lights. I don't claim that everyone else has to think that it's epistemically possible, but for me, it's epistemically possible. I certainly respect people who think that libertarian free will is or may be incoherent. Again, I even myself have some worries pertaining to libertarianism, especially relating to the luck objection. I'm not convinced that it's an incoherent view. Uh, after all, I'm agnostic on it. And so if God exists, I don't see why he couldn't be libertarianly free. Real Atheology says, congratulations, Joe, your work has been instrumental in raising the level of discourse and you're doing a real service in bringing such good academic philosophy to these deep and important metaphysical issues. Well, thank you very much, Real Atheology. Much love. I have a few questions for you. One, well, it looks like it's two questions. In 2009, Felipe Leon made a post highlighting some of Draper's work, specifically his low priors argument, focusing on evil and intrinsic probability. Leon described it as the cutting edge of philosophy of religion at the time. In 2018, Proust and Rasmussen published their highly acclaimed book, Necessary Existence, which represented a landmark achievement in the defense of a necessary foundation. In your opinion, as of 2022, what have been some of the recent cutting edge developments offered in the philosophy of religion in terms of defenses of atheism and theism? What are some books, papers, arguments, and approaches you describe as innovative or cutting edge in the recent time period? Yeah, so that's a good question. So Draper's stuff is still cutting edge, honestly, and he's coming out with even more of it. But what are some other recent developments, cutting edge stuff? Well, stage two cosmological argument stuff is cutting edge, right? You can look at the work of Jerome Gelman, Rob Coons, Graham Oppie's criticisms of these sorts of things, Josh Rasmussen, etc. Stage one contingency arguments are still cutting edge, right? Necessary existence, as you pointed out, that's still cutting edge. There are still papers being written by yours truly, but also there are still papers being published actively criticizing and refining and discussing the arguments contained therein. Existential inertia is cutting edge. Lots of papers are being published in this burgeoning topic. Causal finitism is also quite cutting edge, right? Proust's 2018 book, Infinity, Causation, and Paradox, right there. Kuhn's work on causal finitism. I have like two papers under review and like one or two under construction on Benedetti paradoxes, the, the Grim Reaper paradoxes applied to the future, etc. Also cutting edge, are like mixed views between traditional theism and like a traditional naturalism, right? So Felipe Leon, he developed a kind of liberal naturalist view in his discussion with Josh Rasmussen, their book, Is God the Best Explanation of Things? A Dialogue. Josh himself developed a basically like a theistic idealist penentheism in that book. Philip Goff is developing a kind of quasi-theistic view. He's currently writing a book defending that. So there's tons of super interesting, super cutting edge stuff right now going on in philosophy of religion. And then the second question that Real Atheology asks is, we all know about the heavyweights on the non-theist and theist side, Oppie, Draper, Rasmussen, Swinburne, etc. But who are some lesser known non-theist and theistic philosophers that people should pay attention to? What are some underrated books slash arguments you'd recommend that deserve more awareness and attention? Well, I'll say arguments right now, definitely the argument from Psychophysical Harmony. Um, but yeah, okay, uh, lesser known or underappreciated theists include Daniel Speak, Travis Dunsday, Dustin Cromit, Brian Leftow, Sam Liebens, Eugene Nagasawa, Helen DeCruz, Eleanor Stump, Catherine Rogers, Jeff Speaks. Lesser known or underappreciated non-theists include Stephen Meitzen, Nick Trakakis, Richard Gale, Arif Ahmed, Quentin Smith, Michael Tooley, and so on down the list. What about some lesser known or underappreciated books? Well, uh, Gail and Proust have a book wherein they discuss the existence of God. It's just entitled The Existence of God. That's highly underrated. Trakakis has a book on the problem of evil that's under-discussed in popular domains. It's called The God Beyond Belief. Eleanor Stump has a book that is unfortunately under-discussed in the popular domain. It's called Wandering in Darkness. Yujin Nagasawa has a book. I'm not sure if it's, I mean, I think it is under-discussed. You know, you don't really see it much talked about, but it's a really good book called A Maximal God, A New Defense of Perfect Being Theism. J.C. Smart and J.J. Haldane have a book called Atheism and Theism. That's definitely been overlooked and underappreciated. Oppie, one of Oppie's books has been, I, don't, I haven't seen any discussion of it on YouTube, but it's a really good book. Describing Gods, right? I'm not talking about his book, Arguing About Gods. Yes, that's a very good book and y'all should read it. But Describing Gods, is an excellent book and it's so underappreciated. Also another book that's super underappreciated potentially because it's too expensive, but you know, there are ways to obtain it without paying all that money. I'm not gonna say any more, but the book is called Theism and Atheism, Opposing Arguments in Philosophy. Beautiful, amazing book. I highly recommend that one. 
Okay, Joseph White says, congrats, Joe, 10K and counting. My question is, what do the varieties and kinds of religious slash spiritual slash mystical experiences stir up for you? Well, they're suggestive and they're fascinating. And I don't deny that people who have them may very well have strong evidence for God's existence or for the existence of whatever was the intentional object of their experience. Epistemically speaking, though, I do have some reservations or worries about their evidential efficacy. And I articulate some of these worries in my 100 plus argument video, the 12 hour long one. Again, just look at the timestamps. This person continues saying, not looking for you to come to any position, but what are your thoughts when you consider these experiences? Have you encountered any mystical or spiritual experiences in your own life? So I haven't encountered anything like mystical experiences in my own life. Have I had religious experiences, which is you know much broader than mystical experience, a very specific type of religious experience? So yeah, I think so, probably. I mean, they're only like the very vanilla kind, you know, they're pretty tame, shall we say. Basically, when I was younger, I just think I felt as though God exists, or I had a feeling at times when I was, for instance, reading scripture or other sorts of things, I like felt as though God had spoken to me or called me to a certain path. And perhaps I even felt in some vague and emotional sense, God's presence maybe at some points. This was rare, but I do think I did have such feelings or experiences. I mean, none of them, I don't think, were anything that couldn't be explained by the various social and emotional features of worship and adoration services, etc., such as, you know, music, a social setting, hyped up state of mind, contextual factors, and so on. Hia or Haya says, assuming the presentist model of time, the future does not yet exist, even for God. So there are no true facts about the actual future. Let me hold you up there. That doesn't follow, right? Merely from the fact that the future doesn't exist, it doesn't follow that there are no true facts about the future or no true statements about the future, right? Even if my eating cereal to even if my eating cereal tomorrow morning doesn't exist, it's still true that I'm going to eat cereal tomorrow, or so I say. But this person continues, now let's define omniscience as knowing and believing all true facts. Under this view, God's omniscience need not entail that he knows facts about the future. However, X can possibly happen is a true fact. Therefore, God knows all possible outcomes. However, God can see overlap in events in possible worlds and come to conclusions about the actual world, particularly the future, even if he doesn't know every fact about the future. Question mark. You're right that God can certainly know some things about the future, even if he doesn't know everything about the future. For instance, he can know what he can deduce about the future, given the present state of reality, together with the laws of nature, for instance. Uh, he can also know what exactly he himself intends to bring about in the future. And indeed, if he's all controlling, if he has this kind of meticulous providence, then he could know the entire future based simply on knowing his own current infallible plan or intention or decree. This person continues saying, additionally, God can still know things that he will in fact do in the future. What do you think about this idea? So yes, this is a respectable view. It's similar to what lots of open theists have defended quite forcefully. So I could recommend you to look into open theism if you're interested in pursuing these sorts of ideas further. For instance, you could check out the work of Patrick Todd, especially his super recent 2021 book called The Open Future, Why Future Contingents Are All False. I think he also did an interview with Jordan on the Analytic Christian channel, so you can check that out as well. Trin Electro says, congratulations, very impressive work. So uh, <laughs> Trin Electro goes on to ask about 20 questions. I did want to say, though, Trin, thank you so much for your one-time donation. I really do appreciate it. By doing so, you're helping me serve thousands of people and help them pursue truth with rigor, with caution, with care, with love, with intellectual, moral virtue, etc. So thank you, sincerely. So Trin Electro says you don't have to answer all or any for that matter. I too have a wife and kids, thankfully not as many as 12. <laughs> but if you can at least answer some, I'd really appreciate it. Again, keep up the great work. So yes, I will answer some of these. The first question Trin asks is, what is your best argument against metaphysical foundationalism? So at least by my lights, the best consideration against it is a simplicity consideration. I mean, metaphysical foundationalism requires chains of grounding or more generally chains of ontological dependence to be well-founded. You need to have a first or primary member to these descending chains of ontological dependence. And this first or primary member is going to be absolutely ontologically independent. It's going to be ungrounded. It's going to be fundamental. But now you have a kind of disjointed view of reality, right? You have one kind of thing, namely fundamental ungrounded things, and you have another kind of thing, non-fundamental, grounded things. So you have this bifurcated view of reality. It would seem simpler if we could shave off one of these categories and have a kind of categorical uniformity. Also, a denial of metaphysical foundationalism minimizes the number of fundamental things. 
because the number of fundamental things would then be zero if you're denying metaphysical foundationalism, presumably. So I think simplicity considerations might be some of the best arguments against metaphysical foundationalism. What is your best argument against brute facts? Well, I actually offered some arguments earlier on in this video pertaining to the PSR, and I think that would apply here. So in general, when we look around us, we uniformly find that things have explanations. So we have good inductive evidence for thinking that something like the PSR is true. Also, also this uniform experience, also this uniform universal experience of explanations is precisely what we would expect, precisely what we would predict if something like the PSR were true. And if the PSR were false, it's not at all what we would expect. There may very well be boatloads of inexplicable things flooding reality. What paradox is the most difficult to you? For example, Sorides paradox. So yeah, I actually do find stuff about vagueness. In general, like material objects and composition, I find lots of those paradoxes to be extremely difficult to avoid. Like honestly, mariological nihilism sometimes looks so appealing. Stuff about like vagueness, stuff about the problem of the many, right? That's super difficult. Lots of these things I find to be very difficult pertaining to material objects. But yeah, I mean, with respect to vagueness and this Rides paradox, like you seem to have to bite if you want to hold on to classical logic. And I mean, that's a paradox in and of itself, like giving up classical logic. It's like, yikes, maybe truth value gap, something that's neither true nor false, a state, whoa, that is crazy. <laughs> or maybe you have to go into a glut theoretic approach. So there could be true contradictions. That is even crazier. <laughs> so like without going into a non-classical logic, if you want to hold on to classical logic, it seems as though you do have to take every single one of these cases to really admit of sharp boundaries. And that's that's a difficult thing to maintain. So yes, I do find that paradox as well as lots of paradoxes concerning material composition to be potentially the most difficult for me. What is your best argument against existence monism? C, in defense of existence monism. P, Finocchiaro. Also, do you think priority monism is superior to existence monism? C, existence monism trumps priority monism by T, Terence Horgan. I think that's Terence Horgan, T. Horgan. And M, Potrick. So existence monism, presumably you mean that only one thing exists. I'd probably say that by phenomenal conservatism, we have very good, at least me, for my intuitions, right? I could just speak about my seemings. That very strongly seems to be false. And so I have strong, defeasible justification for thinking that it's false. Of course, again, that, that justification is defeasible. So it could be overturned by sufficiently strong countervailing considerations. But the dialectical ball is in their court. They need to provide me, if they want me to you know, come to their position, they need to give me real, pretty strong reasons to think their view is true. So that's probably what I would say in response. And that at least... So far, I haven't been given such comparably strong reasons. What is your best defense of necessitarianism? Have you ever heard of the Bennett Van Inwagen argument? I mean, if you're talking about the argument for modal collapse from the PSR that Van Inwagen, um, Ross, and William Rowe talk about, then yes, I, I've heard of that. I've covered that on my channel. I think it suffers from several difficulties. Check out my the Leibnizian cosmological argument video for more on that. But, you know, best defense of necessitarianism. I mean, honestly, probably saying something like the PSR is true, but then trying to go on to say that you get an untoward violation of the PSR by admitting contingency into reality, right? Because if you admit contingency into reality, you're ultimately going to have to appeal to something necessary to explain it. But then precisely because this necessary thing is invariant across worlds, whereas the contingent things vary across worlds, you're not going to be able to explain why these particular contingent things came about in this world rather than another, right? Because whatever you're citing as your explanation in terms of the necessary thing, <laughs> there's no difference across worlds that you could cite to explain why one set of contingent entities obtains rather than another. So yes, you can restrict the PSR and restrict it to non-contrastive facts. And you can say that, you know, we have indeterministic explanations and so on. But hey, restricting principles usually incurs a probability cost because they're more complex than the unrestricted counterparts. And also, a lot of people just do have the intuition that, yeah, surely we still need a deeper explanation that explains why we get these things rather than some others. And so if you admit contingency, you're not going to have an ultimate explanation of that. And so that's a kind of, it's an argument against contingency, essentially. This person also asks, what is the nature of truth? What theory do you subscribe to? So yeah, I'm a correspondence theorist, just pretty standard vanilla correspondence theorist. I agree with Aristotle when Aristotle says that to say of what is, that it is, or to say of what is not, that it is not, is to speak truly. And contrarywise, to say of what is, that it is not, or to say of what is not, that it is, is to speak falsely. <laughs> anyway, for more and for an extended and really good defense of the correspondence theory of truth, 
check out a book by that very same name, The Correspondence Theory of Truth. I think that's what it's called. It might have a defense in there uh, by Josh Rasmussen, published with, I think it's Cambridge University Press in 2014, I believe. And then as for these questions about nominalism, Platonism, compatibilism, free will, abortion, personal identity, and so on, I have addressed them earlier. So that cuts out like four or five of your further questions. And then as for your question about grounding being necessarily irreflexive, asymmetric, and transitive, I do hold to that kind of standard story. Yes, I do take grounding to be necessarily irreflexive, asymmetric, and transitive. Um, you point out that there is a paper that argues otherwise. So see, for instance, that grounding is not a strict order by Gonzalo Rodriguez Pereira. And then Trin Electro goes on to articulate several arguments. Unfortunately, I'm not going to comment on them because it's midnight right now. I'm very tired. I've recorded very long. I've answered probably upwards of what 300 questions something like that I, I honestly don't know how many because you can't just look at how many comments were made on the video right because some of the comments had like five or ten questions in them so anyway i'm very tired but uh yeah thank you all for your questions i really do appreciate it thank you again for 10k all your support means so much to me and again i hope to continue supporting you guys in your pursuit of truth so yeah much love to all of you thanks for 10k and cheers Oh my goodness, I was just about to finish a video without doing my normal outro. So that's unacceptable. So here we go. What better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is The Majesty of Reason and peace out. I've been searching, nothing's working. I've been tripping, no one's perfect. Chasing vision, just the surface. Shirts on backwards, not on purpose. Yeah, I've been learning something bigger. Expectations, feet were failing. I found blessings flowing from the side of heaven. Staring into my reflection, reading everything, not perfection. Somewhere else.